It was ridiculous. I had more stuff around my feet than in my pockets. I flushed the toilet and opened the door. An overweight Japanese tourist was waiting patiently, his sides bulging with video and camera bags. Leaving him to fight his way into the cubicle, I headed to the condom machine by the urinals. It was decision time. Dropping in some coins, I considered the banana or strawberry flavored ones and those shaped like medieval maces. But in the end, went for the bog standard clear ones. All very missionary. Then, with the packet of three in my pocket, I was out of Stockman, with any luck, forever. Checking for surveillance by doing a complete circuit of the store and taking a few turns that meant I'd double back on myself, I felt confident I wasn't being followed and headed for the same bookshop where I'd bought my guidebook to Estonia. I soon found the map that Liv had specified. Back at the hotel, it was time to study it in detail. Tallinn, the capital, was in the west, on the Baltic coast. It faced Finland, which was 80 k's across the sea. Narva was miles away, in the northeastern corner, right next to Russia, and just 15 k's inland. There was one main drag that went from Tallinn to Narva, linking together other, smaller towns on the 210 k's between the two. I could also see the black line of the railway that Liv had told me to take, roughly paralleling the main drag, sometimes near the road, but mostly a few k's south of it. Narva was bisected by a river, and the border with Russia was an imaginary line running down the middle of it. There were two crossing points, a rail bridge and a road bridge. On the Russian side, the main drag and train line kept going east, with a sign on the edge of the map saying, Pitabudi, 138 kilometers. In other words, Narva was closer to St. Petersburg than it was to Tallinn. I took out the sheet of greaseproof paper and placed the cross over the corresponding longs and lats, then looked at the circle. It ringed a small cluster of buildings a couple of k's south of a small town called Tudu, which was about 35 k's southwestish of Narva. Basically, the target was in the middle of nowhere, the perfect place for the Meliskia to run their operations. That was where those Finns should have gone to do their job. Maybe they didn't because there weren't any takeaway pizzas to be had. There were still a few hours before the 5.30 ferry, so I fetched out the guidebook and had a read about this northeastern corner of Estonia. It sounded a nightmare. During Iron Curtain days, Narva had been one of the most polluted towns in Europe. Two massive power stations produced enough kilowatts to keep the massive wheels of the USSR industrial base turning, whilst pumping out uncountable tons of sulfur dioxide, magnesium this and aluminium that into the atmosphere. There was a huge lake nearby, and I made a mental note not to eat any fish when I got there. According to the guidebook, 90% of the population in the area were Russian-speaking, and, in the eyes of the Estonian government, Russian citizens. They took the line that if you couldn't speak Estonian, you couldn't get Estonian citizenship. The upshot was a big gang of Russians right on the border with Russia, holding old Russian passports, who had to stay in Estonia, a country that didn't acknowledge them. Five trains a day left Tallinn heading east. Some went straight on to St. Petersburg and Moscow, and some just stopped at Narva, about a five-hour journey. No problem at all. I'd get the ferry tonight, check into a hotel, sort my shit out and get the train in the morning. That would be the easy bit. I had the Narva contact name and address in my head. An hour of repeating it while reading had sorted that out. I ripped the cross off the greaseproof paper, rolled it in the post-it, and ate it. Everything else on this job was like some spy film, so why not go the whole hog? I kept the guidebook and map because I was going to be a tourist. If asked, I was exploring the region's immensely rich culture. Well, that was what it said in the guidebook. I couldn't wait. As the final preparation for the journey, I went into the bathroom and ran a basin of warm water. Then, unwrapping the complimentary sliver of soap... I proceeded with a little task I never look forward to. Chapter 28 
I followed the herd out of the terminal waiting room and up the embarkation ramp onto a massive roll-on, roll-off ferry that wouldn't have looked out of place at Dover docks. When I saw that we all had to pass through a metal detector, I felt relieved I'd left the P7 with my other staff in the station's left luggage. I was using Nick Davidson's passport. The woman who swiped it at passport control was one of the few immigration officers who'd ever looked at the picture. Few of my fellow foot passengers appeared anything like as prosperous as the Finns I was used to seeing. I guess they were Estonians. They all seemed to be wearing fake fur Cossack-style hats and a lot of leather-effect PVC. Several were in those full-length quilted coats that football managers wear, but they were really old and shabby. They were toting enormous plastic shopping bags, the kind that market traders pack their stock in, all stuffed to the brim with everything from blankets to catering packs of rice. In each case, the whole extended family seemed to have come along for the ride, kids, wives, grannies, everybody going hubba-hubba to each other in Estonian. My plan had been to keep out of the way and curl up somewhere quiet and get my head down, but once on board, I realised there was no chance of that. The air was filled with the binging and whirring of video games and fruit machines, overlaid with kids screaming up and down the corridors, their parents in hot pursuit. Sometimes walking sideways to get out of the way of kids and people with their big bundles of whatever coming from the other direction, I saw where the main crowd was headed, towards the bars and buffet. If I couldn't sleep, I might as well eat. The crowd thinned as the corridor opened up into a large bar area. Like the corridors, all the walls were covered with mahogany-effect veneer, giving it a dark, depressing old British rail feel. This area seemed to be full of well-dressed Finns who had driven their cars aboard before us. They were laughing and joking noisily amongst themselves, throwing drink down their necks like condemned men. I guess they were booze cruisers, going over to Tallinn to stock up on duty free. These guys didn't have shopping bags and reeked of disposable income. Their ski jackets were top-of-the-range labels, and their thick overcoats were wool, probably cashmere. Underneath they all sported big chunky sweaters with crew or polo necks. The only thing they had in common with the Estonians was a love of tobacco. There was already a layer of smoke covering the ceiling, waiting its turn to be sucked out by the overworked air conditioning system. The currency desk was just the other end of the bar. I lined up and changed $100 US into whatever the local money was called. I didn't even bother looking at exchange rates to see if I was being ripped off. What was I going to do, take my business elsewhere? Eventually, fighting my way to the buffet, I picked up a tray and joined the queue. I wasn't particularly fussed about the wait. It was going to be a long journey, and it wasn't as if I was itching to get back and join the lushes in the bar. Twenty minutes later, I was sitting with a family at a bolted-down plastic table. The father, who looked over fifty-five, but was probably under forty, still had his woolen hat on. His wife looked about ten years older than him. There were four kids, each attacking a large plate of pale, undercooked chips. Mine looked the same, plus I had a couple of scary-looking red sausages. The sound of laughter echoed from the bar, along with piped Muzak, badly performed cover versions of Michael Jackson and George Michael. Thankfully, the ship's safety briefing, which started, then carried on forever in about five languages, cut wannabe George off in his prime. As I tucked into my chips and surprise bags, the husband pulled out a pack of cigarettes and he and his wife lit up. They smoked contentedly in my face, flicking the ash onto their empty plates, finally stubbing out their dog ends so they sizzled in the ketchup. I decided it was time for a walk. Their kids could finish off my food. We were now in open sea, and the boat rocked from side to side and plunged up and down. Children were having great fun in the corridors, being thrown from wall to wall, and their parents were telling them off much more quietly. In fact, many of them looked paler than the chips I'd left on my plate. I passed the newsstand. The only thing they had in English was another guidebook to Estonia— I decided to go back to the bar and read my own. The Finns, undeterred by the heavy seas, were swigging back cough beer, or at least trying to. 
The swell meant there was as much liquid on the floor as there was going down their necks. The only seat was at the end of a semicircular booth, where six Finns in their late thirties, three men and three women, all expensively dressed, were smoking camels and downing vodka. I gave them a fuck-off smile as I settled down on the red, leather-look plastic and opened the guidebook. Estonia, I was told, sandwiched between Lithuania and Russia, was about the size of Switzerland and only two or three hours' drive from St. Petersburg. It had a population of 1.5 million, the size of Geneva, and if that was the best they could find to say about it, it must be a pretty mind-numbing place. Estonians seemed to have suffered all the rigours of life as a former Soviet republic. They'd had food coupons, bread queues, fuel shortages, and inflation higher than the NatWest Tower. All in all, it sounded a pretty grim place, a bit like a giant Slavic version of a South London housing estate. The pictures of the old city centre of Tallinn showed medieval walls, turrets, and needle-pointed towers. I couldn't wait to see the gabled roots which the guide extolled. When I read on, I discovered that most of the country's investment had been in this one tiny area, and that almost everywhere else they hadn't had gas or water since the Russians left in the early 90s. But then again, tourists wouldn't go that far out of town, would they? I sat there with my eyes closed, deeply bored. There was no way I was going to socialise with the Finns. I had work to do on the other side, and besides, from what I saw, I doubted I could keep up with their drinking, especially the women. I sank as low as I could in the seat to avoid the rising cigarette smoke, which was now a solid fog above me. The ferry was slewing about big time, and now and again the propellers roared as if they'd come right out of the water, accompanied by a collective funfair cry of "Whoa!" from the crowd in the bar. There was nothing but darkness to be seen from the window, but I knew there was plenty of ice out there somewhere. I crossed my arms over my chest, let my chin drop, and tried to sleep. Not that it was going to happen, but whenever there's a lull, it pays to recharge the batteries. An announcement over the PA system sort of woke me up, though I wasn't too sure if I'd been sleeping. I guessed it was telling us what fantastic bargains were to be had in the ferry's duty-free shops, but then I heard the word Tallinn. The system carried on with its multilingual address, eventually coming to English. It seemed we had about thirty minutes before docking. I packed the book in the day sack along with my new woolen hat and washing kit, and wandered down the corridor. People were walking like drunks due to the swell, and now and again I had to put my hand up on the wall to stop myself falling. Following signs to the toilets, I slid aside a dark wood veneer door and walked down a flight of stairs. A couple of blokes were chatting in the gents, zipping up and lighting cigarettes as they left. There was as much alcohol on the floor as there was on the ground in the bar. The only difference was it had been through people's kidneys first. The room was boiling hot, making the smell even worse. I trod carefully towards the urinals. Each one had a pool of dark yellow fluid slowly seeping past the piled-up cigarette ends blocking its path. I found one that wasn't so full it would splash back on me, got my left hand up against the bulkhead to steady myself, and unzipped, listening to the relentless throb of the engines. The toilet door was pushed open, and another couple of guys came in. By the look of their Gore-Tex jackets, they were Finns. I was sorting myself out, trying to zip up with one hand while using the other to stop me falling over. The boy in black headed for the vacant toilet cubicles behind me, and the other dossed around by the row of sinks to my left. His green jacket reflected on the stainless steel pipes that ran from the water dispenser for the urinals above my head. I couldn't see what he was actually doing because the pipe shape distorted him like a fairground mirror, but whatever it was, it just looked wrong. At the same time, I heard the rustle of Gore-Tex and saw black in the reflection too. I turned just in time to see an arm raised, ready to do my back some serious damage with some kind of knife. Never let them come to you. I screamed, hoping to disorient him. While charging the two or three steps towards him, focusing on his arm, I didn't care about the other guy yet. This one was the main threat. 
Grabbing his raised wrist with my right hand, I kept moving. That turned his body to the left, his natural momentum helping me. My left hand then helped to spin him so he had his back to me, at the same time pushing him towards the cubicles. We stumbled into one of the stalls, the thin chipboard walls rattling as we grappled in the confined space. He went down on his knees by the pan. There was no seat. It had probably been ripped off years ago and taken home. Still gripping his right wrist, I leapt over his back and forced both my knees straight down onto the back of his head. There was no time to fuck about. There were two of these guys to deal with. Bone crunched on ceramic. I heard teeth cracking and his jaw grind under my weight, mixed with an almost childlike muffled screaming. I saw him drop the knife. My right hand scrabbled around on the floor in search and closed around it. Only it wasn't a knife, but an autojet, an American one. I recognized the make and I knew what it did. Gripping the automatic syringe in my right hand, I had four fingers clasped around the cylinder, which was about the size of a thick marker pen, and my thumb on the injection button, ready to attack the splashing feet and green rustling Gore-Tex behind. Too late. The boy was right on top of me. He also had an autojet. I could feel the needle penetrate and then its contents emptying into my buttock. It was like a golf ball was growing under my skin. I threw myself backwards, crashing as hard as I could into his body, pushing him towards the urinals. The swell made us both stagger as the ferry tilted. Once we'd banged against the white ceramic, his fist started to hit the side of my face from behind me as I kept him pinned in position. He was even biting into my skull, but I couldn't really feel the outcome. The autojet was having its own effect on me. Rapid heartbeat, dry mouth, vision beginning to go hazy. I was sure it was mainly scopolamine mixed with morphine. When it's injected into a body, the effect produced is a tranquilized state known as twilight sleep. This combination of drugs was formerly used in obstetrics, but was now considered far too dangerous, except when, like the British and American intelligence services, you're not too concerned about the patient's charter. I'd done a few targets with this stuff, making it easier to drag them off to a three by nine. I'd never thought I would get the good news myself, but at least now I could personally endorse the product. Everything was going into slow motion. Even his shouting against my ear was blurred as he bucked and twisted, trying to free himself from between me and a urinal. Ramming the autojet against the leg that was kicking out on my right, I depressed the button with my thumb. Automatically, the needle sprang forward, punctured his jeans and skin, dispensing its juice. Now, we were equal. It was just a case of who dropped first. Fuck you! Unmistakably American. I couldn't get up enough strength to do anything but pin him there, using my legs to push my back against him. He dropped the autojet, but I kept pushing him back against the urinal, my feet slipping on the wet floor as the ship bounced around, hoping that he would be the first to lose total control so I could get away. His ass was in the urinal now, and its contents were getting slopped over both of us as I fought to hold him there. He was still trying to punch sideways at my face. I might have been doing serious damage for all I knew, the drugs had kicked in good style, depressing my central nervous system. I bent my head down to avoid his punches as he jerked about, as if he was having a fit. In front of me, in a cubicle, a blurred black figure was slumped on the floor. The toilet door must have opened, not that I heard it, just the incomprehensible shouting as my legs started to lose the ability to hold me up in the swell. I took a deep breath and must have sounded like a drunk as I looked around at the newcomers. Fuck off! Fuck off! Fuck off! Even the American joined in. Fuck you! Their hazy, shadowy figures disappeared. The American's legs were wobbling as much as mine now. My head was still trying to bury itself into my chest as he made wild grabs at my face, hoping to get at my eyes. He wasn't shouting anymore, but giving off loud moans, as if he'd lost the ability to form words correctly, and pulling on my ears and hair with whatever strength he had left. I could hear his breathing above me. I threw my hands in the direction of the sound. He released his grip on my head and slapped them down. My legs couldn't hold him in position any more, and I fell, first to my knees, then face down into the liquid swirling around the floor. Feeling it slurp into my mouth, I knew I was on the way out. 
But as the American fell to his knees to my right, splashing more liquid over my face and snorting like a warthog, I knew I wasn't the only one. He sat back on his heels, resting against the urinal, fumbling to get his jacket zip undone. I couldn't let that happen. He could have had a weapon. So taking a deep breath that took in more swill off the floor, I started to crawl up him. His hands tried pushing me off as he growled down at me. At least his hands weren't going for his pockets anymore, just my face. I managed to get my hands around his throat, shaking his head from side to side. He made a whining noise like a two-year-old refusing food. If only I could just press one of my thumbs into the base of his throat, at the point just above where the two collarbones met and just below his Adam's apple, I could drop him as long as his body was still capable of registering what was going on. I got my hand down the top of his jacket, probing inside with my thumb, until I found the bone, and then the soft spot. Then I pushed in with all my strength. At once, he began to come down with me as I sank slowly to the floor. He didn't like it at all. A quick, hard jab with two straight fingers or a key into this soft point could drop someone to the ground as quickly as if he's been given an electric shock. He hit the floor, his legs still under him, bucking to free them like some frantic insect as I lay on top of him. He was choking now, wheezing, gurgling noises issued from his nose and mouth. Trying to keep focus and some sort of coordination, I ran a hand over his jacket pockets. Nothing. I tried to unzip the jacket, but my fingers couldn't grip the tab. As I pulled down, they just fell away. Still on top of him, watching his hair soak up the spilled contents of the urinal, I started feeling around his waist, wanting to find a weapon. My hands couldn't register if he was carrying or not. They refused to send any type of message to my brain. I lay there, knowing that I must get up, sure that he was thinking the same. The other boy behind me in the cubicle started moaning and coughing, his boots scuffing the floor as he tried to move. With any luck, he was more worried about his dental plan for the next few years than anything else. Dragging myself to my feet, I staggered on the spot above the American. Then my knees buckled and I collapsed on his head. Blood spurted from his nose as I pulled myself up on a urinal, he curled up on the soaking floor, still trying to reach out and grab my leg. I had to get out of there and hide up for the next twenty minutes or so until I could get off the ferry. I wasn't going to black out. They wouldn't have wanted to carry a dead weight. The drugs would just make me like the fins in the bar and make it easier to drag me to their car. Stumbling up the stairs, I seemed to trip on almost every one. After about six attempts at pulling the door open, I was back in a corridor. The smell of smoke, the shouts of children and the jingle of gaming machines were all magnified in my spinning, dazed head. I was zigging while the rest of the world zagged. I had to find myself a little spot where I could sit down and be no problem to anybody. That wasn't easy. I'd been fighting and rolling around in piss and must have looked in a terrible state. Maybe I'd feign seasickness. Staggering into a seating area, I made my way into the corner, slumping against the back of a seat before falling into it. The Estonian, whose big bag had had to be whipped away before I fell on it, shook his head knowingly, as if this sort of thing happened to him every day. Flicking his cigarette ash onto the floor, he carried on chatting to his neighbour before they both inched away. I must have stunk of piss. Trying to hum a tune, anything to look like a seasick drunk, I decided to take my day sack off. I must have looked stupid sitting with it on my back, slumped forwards and with the coordination of a jelly, I made a complete mess of it. After fighting with the straps for a while, I just binned it and collapsed. Announcements were being made on the PA. My head was swimming. Were they talking about me? Were they appealing for witnesses? The man next to me stood up and so did his friend. They started gathering together their bits and pieces. We must have arrived. There was a sudden migration of people, all going in one direction. I just had to try and keep aware of what was going on. I moved off behind them, stumbling amongst the crowd. Everybody seemed to be giving me a wide berth. 
I didn't know where I was going, and I didn't care as long as I got off the ferry. My mind was in control, but my body wasn't obeying orders. I bumped into a Finn and apologised in slurred English. He looked down at my wet clothes and glared aggressively. All I was focused on was staying with the herd and keeping the day sack on my back. I just wanted to get off the ferry and find somewhere to hide while all the shit in my body did what it had to do and then left me alone. Following people with prams and plastic bags, I lurched down a covered gateway and joined the line for immigration. The woman said nothing as she checked my passport. I swayed and smiled as she eyed me, probably in disgust, and stamped one of the pages. Picking it up, at the second attempt, I staggered on through to the arrivals hall, focusing really hard on making sure it went back into my inside jacket pocket. Outside, the cold wind buffeted my jacket as I staggered across a snow-covered car park. The whole area was brightly lit. Most of the cars had a layer of snow, and a few were having ice scraped off them as bulging plastic bags were forced inside and exhaust fumes filled the air. I could see the top half of the ferry behind me, beyond the terminal. I could hear the metallic rumbling of cars and trucks leaving the ship. In front of me was darkness, then, in what seemed the far distance, some very blurred lighting. That was where I needed to go. I needed to find a hotel. Reeling against the line of vehicles, I got to the end of the car park and hit dark, snow-covered waste ground. There were a number of well-worn tracks heading in the direction of the lights in the distance. Way over to my right, a convoy of headlamps trailing back to the ferry were heading the same way. I started following a track and immediately fell down, not really feeling anything. Carrying on as best I could, I was soon in darkness and walking through trees. To my left was a large, derelict warehouse. Stopping to rest against a tree... I fixed my eyes on the lights ahead and could hear faint noises of cars and music in the distance. Things were looking up. I pushed myself off the tree trunk and staggered on. I didn't even see where the boys came from. All I felt was two lots of arms grabbing me and dragging me towards the decaying building. I couldn't see their faces in the darkness, just the glow from a cigarette stuck in one of their mouths. My feet were dragging along the ground as my attackers crunched their way through the lumpy snow. I tried to resist, but put up the fight of a five-year-old. Fuck. Next stop, a three-by-nine. They threw me against the doorway, which had been filled in with breeze blocks. I managed to turn, so I hit it with my back, but it knocked the wind out of me as I slid down onto my ass. The kick started to rain in. All I could do was curl up and take it. At least I was aware enough to know that I'd be too slow to escape or retaliate. I'd have to wait until they'd finished the softening up process, then see what I could do. No way was I going to let these fuckers take me away if I could help it. My hands were up around my head to protect it, knees up by my chest. Each time a boot connected, my whole body jerked. The drugging was an advantage as I couldn't feel the pain. At least for now. Tomorrow I'd be suffering. Maybe I could get hold of one of their weapons. At this range, even in my condition, I couldn't miss, so long as I could manipulate the thing once I'd got it. You never know until you try, and I'd rather go down trying than not try at all. The attack stopped as suddenly as it had started. The next thing I felt was the day sack being pulled off my back, and even if I'd wanted them to, my arms couldn't have resisted being pulled back as the straps dragged down them. I was pulled over, exposing my front, and one of them leaned over me and started to unzip my jacket. His own was open. Now was the time to react. Lunging forward, I pushed my hands deep inside his coat, but there was no weapon. He didn't even have one in his hand. Hands, elbows, I didn't know what they were, hammered into me, pushing me back against the wall, and there was nothing I could do to help myself. I was back at square one. They both started laughing. Then it was a few more kicks and some cursing in Russian or Estonian. That quickly stopped as they pulled my arms out of the way 
and finished undoing my jacket. I was lying in slush and could feel the freezing wetness soaking through my jeans as if the piss wasn't enough. The jacket was pulled open and I felt their hands going in, pulling up my sweatshirt and jumper, feeling around my stomach, going into the pockets. These were strange places to be searching for a weapon, and it took a while for it to dawn on me. I wasn't being weapons cleared. I was being mugged. From that moment on, I relaxed. Fuck it. Let them get on with it. I'd be as passive as I could. There was no need to mess with these people. I had more important things to do than fight muggers. Besides, in my condition, I would lose. They were pretty slick for street thieves, checking around my stomach for a tourist money belt, with fast whispers between them in whatever language as they did their work. The cigarettes still burned in front of my face as they hovered over me, finally ripping Baby G from my wrist. They were off, their footsteps crunching in the snow. I lay there for several minutes, feeling relieved they hadn't been American. A truck stopped on the other side of the building, its engine idling. There was a loud hiss of air brakes and the engine revved as it drove on. In the silence, I heard more music. Then I just lay there, totally out of it, wishing I was in that bar or wherever it was coming from. The most important thing now was not to let myself fall asleep. If I succumbed, I might go down with hypothermia, just like drunks or junkies when they collapse in the streets. I tried to get to my feet, but couldn't move. Then I felt myself drifting away. The urge to sleep was just too strong. Chapter 29 Friday, the 17th of December, 1999 I came round very slowly. I became aware of the wind blowing past the doorway and felt some of it push its way into my face. My vision was still blurred and I was feeling groggy. It was like being hung over, only several times worse. My head still didn't feel completely linked with my body. Curled up amongst the beer cans and rubble, I was numb with cold and shivering. But that was a good sign. At least I was aware of it. I was starting to switch on. Coughing and spluttering, I attempted to sort myself out trying to zip up my jacket with shaking hands to trap some warmth. I could hear a high-revving vehicle moving in the distance. I wasn't too sure how far away, but it didn't seem far. I listened for the music. That had gone now. Once the vehicle moved on, there was no more noise apart from the wind and me coughing up shit from the back of my throat. The zip only got halfway as my numbed fingers kept losing their grip on the small tab. I gave up and just held the top half together. Attempting to get my head into real-life mode, I checked inside my jacket. I knew it was pointless. They'd had everything away, both the Davison passport and the money I'd changed. It wasn't worth worrying about the loss. It wouldn't bring them back. Knowing if the contents of my socks were still intact was more important. Feeling around with numb fingers, I pressed down inside my boots and made contact with the dollars. Even more surprisingly, I still had my leather man on my belt. Maybe they weren't as slick as I'd thought, or maybe it had no resale value unless it came with its case. Once onto my hands and knees, I slowly hauled myself to my feet, using the breeze-blocked doorway for support. I wanted to get moving, find a hotel and get warm. I could still get that train in the morning, but then it could already be morning. I didn't have a clue. I had a shivering spasm. Slivers of ice had formed on my jeans as the piss on them had frozen. Feeling in my jacket pockets for my gloves was a stupid idea. They'd taken those too. I needed to get moving and generate some heat. Freezing air blasted my face as I walked out. The wind was blowing big time straight off the Baltic. Jumping up and down on the spot, my hands in my pockets, I tried to wake myself up in the darkness but lost my balance. As I breathed in sharply, the sub-zero air clawed at the back of my throat and nose. I resumed my aerobics, 
but it was more of a shuffle than a jump. The loss of my hat and gloves made me bury my head into the collar of my jacket and my hands firmly in the pockets. I started to pick my way through small piles of snow, which I soon found had gathered round lumps of concrete and twisted steel. I took my time. The last thing I wanted now was to twist an ankle, and the way my luck was going, that was quite likely. Eventually my hands got warm enough to manipulate the zip, and with my jacket done up completely, I began to feel the benefit. A car slowly trundled along the road about sixty to seventy metres to my left. Ahead of me, maybe three hundred metres away, was the cloudy blue and white glow of a petrol station. I bent down, taking my time so as not to lose my balance again, and undid my boot to extract a twenty-dollar bill. After checking that the rest of the money was secure, I staggered and slid towards the blue glow beyond the trees. My condition was improving a little, but I knew I must still look pissed. It was certainly how I felt, like the bloke who believes he's in control, when in fact he's slurring his words and failing to notice that matchstick he just tripped up on. Not that I really gave a shit what the people in the petrol station would think of me. All I hoped was that they served hot drinks and food, and that somebody could give me directions to a hotel. I stumbled on, slipping and sliding on the ice, all the time keeping an eye open for my new mates, or others who might be following the pissed-up foreigner for a few more dollars. Putting my hand out to rest against the tree for a while, it dawned on me that it was going to be very difficult, maybe impossible, to check into a hotel. In a country like this, they'd insist on passport details, and possibly even visas. The Russians might have gone but their bureaucracy would have stayed behind. I could hardly say I'd left my passport in the car. What car? There was also something else. I wouldn't know until it was too late whether the police made spot checks or the hotels had to report anything suspicious, such as a man covered in piss with no passport trying to pay in US dollars. It depressed me, but I couldn't take that chance. End of Side 17 Side 18 Lurching off again towards the petrol station, I was getting nearer to the road. There was virtually no traffic or noise from anywhere, just the odd set of headlights and the rumble of tyres over what sounded like cobblestones and slush in the distance. Intermittent streetlights illuminated snow swirling from the ground, making it look as if it was just hanging there. There were about thirty metres of snow and ice left to cover before I hit the road beside the petrol station. I didn't know what to expect when I got inside, but it looked very much the same as a run-of-the-mill Western European one. In fact, it looked almost too new and shiny to be in the middle of such a run-down area. I stumbled across to the road, it was indeed made of cobblestones, but not like the ones in Finland. These were old, crumbling or missing, with potholes filled with ice every few metres. Standing under the bright blue-lit canopy, I banged my boots to clear the snow and tried to make myself look respectable, miming as if I'd lost my glasses when I checked that it was in fact a twenty-dollar bill. I wasn't going to risk a fifty-dollar or one hundred-dollar, I could get fucked over again if seen with that amount of money round here. The wind hit the pumps with a high-pitched wail as I went through the door. I entered a new world, warm and clean, with plenty of goods laid out in exactly the way they would be in a convenience store anywhere else in Europe. I wondered if I was hallucinating. They seemed to be selling everything from motor oil to biscuits and bread, but especially rows and rows of beer and a pile of crates with more litre bottles of the stuff next to the spirits. The only thing missing, and which I'd been hoping for, was the smell of coffee. There was no sign of hot drinks at all. Two guys in their late teens looked up from behind the counter, then went back to studying their magazines, probably feeling ridiculous in their red and white striped waistcoats and caps. They didn't look too bright this morning, as they smoked and picked their noses, but then... I wasn't exactly looking like Tom Cruise. 
I wobbled around the shelves, picking up a handful of chocolate bars, then some shrink-wrapped cold cuts from the chilled compartment. I might not have been at my most alert, but I still knew it was important to get some food down me. They both stared at me as I dumped my goods on the counter, and it took me a while to realize that I was swaying on my feet. Resting two fingers on the counter to steady myself, I gave them a big smile. Speak English. The one with the zit saw my twenty dollars. American? No, no, Australian. I always said I was from Australia, New Zealand, or Ireland. They're neutral, easygoing, and well known as travellers. Tell people you're a Brit or an American, and somebody somewhere is bound to be pissed off with you about whatever country you've bombed recently. He looked at me, trying to work that one out. Crocodile Dundee. I mind strangling a croc. Good day, mate. He smiled and nodded. Handing him the bill, I pointed at my stuff. Can I pay you with this? He studied a folder, probably the exchange rates. Behind him, camel cigarette cartons were neatly arranged around a special offer camel clock. I tried to focus my eyes on the hands and managed to make out that it was just after three thirty. No wonder I was freezing. I must have spent hours in that doorway. At least my nose was starting to warm up a bit in here. I could feel it starting to tingle—a good sign that the auto jet's effects were wearing off. He exchanged the bill without a second thought. Everybody likes hard currency. My cold fingers fumbled with the large amount of paper and coins he gave me as change. In the end, I just cupped one hand and scooped the money into it with the other. As he handed me my carrier bag, I asked, "Where is the train station?" Huh? It was time to play Thomas the Tank Engine. I pulled the steam whistle. Ooh, ooh, chug, chug, chug. They liked that and started gobbing off in what I guess was Estonian. My mate with zits pointed to the right of the forecourt where the road bent to the left before disappearing. I put my hand up in a big Australian thank you gesture. Walked out and turned right as they had directed. Straight away, the cold wind hit me. My nose and lungs felt as if I was inhaling tiny fragments of broken glass. The pavement taking me towards the bend was covered with ice the colour of mud. This was so different from Finland, where public paths were kept scrupulously clear. Here, the staff had just been trodden down, turned to slush, then frozen. Empty cans and other lumps of litter sticking out at crazy angles made me lift my feet high to make sure I didn't trip over. As I followed the road, looking for signs to the station, I threw chunks of very hard chocolate down my neck. I must have looked like someone walking home with a kebab after a good night out. After fifteen minutes of swaying down a dark, deserted street, I came across railway tracks and followed them. Just a quarter of an hour later. I was going through heavy glass doors into the dimly lit station. It smelled of fried food and vomit, and like any other railway station in the world, it offered a full range of drunks, addicts, and homeless people. The interior was concrete with stone slab floors. It must have looked great on the drawing board in the seventies, which was when it was probably built, but now it was badly lit, neglected, and falling apart. Complete with fading posters and peeling paint. At least the place was warm. I made my way along the main concourse, looking for a place to curl up and hide. I felt as if that was all I'd been trying to do since getting on the ferry. All the good sites were already booked, but I eventually found an alcove and dropped down onto my ass. The smell of urine and decaying cabbage was overpowering. No wonder the space was vacant. Somebody obviously ran a stall there, specialising in rancid vegetables. Then had a piss against the wall every evening before he went home. I pulled the food from my pocket. I really didn't want any more, but made myself eat the remaining two chocolate bars and the meat. Then rolled over onto my right-hand side, bringing my knees up into a fetal position, with my face resting on my hands amongst the unswept dirt and dog ends. I was past caring. I just wanted to sleep. A couple of winos immediately started putting the world to rights with loud, slurred voices. I opened one eye to check on them, 
just as a bag lady wandered over to join their debate. They all had grimy old faces, cut and bruised where they'd been either beaten up or had got so drunk they'd fallen over and damaged themselves. All three were now lying on the floor, surrounded by a rampart of bulging plastic carrier bags tied together with string. Each had a can in their hand that no doubt contained the local equivalent of special brew. Another drunk shuffled over to my alcove, maybe attracted by my earlier food fest. He started jumping up and down on the spot, grunting and waving his arms. The best way to deal with these situations is to appear just as mad and drunk as them, and more. I sat up and hollered, Hubba, 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 hubba! Not bothering to try and make my eyes look scary, they probably already did. Picking up a can, I yelled at it for a few seconds, then threw it at him, growling like a wounded animal. He shuffled away, muttering and moaning. That was the only productive lesson I learned in Borstal, apart from the fact that I never wanted to go back. I laid down again and fell into a semi-daze, with what seemed like ten minutes sleep here and five minutes there, waking every time there was a noise or movement. I didn't fancy being mugged a second time. I was jolted awake by a hard kick in the ribs. My head was still aching badly, but at least my eyes were focusing a lot better. I saw a frenzy of men in black, looking just like an American police SWAT team, with black combat trousers tucked into their boots, black baseball caps and nylon bomber jackets festooned with badges and logos. In their belt kit they carried canisters, which were almost certainly full of mace. They were shouting and screaming, hitting vagrants indiscriminately with black meat along nightsticks. For the homeless population of Tallinn, this was obviously Revali. It was certainly similar to some morning calls I'd had in basic training. Taking the hint, I started to pull myself up onto my feet. My whole body hurt. I must have looked like a ninety-year-old as I shambled out of the station with the rest of them, hoping it wouldn't take too long before my muscles warmed up and relieved some of the pain. The cold early morning air gripped my face and lungs. It was still pitch black, but I could hear a lot more movement than when I'd arrived. To my right, I could see the main drag, with intermittent traffic. A solitary streetlight was glimmering, but so weakly it needn't have bothered. Parked up in a row were five black, very clean and large 4 by 4s possibly land cruisers. Each vehicle carried a white triangular logo, the same as the largest one on the back of the team's bomber jackets. There was still plenty of screaming and arguing going on, and I saw my three debating society mates being thrown bodily into one of the wagons. Maybe that was where the cut faces came from. I moved out of the way, round to the other side of the station. There was life of sorts going on there. I hadn't noticed it on the way in, but the building obviously doubled as a bus station. There was a large open area with queue shelters and fleets of dilapidated buses covered in mud. Plumes of early morning exhaust fumes rose from the rear of some of them. People at the back of the queues were shouting at the ones in front, probably telling them to board before they froze to death. Bags were being placed into the luggage holds along with wooden crates and cardboard boxes tied up with string. Most of the passengers seemed to be old women in heavy overcoats with knitted hats and huge felt boots with zips up the front. The only proper light came from the railway station and the bus headlights reflecting off the icy ground. A tram appeared from nowhere and moved across the foreground. The station had windows missing in the offices above platform level, and it was covered by decades of grime. It wasn't just this building. The whole place looked in deep decay. The main drag was badly potholed, and entire areas of tarmac had broken up like ice flows to create different levels for vehicles to negotiate. The men in black had finished their task. Some of the street people wandered across the front in a group, maybe heading for the next refuge point. Others started to beg by the buses. When they stood next to the passengers, it was hard to tell who looked worse off. Everybody seemed to be holding carrier bags, not just the homeless, but the people boarding the buses as well. Not a single one was laughing or smiling. I felt sorry for them, freed from communism, but not from poverty. I waited while the black teams climbed into their wagons and moved off. 
Then I wandered back into the station. The place didn't smell any better now it was cleared, but at least it was warm. I thought I'd better clean myself up. I eventually found some toilets, though I didn't know if they were for men or women. It was just a set of cubicles and a couple of sinks. A solitary bulb flickered in the ceiling and the place absolutely stank of piss, shit and vomit. Once at the sinks, I found out where all these smells seemed to come from. Deciding to give the wash a miss, I inspected myself in the mirror. My face wasn't cut or bruised, but my hair was sticking out at all angles. I wet my hands under the tap and ran my fingers through it, then got out of there quickly before I was sick myself. Wandering around the station, I tried to find out train times. There was plenty of information, all in Estonian or Russian. The ticket office was closed, but a handwritten notice on a piece of cardboard taped to the inside of the glass screen explained that there was something happening at 0700, which I took to be the opening time. I couldn't see if there was a clock in the office, as it was cut from view by a faded yellow curtain. Sheets of paper stuck to the glass also carried various destination names, in lettering I recognised, as well as Cyrillic. I saw Narva and the numbers 707. It seemed there was just seven minutes between the office opening and my train leaving. My next priority was to get a brew and find out the time. Nothing was open in the station, but with any luck there was some kind of facility outside for the bus passengers. Where there are people, there will be traders. I found a row of aluminium kiosks with no unity or theme to what any of them sold. Each of them just sold stuff, everything from coffee to hairbands, but mostly cigarettes and alcohol. I couldn't remember what the currency was. Things were still blurry, but I managed to get a paper cup of coffee for a small coin that was probably worth two pence, from the same kiosk, I also treated myself to a new watch, a bright orange thing with the Lion King grinning out at me from a face that lit up at the press of a button. His paws rested on a digital display, which the old woman running the kiosk corrected to 0615. I stood in between two kiosks with my brew and watched the trams deliver and pick up passengers. Apart from those yelling at each other in queues, there was very little talk from anybody. These were depressed people, and the whole ambience of the place reflected their state of mind. Even the coffee was horrible. I started to notice people huddled here and there in small groups, passing bottles amongst themselves. One group of young men in a bus shelter, wearing old coats over shiny shell-suit trousers, were drinking from half-litre bottles of beer and smoking. In a strange way, the place reminded me of Africa. Everything, even the plastic toys and combs in the kiosk window displays, was faded and warped. It looked as if the West had dumped its trash and it had washed up with these people. As in Africa, they had stuff, buses, trains, TVs, even cans of Coke, but nothing really worked together. Basically, it felt as if the whole country was made in Chad. When I was operating there, the Republic used to be the byword for things that looked okay, but fell apart in ten minutes. I thought some more about the ferry attack. The blokes in the toilets must have been NSA, but the only way I could have been pinged was by them checking the ticketing, then taking and checking out this guy called Davis. Once my passport had been swiped, they'd cracked it. Davidson was on board. The two who'd attacked me would be out of commission but would others soon be on my trail? I bought another brew to get more heat inside me, as well as another bar of chocolate and a loose foil sheet of 24 aspirin to clear my head and help with the body pain. Then I wandered around the kiosks looking for maps as I washed down the first four tabs with crap coffee. I found a Narva town map, but not one for the northeast of the country. Glancing at Lion King as I paid for it, I realised I had to get a move on. On the way to the ticket office, I brushed the worst of the dirt from my jeans. My body heat was drying them out slowly, so I hoped I didn't smell too much. For all I knew, they might have a rule about not selling tickets to dossers. 
I was first in a line of three when the grubby bit of curtain got moved away from the little window to reveal an iron grill behind thick glass, with a small wooden scoop at the bottom where money and tickets were exchanged. A woman in her mid-fifties glowered at me from behind the fortifications. She was wearing a cardigan and, of course, a woolen hat. She was also probably resting her feet on a bulging carrier bag. I smiled. Narva? 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 Yes. How much? I rubbed my fingers together. She got out a little receipt book and wrote Narva and 707. It appeared the cost was 707 hertigrats or whatever the money was called. Not that it left at 707. I handed her a 1,000 note. Twenty dollars US was going a long way here. She moved away from the glass, rummaged around, came back and dropped my change through the scoop. With it was a slip of paper as thin as tissue. I picked it up, guessing it must be some kind of receipt. Narva? Ticket? She gobbed off at me gloomily. It was pointless. I didn't have a clue what she was on about. I didn't ask about the platform. I'd find it. Tallinn Station seemed to be the terminus for all lines. This wasn't St Pancras or Victoria, though. The platforms outside the hall were lumpy, broken tarmac, with ice where the water had puddled and frozen. In places, exposed concrete had crumbled and rusting reinforcement rods protruded. The trains were old Russian monsters with a big cyclops light. They all seemed to be blue, but it was hard to be sure under all the dirt and grime. Hanging on the front of each locomotive was a wooden destination board, and that was all the help you got. I walked up and down looking for the word Narva, brushing past other passengers. I found the train, but needed to confirm it with one of my carrier bag friends. Narva? Narva? The old man looked at me as if I was an alien, muttering something without taking the fag out of his mouth, so the light from the tip bounced up and down. He then just walked away. At least I got a nod as he pointed at the train. I carried on along the platform, looking for an empty carriage, to the sound everywhere of the early morning coughing up of phlegm. People holding one nostril and snotting out on the ground, then putting the fags back into their mouths. There didn't seem to be any completely empty carriages, so I boarded anyway, taking the first free row of seats I could find. The carriage floor was nothing more than welded steel plates, and the seats were also made of steel, with two small, thinly padded vinyl sections, one for your back and one for your ass. There were a couple of 40-watt light bulbs in the ceiling, and that was our lot. All very basic, all very functional, yet surprisingly clean compared to the mayhem in the station outside, and at least it was warm. Chapter 30 The wheels rattled rhythmically over the rails as I gazed out at the darkness. I couldn't see any of the landscape just lights from what I suppose were factories and from windows of row upon row of prison-like apartment blocks. I was sitting by the sliding door at the front end, next to a window, with, thankfully, a heater outlet directly under my seat. According to the travel guide, I'd be here for at least the next five hours, which was good news for my jeans. There were a dozen other passengers spread about the carriage, all of them male, most with carrier bags, and either deep in thought or doing the nodding dog. The door slid back with a crash and a woman in her mid-forties came in, wearing a man's grey overcoat that was far too big for her. Draped over her arm were a dozen copies of a tabloid. She started gobbing off and was clearly asking me something. I waved my hand politely to say no thanks, but she became very animated. When I waved my hand again and shook my head with a nice Australian smile, she reached into her coat and out came the sort of book of receipts that Mrs. Glum had used in the ticket office. I realised she was the ticket collector who was obviously running a newspaper concession on the side. Like me, she was taking the money where she could find it. I fished out my slip of paper, she inspected it, grunted, gave it back and swayed with the momentum of the train onto the next passenger, no doubt telling him that the village idiot was on board. Given what I was about to try, she wasn't far wrong. We began to slow and finally stopped, 
Through the darkness I could see a factory, complete with a series of enormous chimneys. The station didn't have a platform. The factory workers had to disembark directly onto the tracks. Outside, people seemed to wander all over the place, even between carriages. The train set off again, stopping every ten minutes or so to disgorge another group of workers. After each halt, the old diesel engine would strain to get up speed again, belching smoke which quickly merged with the junk the factory chimneys were pumping out. The railway system made Britons look positively space-age by comparison, but at least these ran on time, were warm, clean, and affordable. I thought of inviting a few Estonian train managers to the UK to show our guys how it should be done. The train snaked, shuddered, and shook its way through the industrial wasteland. After half an hour, the light started to die out, and I was looking into darkness again. I decided to follow the lead of one of the other passengers left in the carriage and get some sleep. It was shortly after 9.30, and first light had just passed. The sky, in keeping with everything else, was gloomy grey. Through the grime of the window, I saw snow-heavy trees lining the track on each side, a barrier against snowdrifts. Beyond them lay either vast stretches of absolutely flat open ground, covered in virgin white snow, or thick forest that stretched on forever. The electricity and telephone lines following the track were just like the trees, sagging with the weight of the snow and huge ice stalactites that hung from them. The train was still moving very slowly between stations, maybe because of the weather, maybe because the track was in need of repair. An hour later, after another couple of stops, the chocolate and meat started to take effect. I hadn't seen any signs for toilets, and I wasn't even sure there were any. If not, I'd just have to have a quick dump in the corridor and explain it was an old Australian custom. I walked the length of two carriages, bouncing from side to side, until I eventually found one. It was just like the rest of the train, very basic, but clean, warm, and it worked. Ripping hard sheets from the roll, I threw them into the pan until it was more or less blocked. As I pulled down my now dry jeans and sat on the bare ceramic bowl, I had a quick sniff of the denim. Not that bad, considering. I could always blame it on a tomcat. Bruises had developed on both thighs now. They'd soon turn black, complementing the ones I already had. As the chocolate and meat mix started to force its way out, I fought to keep control, wanting to catch the insurance policy wrapped in two condoms and inserted up my arse with the aid of some Helsinki hotel soap. This was something else I'd learned in Borstal. It was the best way to make sure my fifteen pence weekly allowance wasn't stolen. Cling film hadn't been as good as these condoms, though. It was a bit of a smelly affair retrieving it, but once I'd untied the knot in the first condom, pulled out the one inside and washed my hands, there was even soap and water in these toilets, everything was clean and fragrant again. I was still enthusing about Estonian railways when it was suddenly like being back on the King's Lynn to London line. The flush didn't work. I stayed a while and treated myself to a wash. Back in the carriage, it was time to study my Narva town map, working out exactly where I'd find Constantin. According to Lion King, there was about an hour to go before we arrived. I sat there feeling rather pleased the chocolate had worked and that I wouldn't have to waste time in Narva waiting for nature to call. I dry-swallowed another four aspirin and looked out of the window. No wonder people had been getting off before entering this part of the country— this must be the start of the great industrial northeast the Soviets had created during their reign. Gone were the trees and open spaces of the wilderness. Instead, the view consisted entirely of slag heaps, with massive conveyor belts and factories that churned out smoke from every corner. We trundled past forbidding blocks of flats with TV aerials hung from every window and sometimes enormous, outdated satellite dishes. There were no gardens or play areas, just two or three cars up on concrete blocks. Even the snow was grey. The scenery didn't change much as the stops became more frequent, except that every spare inch of ground along the track was covered with little vegetable allotments. Even the spaces under electricity pylons were turned into makeshift greenhouses using a patchwork of plastic sheeting. 
Just when I thought it couldn't get any more depressing, the train shunted past three cars parked at the side of the road, nose to tail. They were riddled with bullet holes and burnt out. There was no snow or ice on them, and shattered glass lay all over the place. It looked as if they'd only just been hosed down and torched. For all I knew, there might still be bodies inside. A couple of kids walked past and didn't give them a second look. The train stopped with a judder and a loud squeal of brakes. We seemed to be in a rail yard. Fuel bowsers and freight cars appeared on either side, all covered with Russian script and caked in oil and ice. I was back in a scene from a Harry Palmer film again, only Michael Caine would have had a suit and trench coat on instead of piss-stained jeans. The train just seemed to have driven into the yard and stopped, and that was it. Going by the number of doors opening, it was time to get off. Welcome to Narva. I looked out of the window and saw people jumping down onto the tracks with their carrier bags. The only other remaining passenger in my carriage was leaving. I did the same, traipsing through the snow across a massive shunting yard, following the others towards an old stone house. I guessed that it hadn't been built until after 1944, because I'd read that when the Russians liberated Estonia from the Germans, they flattened the whole town, then rebuilt it from scratch. I went through grey-painted metal double doors into the ticket office. The room was only about twenty by thirty feet, with a few old plastic, classroom-style chairs around the sides. The walls were covered with the same thick, shiny, grey paint as the doors, onto which graffiti had been scratched. I thought the floor was plain pitted concrete until I noticed the two remaining tiles refusing to leave home. The ticket office was closed. A large wooden board was fixed to the wall near the sales window, with plastic sliders upon which, in Cyrillic, were the names of various destinations. I looked for anything that resembled the word Tallinn. It seemed that the first train back was at 08.22 each morning, but even if they'd spoken English, there was no one around to confirm it. I stepped round the obligatory puddle of vomit and came out of the main entrance. Over to my left was what I took to be a bus station, the buses were of 1960s or 1970s vintage, all battered and some even hand-painted. People were fighting to get aboard, exactly as they'd done in the capital. The driver was shouting at them and they shouted at each other. Even the snow was exactly the same as in Tallinn, dirty, downtrodden and viciously icy. Digging my hands deep into my pockets, I cut directly across the pothole road, following the map in my head along Puskini, which seemed to be the main street. It wouldn't be far to Konstantin's address. Puskini was lined on either side by high buildings. On the left, what looked like a power station loomed behind them, and, bizarrely, electricity pylons were set into the street and pavements, so pedestrians had to pick their way around them. Russians seem to have sighted all their industrial units as near as possible to the stations that powered them. Then, if they had any space left, they'd squeezed in accommodation for the workers and fuck the people who had to live there. I'd seen enough to tell me this was a miserable, run-down place. The newest buildings looked as if they dated from the 1970s, and even they were falling apart. I headed up the street, keeping to the right. It was quiet, apart from the occasional tractor and one or two Russian-plated articulated lorries surging past. The roads and pavements were jet black with grease and grime, with a good coating of slush from passing vehicles. Christmas hadn't arrived in Narva yet. I wondered if it ever would. There were no street decorations, lights, or anything remotely festive, even in the windows. I walked past drab shop fronts which advertised everything from second-hand washing machines to Arnold Schwarzenegger videos. Further along, I came to a small mini-market. It was an old building, but had the brightest lighting I'd yet seen spilling out onto the ice pavement. I couldn't resist it, especially as I hadn't had anything to eat since my chocolate and meat combo, from which I'd long since parted company. An old man was lying on top of a cardboard box to one side of the main entrance, sheltered by the shop's canopy. His head was wrapped in rags, his hands covered with strips of canvas. 
The skin on his face was dark with ingrained dirt, and he could have grown vegetables in his beard. Beside him was a wooden tomato box turned upside down, displaying a rusty old screwdriver and a pair of pliers that were clearly up for sale. He didn't bother looking up at me as I passed. I must have looked as though I was all right for rusty tools. The store was laid out to exactly the same template as a small town spa in the UK. It even had some of the same brands, Colgate Toothpaste, KP Nuts and Gillette Shaving Foam, but not much else apart from crates of beer and a large chiller cabinet that had nothing in it except rows of different sausages, including the dodgy red ones I hadn't eaten on the ferry, strung out in lines to make the display look more generous. I picked up a family-sized bag of crisps, two packs of sliced processed cheese, and four cake-type rolls. I didn't bother with a drink, as I hoped I'd soon be getting a hot one at Constantine's. Besides, there wasn't much choice apart from beer and half-bottles of vodka. I couldn't be asked to get washing kit or a toothbrush to replace the stuff that had been stolen. All that sort of thing I'd grab if I needed it, but I didn't plan to be in country that long. And, in any case, no one I'd seen so far seemed to give much of a shit about personal hygiene. As I pay for my goods, I help myself to two carrier bags, putting one pack of cheese and a couple of rolls into one, the rest into the other. Passing the old guy on the way out, I put the smaller bag down beside him. I hadn't bought him any crisps because I didn't think his gums could tackle them. I knew what it felt like to spend hours outside in the cold. With hands back in my jacket pockets, the bag dangling from my right wrist and banging rhythmically against my thigh, I moved on. I skirted a pylon that was half in the street and half over the wall of a small factory, and more rows of miserable flats came into view, identical to the ones I'd seen from the train. There were no names on the blocks, just stenciled numbers. At last I'd found one thing that my old council estate had over this place. At least every building there had been named after locations in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. The rest of it, though, was much the same. Rotting wooden window frames and cracks in the panes taped over with parcel tape. I remembered why I'd promised myself at the age of nine that I'd get out of shitholes like this as soon as I could. It was only about 1.30 in the afternoon, but already the town could have done with some streetlights on. Unfortunately... There just weren't that many around to help out. Things started to liven up after another hundred metres or so. I came to a giant car park full of buses and cars. People who seemed to be carrying everything from carrier bags to suitcases were shouting at each other, trying to be heard over the noise of air brakes and engines. It looked like news footage of refugees moving through a checkpoint. The closer I got, the more it started to look like somewhere Han Solo might go to get a spare part for his spacecraft. There were some strange-looking people around. I realised I was at the border crossing point, the road bridge into or out of Russia. Harry Palmer would have been a regular here. The car park was clogged with new Audis, old BMWs, and larders of all sorts, shapes and ages. It was the Ford Sierras that looked strangely out of place. There were fleets of the things. I now knew where all the second-hand ones went when they weren't snapped up by minicab drivers. Money changers plied their trade along the edges of the car park, and kiosks sold all other types of kit as fast as Chad could manufacture it. I walked over to a green-painted garden shed with a small sliding window, dodging the Arctic trucks that thundered past as they cleared border control. If you didn't get out of the way, tough. Camel? Marlborough and a million different Russian brands were taped to the glass together with as many different styles of lighter. An old guy who looked like a gypsy, dark-skinned with thick grey curly hair, showed me his list of exchange rates. It seemed I could get about 12 EEK, whatever they were, to the US dollar. I didn't know if that was good or not, just that Duracell batteries were taped up at just a couple of eeks each so either it was the bargain of the century or they were duds. I didn't want to show that I had money, so I went and sat on a dustbin behind the kiosk, got a warm $100 bill out of my sock, and replaced the boot pretty sharpish. 
Once he'd carried out about five different checks to make sure it wasn't counterfeit, including smelling it, the old guy was very happy indeed with his hard currency, and so was I with my new eek wedge. I left the refugee camp behind and headed further up Puskini, towards a roundabout which, according to the map in my head, led to the road I wanted. The only buildings that looked at all inviting were near the roundabout. Flashing neon signs told me these were comfort bars. Music blared from loudspeakers rigged up outside. Originally, I supposed, they'd been ordinary bars or shops, but their windows were painted out now. It didn't need much imagination to work out what was on offer the other side of the emulsion, but for the benefit of anyone in doubt, there were pictures of women and Cyrillic stenciling, no doubt defining exactly what was meant by comfort. The best picture of all was on a blue window, showing the Statue of Liberty with Marilyn Monroe's face, pulling up her robe to reveal an ace of spades between her legs. Underneath, in English, it read, America, fuck it here. I wasn't too sure what it all meant, but the Russians who had parked up all the trucks along the road obviously didn't have any trouble reading the menu. I'd just stopped by the roundabout to check which road I wanted next when two white Suzuki Vitaras with flashing red and blue light bars screeched to a halt outside Maryland's. Three guys piled out of each, dressed exactly the same as the SWAT team at Tallinn Station, but with a different logo. Theirs was also sewn on the back of their bomber jackets. I couldn't make out the wording from this distance, just that it was all in red and in the sort of typeface used on surfwear. Pulling out smaller truncheons than the lot at the station, they piled into the bar. I stepped into a doorway to watch, taking one of the rolls from my carrier bag. Pulling the bread apart, I threw in a few slices of cheese and a handful of crisps, and watched as a very tired-looking green larder police car turned up and parked near the Vitaras. Two fur-hatted figures inside didn't get out. I stamped my feet to keep them warm. The Vitaras were showroom clean and had a phone number and logo emblazoned on the side and what looked like the letters DTTS. The police car was falling to pieces and looked as if the insignia on the side had been hand-painted. For the next few minutes nothing much happened. A stream of vehicles negotiated the roundabout and I ate my roll, along with a few more crisps. A few of the passing cars were quite new, Audis, BWs and even a Merc, but not many. The popularity battle was really between clapped-out Sierras and Larders. I was still putting the finishing touches to my second cheese roll when the black teams emerged from the bar, dragging out three punters between the six of them. All three were in suits with blood pouring down their faces onto their white shirts, while their smart shoes got scraped along the ice. They were thrown into the back of the Vitaras and then given the good news with truncheons. The doors were closed, and one of the team, noticing the police car, just waved them away. None of the passers-by even bothered to glance at what was going on. It was hard to tell whether they were too scared or just couldn't be asked. The police headlights came back on and off they drove, exhaust pipe rattling towards the border crossing car park. The Vitaras and their crews also left, and I finished the roll as I crossed the roundabout and turned right towards the river. The address that Liv had given me was on this road, which was known simply as Viru. Still wondering what the three guys had done to cause Marilyn such offence, I started attacking the last roll and the remaining cheese and crisps, like I didn't have my own stuff to worry about. Chapter 31 Vidu wasn't any more uplifting than the rest of the town, just grey, miserable blocks of housing, more black snow and more uncared-for roads. Then, bizarrely, just up ahead was a burned-out dodgem car, its metal frame and long conducting rod charred and twisted. God only knows how it had got there. The only thing moving was a posse of five or six dogs creating a haze of steam above their bodies as they skulked around, sniffing at stuff on the ground, then pissing on it. I didn't even feel bad as I dropped my plastic bag along with the crisp and cheese packets, when in Rome. Now and again a patched-up Sierra clattered past on the cobblestones, its occupants looking at me as if I was mad to be walking in this neighbourhood. 
They were probably right if the sulphur fumes I was inhaling were anything to go by. There was obviously another environmentally friendly factory nearby. Slipping my hands deeper into my pockets and my head deeper inside my collar, I tried to adopt the same miserable body language as everyone else. Thinking about what I'd seen at the comfort bar, I decided not to tangle with private enterprise security if I could help it. The state police looked a softer option. Viru started to bend to the right, and straight ahead I could see the icy riverbank five or six hundred metres away. That was Russia. As I neared the bend, I could see into the gorge, with the river Narva about two hundred metres below. Following it round, the road bridge was about four hundred metres away. Lines of cars were queuing to leave Estonia, with foot traffic moving in both directions, carrying suitcases, carrier bags, and all sorts. The checkpoint on the Russian side had barriers across the road and guards checking papers. If the numbering on the map was correct, number 87 Viru would soon be on my right, a little past the bend and facing the river. End of Side 18 Side 19 It wasn't an apartment block, as I'd been expecting, but a large old house that was now a bar. At least that was what the sign said, in white but unlit neon lettering above a rotten wooden door. Big patches of rendering were missing from the front of the building, exposing the red clay brick underneath. It was three stories high, and looked really out of place amongst the uniform concrete blocks surrounding it on three sides. Most of the upper windows were covered by internal wooden shutters. There were no curtains to be seen. There was another neon sign, also not illuminated, of a man leaning over a pool table with a cigarette in his mouth and a glass of beer on the side. According to the sign next to it saying 8 to 22, it should have been open. Trying the door handle, I found that it wasn't. Four cars were parked up outside. There was a brand new shiny red Audi and two Cherokee Jeeps that had seen better days, both dark blue and with Russian plates. The fourth vehicle, however, was in the worst state of any I'd seen in Estonia, apart from the Dodgem. It was a red larder that had been hand-painted and had to belong to a teenager. There were domestic music speakers clamped onto the back shelf, from which wires hung like spaghetti. Very cool, especially the pile of old newspapers on the back seat. I looked through the grime-covered ground-floor windows. There were no lights on and no sounds. Walking round to the other side, facing the river, I could see a light shining on the third floor, just a single bulb. It was like finding life on Mars. Back at the wooden door, I hit the intercom button near the bar sign. The building might be in a shit state as Tom's, but the intercom was in better condition. There was no way of telling if it was working, though, so I tried again, this time for longer. There was static and crackling, and a gruff male voice, half aggressive, half bored, quizzed me. I didn't know what the fuck he was on about. I said, Konstantin, I want to see Konstantin. I heard the Russian or Estonian equivalent of, eh, what? Then there was more gobbing off from him and voices shouting in the background. When he came back to me, it was with something that obviously translated as fuck off, big nose. The static ceased. I'd been given the brush off. I buzzed again, working on the theory that if he got pissed off enough, he might come down to the door to fill me in. At least then I had a chance of making some progress. There was more shouting, which I didn't understand. I got the gist, but carried on regardless. Constantin! Constantin! The machine went dead once again. I wasn't sure whether there was going to be some action now or not, so I stayed where I was. After about two minutes, there was the sound of bolts being thrown on the other side of the door. I moved out of the way as it was pushed open. Behind it was an iron grill door, still closed, and behind that was a guy of maybe seventeen or eighteen, 
who looked like the style fairy, had crept up on him and waved her L.A. street gang wand. I bet he owned the larder. Do you speak English? Yo! You want Constantin? Yeah, Constantin. Is he here? He gave a big smile. Yes, he sure is, for that's me, man. You are the England guy, right? I nodded and smiled, holding back laughter as he tried to match his speech with his dress sense. It just didn't work, especially with a Russian accent. He beamed as he looked me up and down. Okay, smart guy, come on in. He was right. I didn't look as if I'd come straight from the dry cleaners, or maybe he'd been expecting a man in a bowler hat. The grill was secured from the inside with two lever locks. As soon as I'd walked in, both the door and the grill were locked behind me and the keys taken out. He held up his hands. Hey, call me Vorsim. He wiggled his fingers, or rather, the ones that hadn't gone missing in the air. Everyone does. It's Russian for eight. He gave me another quick once over as we both smiled at the joke he'd probably cracked a thousand times. Hey, follow me, England guy. I followed eight up a narrow wooden staircase to the first floor. The banisters and handrails were bare wood, and the exposed steps sagged with age. There was no light apart from the dull glow coming through the ground floor windows. I could only just see where my feet were going. It was an old, once grand house. I couldn't see any evidence of a bar, but at least it was warm and dry, almost too dry. It had that dusty smell places get when the windows are never opened and the heating is on all the time. Our footsteps echoed round the stairwell. Eight was about three steps above me, wearing a pair of the most blindingly yellow and purple Nike trainers I'd ever seen, beneath a pair of baggy blue hip-hop-style jeans that were stonewashed, the kind with big, horrible streaks of white, and a black PVC leather-look bomber jacket with the L.A. Raiders pirate logo stitched on the back. We hit a landing and turned for the next flight, which would take us up to the second floor. Weak light filtered through the slatted shutters. All the doors leading off it were panelled, with faded flowers painted on ceramic doorknobs. It must have been a splendid place when it was first built. We passed the second and carried on up to the third floor, then walked along a larger landing. He opened one of the doors towards the river. Your name is Nick, right? Yeah, that's right. I didn't return the eye contact as I walked past him into the room. I was too busy checking what I was walking into. There was just one bulb in the centre of the room, producing the dingy yellow light I'd seen from outside. The very large room was in semi-darkness and was boiling hot. The only job the lighting did was expose a layer of cigarette smoke that clung to the high ceiling. There was a glow from the TV to my left, its volume set at low, with a body in front of it. Directly in front of me, about fifteen metres away, was a single sash window, its shutters open in the hope of letting in a little natural light. The shutters on each side were still firmly closed. There were no carpets or wall hangings, just empty space. To my right, near a large marble fireplace, three men were seated on fancy chairs around what looked like an antique table with ornate legs. They were playing cards and smoking. Beside them, and to the right of the fireplace, was another door. The three heads at the table turned and stared as they sucked on their cigarettes. I nodded without any reaction from them at all. Then one of the guys said something and the other two guffawed and went back to their game. The door closed behind me. I looked at Eight, who was bobbing up and down with excitement. Well, men, arms moving round like a rapper, you hang here. Vorsim won't be long. Things to do. And with that, he placed the grill keys on the table and disappeared through the door near the fireplace. I looked over at the guy by the TV. The colour picture was a bit snowy, perhaps because it was perched on a chair with a coat hanger for an aerial. He was sat on a chair opposite, his nose nearly touching the screen, too engrossed to bother looking round at me. His area was giving out more light than the bulb in the ceiling. It was a mystery how the other guys could see their cards. No one offered me anywhere to sit, so I went over to the window to have a look outside. 
The floorboards creaked with every step I took. The card school, now behind me, just got back to mumbling to each other as they played. It was easy to see what went on here. Two sets of electronic display pharmaceutical scales sat under the table at this end of the room. Next to them were stacked maybe ten to twelve large Tupperware boxes, some containing white stuff that definitely wasn't flour, others holding dark-coloured pills that similarly weren't Smarties. Directly beneath the window was Viru, dirty snow and ice covering overflowing dustbins. At the corner of the building, three scabby cats lay perfectly still in the snow, gathered around a drain, waiting for their black furry dinner to serve itself up. Over the lip of the gorge, the river on both banks was iced up, but the centre third was carrying big chunks of ice and garbage sluggishly from right to left, towards the Baltic, about twelve k's downstream. Further upstream, the bridge was still jammed with cars and people. I turned back to the room. It might be sweltering in here, but I was desperate for a hot brew. The only drink I could see was a bottle of Johnny Walker on the table, which was being emptied by the car players. They all had black leather jackets draped over the backs of their chairs. They'd obviously watched too many gangster movies, because they were all dressed in black trousers and black crew neck jumpers, with enough gold dripping off their wrists and fingers to clear Estonia's national debt. It looked like a scene from Goodfellas. Packs of Camel and Marlboro lay on the table in front of them, gold lighters placed neatly on top. I made sure they couldn't see my Lion King watch. I didn't want them to start by taking the piss, as there might be a time when they had to take me seriously. A smiling Disney character on my wrist wouldn't help. I turned to the TV watcher as he clicked at his lighter and lit up, holding the cigarette between his thumb and index finger, then leaning forward, elbows on knees, to get his nose back into some low-budget American soap. What was really strange was that the dialogue was still in English. Only after the actors had delivered their lines did the Russian dubbing take place. There was absolutely no emotion in the translation. A woman with more makeup than Eddie Izzard gushed, But Fortman, I love you! Then a Russian voice translated it as if she was buying a kilo of cabbage. I suddenly knew where Eight got his English and dress code from. The door opened and in he came. Yo, Nikolai! The bomber jacket was now off to reveal a red sweatshirt with Bart Simpson karate kicking another kid with fistfuls of dollars. Printed underneath was, Just Take It. Dang from Eight's neck was a thick gold chain that any rapper would be proud of. He came and stood by the window with me. Nick, I've been told to help you. Because, hey, guess what, crazy guy? I'm the only one here who speaks English. He shuffled from trainer to trainer as he clapped his hands. The good fellas looked at him as if he was a basket case and got back to their game. Vorsim, I need a car. Car? Whoa! Could be a problem, my man. I half expected to hear his response followed by some bad Russian dubbing. He turned to the good fellas, spoke some very fast stuff, and did some mock begging. The oldest one, maybe in his early fifties, didn't look up from his hand, but replied really aggressively. He must have been drinking liquid nasty instead of Johnny Walker. I caught his drift, though. Tell the Brit to fuck off, Ski. I wondered if I should produce the insurance policy, but decided not to. Better to save it until it really mattered. Another one of the three sparked up with an idea pointing first at eight, then at me, and may doubt he was hitting something with a hammer. The other two really liked that one. Even the TV addict joined in as they all had a good laugh. It was Merlin's laugh. King Arthur used to get frustrated when he made a kingly decision, and his wizard just laughed, because Merlin knew the future and the king didn't. I felt the same sort of thing was happening here. Liv was right. Don't trust them an inch. Eight's shoulders slumped. He walked back over to me. I'll have to give you my car. Is it one of the ones outside? I'd already guessed, but was hoping I was wrong. Yes, but hey man, I need it for bitches. Will I get it back soon? How long do you need it for? Couple of hours? I shrugged. Maybe a couple of days. Before he could react, I added, I also want to see you later tonight. Will you be here? Cool. 
I'm always here. I live here, my man. He pointed up at the loft, rather him than me. Okay, I'll be back later. Will your friends be here? Oh, sure, Nikolai. They'll hang for a while. Business to do, people to see. I put my forefinger and thumb together and shook my hand. Keys? Keys? Oh, sure. Sure, I'll have to come with you, my man. Show you something cool. He ran through to the other room. The good fellows ignored me completely as I waited, concentrating instead on throwing more liquid nasty down their necks. Eight reappeared, pulling on his bomber jacket and zipping it up as he took the keys off the table. We went downstairs and out into the cold. After locking the door and grill behind us, it turned out that the cool thing he wanted to show me was that I'd have to hit the starter motor with a hammer before it would turn over. He said he liked it busted like this because no one could steal it. While he was busying himself showing me what to do, it was pointless talking about licenses or whatever if I got stopped. I just wanted to get away from here and do my job. I didn't have time to fuck about. The Meliskia knew the NSA were out and about and would be moving location any day now. But Eight wanted to remove his speakers and music first. I looked at the cassettes as he piled them on the passenger seat. There was an array of American rap bands I'd never heard of, all following Eight's lead in the gold chain department, plus some really hip Russian artists who looked as though they were on the way to a reunion of the Jason King fan club. It was the white tuxedos that really gave them class. I was waiting for him to disconnect the speakers when a five-series BMW, with a hint of silver beneath the dirt, cruised down the road from the direction I had walked. I noticed the plates first, because they were British, P-Reg, and it was right-hand drive. Then I looked at the driver. The subconscious never forgets, especially when it comes to trouble. Carpenter. I couldn't believe it. As if he hadn't fucked up my life enough these past couple of weeks. He was slowing down as a van approached from the opposite direction, but it wasn't to let him pass. He was heading over to where we were, and if he saw me, I bet I wouldn't be getting the Russian for hail, good fellow, well met. I jumped into the back of the car with eight and made as if to help him pull out the speakers, my knees badly creasing up his newspapers. The BMW pulled into the car park, its tyres crunching louder and louder on the ice the closer it got. I suddenly found the speakers very interesting indeed, and made sure my arse faced very definitely towards the BMW. I was feeling extremely vulnerable, but not as much as I would if he saw me. The engine shut down and the driver's door opened. Eight was the other side of me and glanced over my shoulder as Carpenter's door slammed then turned back to his beloved speakers. After hearing the wooden door close, I was still pulling out some very dodgy wiring as I asked, Who's the English guy? He's not England, you crazy guy, he tutted into the air. So why has he got an England car? I'd obviously said something very funny. Because he can, my man. Some England guy isn't going to St. Petersburg just to get his car back. <laughs> that would be crazy, man. Oh, I see. In this part of the world, it obviously didn't matter if you drove around with the hot car's plates on show. After all, if you had the money to have a BMW stolen to order, why not flaunt it? I could see the dealer's sticker in the rear window. It was a firm in Hanover, Germany, which probably meant that some British squaddy had been saving up for ages to buy his tax-free bargain only to get it lifted so it could rumble around Narva in the snow. The first speaker came free. I had no idea how he was going to wire it up again. It looked like a telephone junction box in there. The chain around his neck made a curiously tinny noise as he moved around. The rap bands probably had the real thing, but I was sure his bitches never knew the difference. Who is he, then? Ah, oh, just one of the guys. Business, you know. He must do a lot of business here to have his own set of house keys. Don't say anything about me to anyone, Vorsim, I said. Especially guys like him. I don't want people to know I'm here, OK? Oh, sure, my man. The way he said it was too blasé for my liking, but I didn't want to push the point. 
Once the speakers were out, I virtually threw the cassettes at him, wanting to get away before Carpenter reappeared. The bonnet was still open, and I gave the starter motor a seeing to with a hammer. Eight stood by the door, holding an armful of cassettes with the speakers on the doorstep. Be careful with the bitch machine, Nikolai. Before he'd even turned to unlock the door, I had the bonnet down, the engine in gear, and was away, heading back the way I'd come. My head was churning over about Carpenter. What if he was still there when I came back to see Eight after I'd done the recce, or if he arrived while I was in the house? I had fucked up in my attempt to get out of the way so quickly. I should have told Eight I wanted to meet elsewhere. I had to control a rage that was brewing inside me as I thought about Carpenter's drugged-up, fucked-up work that night. It had not only cost me money, but nearly got me killed. Should I even go back and see Eight again? I had no choice. I was going to need help obtaining explosives or whatever else I needed. I drove past the comfort bars, thinking of my professional options and what I would unprofessionally really like to do about him. Fuck it. I pulled into the border crossing car park. It took about a minute to work out how to secure the larder as the driver's door lock was knackered. With the starter motor persuader in my pocket, I turned and began to walk back to the house. As the saying so rightly goes, there's not much you can't sort out with a two-pound ball hammer. Chapter 32 I would have to luck it out and wait for him to leave the house, setting myself a cut-off of two o'clock the following morning. I still needed time to get on with the recce. Lifting Carpenter and keeping him tied up somewhere until the job was finished wasn't an option. There was no time for that. Now I'd got my bearings in this part of town, I cut between apartment blocks and saw some of the worst conditions yet. Sheds burnt out to match the cars and buildings that should have fallen down years ago. There was still an hour and a half to go before last light at about 3.30, but the overcast sky was making everything darker than it should have been. Following the ice tracks in the snow, I turned corners and walked around car wrecks and rusty prams until the house came into view. Carpenter's BMW was no more than 30 metres away. The other three vehicles were also still there, all with a thin layer of ice forming on the windows and top surfaces. One or two people were walking around, but just from block to block, some accompanied by little dogs with knitted coats on. It was dark and cold enough for me not to be noticed as I stood inside what was left of one of the sheds, leaning against the wall with my head down, my hands in my jacket pockets, the right one grasping the hammer. I felt no apprehension, no emotion at all about what was coming. Some kill because they have a good reason. Others, like Carpenter, because they just like it. For me, it wasn't that deep. I did it only when I had to. Flexing my toes in my boots to keep the circulation going, I tried to think of other options, but still couldn't come up with any. There were more important things at stake than this maniac's life. I thought back to the sobs from the man in the lift in Helsinki as he held his dying wife. Carpenter could fuck everything up if he discovered I was here. I was still pissed off with myself for not switching on with eight and asking for a change of meeting place. Because of that fuck-up, I'd got myself into a position where I could land up dead myself if I messed this up. One or two more dull yellow lights came on in the apartments. The noise of a TV hung in the air as a car rattled along the road. Then I heard a baby screaming. I continued with my trigger on the door, listening to the occasional bang of pots and pans from behind steamed-up kitchen windows and their sagging, dirty net curtains. Somewhere in the neighbourhood... Dogs barked at each other, probably just out of boredom. No sign of movement or light came from the house. Lion King said it was 3.12. Still, I watched and waited, feeling the cold attacking my ears and nose, wishing I'd made the effort and bought a replacement hat and gloves. I got another four aspirin down me as my body started reminding me that it had taken a good kicking the night before. I spent long minutes trying to get enough saliva in my mouth to swallow them. Another check of Lion King. 3.58. I hadn't even been here an hour yet, but it felt like six. I always hated the waiting. Another thirty minutes crawled by. 
Then there was movement at the door, a dull, yellowish glow at the grill. Slowly I took my hands from my pockets. Taking a firm hold of the hammerhead in my right hand, I laid the handle along my forearm, on the outside of my jacket. Two men were standing there smoking, waiting to come out once they'd opened the grill. In the glow from the cigarettes and the hall light, their breath vapour was indistinguishable from the smoke as it rose above them. I couldn't make out if either of them was carpenter. I hope not. Taking on two with a hammer would not make for a good night out, and carpenter was bound to be armed. They continued to talk as the grill squeaked open and one of them came out onto the ice. The grill was then closed, leaving one of them on each side. Maybe it was going to be okay. Whoever was leaving had a quick laugh with his mate, who now looked like a prisoner behind bars. Then, as he walked away, he pushed the wooden door closed, rubbing his hands together against the cold. From this distance, I couldn't hear the bolts being thrown. He looked like a Yorkshire vet. I could make out the shape of a flat cap as he moved to the vehicles. I still couldn't tell if it was Carpenter. The man moved towards the five series that was parked side on to me, facing the house. Then there was a jangle of keys. I still couldn't identify him. I would have to get closer. He'd be there a while, scraping the ice from the windscreen. My legs were feeling rubbery after so long standing still. Stretching, I moved out of the darkness, trying to pump a bit of blood around. There were only about twenty metres separating us, but as he neared the BM, I still couldn't be sure it was him. The car door opened, and the interior light shone across his back as he leaned in and started up the engine. Exhaust fumes filled the air as he shoved one leg inside and hit the gas. Then he turned the headlights on. They shone brightly away from both of us, but silhouetted his profile. I recognised Carpenter at once. I took one last look around me to make sure the area was clear. From this moment on, I'd be concentrating solely on the target, who was now ten metres away, hopefully with the engine noise hiding my movement. He was focusing on the windscreen, his back to me still as he leaned over to clear the ice. My eyes never left his head as it moved back and forth in a cloud of breath. He must have heard me and started to turn. I was no more than five metres away, but too far to react quickly. I just had to keep walking, but now veering slightly left, as if I was heading for the road. I got my head down, not wanting to look at him as I approached the rear of the car, my hands under my armpits, concealing my weapon. I had to assume that he was checking out the dickhead who thought he could ponce around in this weather without a hat and gloves. The focus of my whole world was on this man, waiting to hear the noise of the scraper again. I was nearly past him, just approaching the BM's boot, when it finally began again. Scrape, scrape, scrape. It was time to look up and find his head once again as it bobbed up and down in time with the noise. Scrape, scrape, scrape. Supporting the hammerhead in my left hand, I ran my hand down the handle and gripped it hard. At that moment, he looked up again, towards the road. I, too, saw the four white DTTS Vataras screech to a halt outside an apartment block on the other side of the road. I had no choice but to keep walking past him as black-clad bodies jumped out of the vehicles and ran into the building, leaving the drivers standing outside, nightsticks in hand. I got to the road and turned left towards the roundabout, not once looking behind me. I could hear screams and the sound of smashing glass as the DTTS team did whatever they did in apartment blocks of an afternoon. I was cursing to myself, but at the same time feeling lucky they hadn't turned up a few seconds later. What concerned me now was that he could be there when I returned to the house for any kit I might need. I took the first opportunity to turn left again, off the road, and back into the blocks as the BM drove past me, heading for the roundabout. I drove out of town, heading west and following signs along the Tallinn Road to a place called Kochler Yave, about 35 kilometres away. The road didn't hold any surprises for me. The car bumped all over the place, slithering over the different levels of tarmac under the ice and slush. I couldn't complain. I was just happy to have got the thing started again. I went through a couple of small towns, trying to avoid the bus and truck drivers who wanted me to join their death race. 
This was supposed to be dual carriageway, but it didn't work out like that. Everyone took the centre of the road because that was where there was less ice and more tarmac. Seeing signs for Volca, I made a mental note of the time since leaving Narva. I'd be wanting that road later. The wipers were slapping away ineffectually against the shit that was being sprayed up by trucks and dumped on us smaller vehicles. I had to keep stopping, using the newspaper from the back seat to wipe the windows. At one stage, I even had to piss over the windscreen to clear the icy grime, trying to avoid the splash as the wipers did their stuff before it froze once again. Kochlyave, it appeared, was the home of the giant brooding slag heaps and long conveyor belts I'd seen from the train. Bright white light spilled from factories on either side of the road as I duelled with my trucker friends. They eventually dwindled with the industry, and soon there was complete darkness, apart from kamikaze trucks and bus lights on full beam, mixed with cars with only one light trying to overtake the lot of us. I followed the road west for about another twenty kilometres, then turned left, heading south for a place called Pussy. I was in no mood for gags, otherwise I might have passed the time wondering where it might be twinned with. In the loudest headlights I could see that the road was single track and hadn't been used or cleared for quite a while. There were just two tyre ruts worn into the snow. It was going to be like riding on rails. It was another twenty k's further south to the target. There had to be a quicker way of doing it than driving a right-angled box west and then south, but I didn't know how accurate the maps were. Besides, I wanted to stay on the mains as long as possible, and then I could at least be sure of getting there. I was feeling quite pleased with myself, considering I had no map. One of the muggers in Tallinn was probably wiping his ass with it right now. The headlights reached about five to ten meters either side of me, exposing banks of snow and the occasional ice-laden tree waiting to spark up in the spring. I drove through Pussy, which looked like a small farming community. The buildings were run-down shacks made of bare, unpainted wood and surrounded by wrecked cars. The roofs were bowed in with age or bad construction. Most had two lengths of wood with strips going across to form a ladder, permanently attached as a means of getting the snow off. By the look of it, the timbers would have collapsed without them. I reckoned this was the place for eight, without a doubt. A hand-painted larder would be the ultimate passion wagon in this neck of the woods. They had electricity because there was the occasional glint of light coming through the curtains of very small windows, and a dull bulb shone in the back of a barn. But there obviously wasn't running water because I kept seeing the sort of communal hand pump that Clint Eastwood used to strike a match on to light his panatella. These ones, however, were wrapped up in tarpaulin and bits of rag to stop them freezing. The chimney stacks were going for it big time. They must have been chopping logs all summer. There were no warning signs that I was about to bump over the railway track from Tallinn, and after that I didn't see a single sign of human activity. The road got steadily worse. The larder slid all over the place and didn't enjoy the potholes one bit now that my own personal snow railway had come to an end. I checked the odometer, counting down to the only T junction, which, if I remembered rightly, was a couple of k's away. Once there, I at last got help. A small sign told me it was right to to do. I turned left, now knowing that the target would be the first building on the left after two more kilometers. Just after two k's, a high concrete wall appeared in my headlights, about ten meters in on the left-hand side. I drove slowly for another forty meters or so, encountering a pair of large metal gates the same height as the wall. I drove past them, and the wall continued for about another forty meters before it turned at a right angle into the darkness. The second building, just a bit further on and maybe thirty meters in length, resembled a large hangar. It was slightly closer to the road and wasn't fenced or walled in. I waited until I'd rounded a bend and was physically out of line of sight of the target. Then I threw the larder into a little driveway on my left, stopping after a three-foot slide. It was probably an entrance to a field or something, but it wasn't as if people were going to be working on the land for a few more months. I closed the door quietly onto its first click, 
then the second, and used the wipers to secure a sheet of newspaper over the windscreen. I started to walk back down the road, trying to keep warm by moving as fast as I could, and sticking to the ice that had formed on the road to keep footprints to a minimum. I didn't have a clue what I was going to do yet. Chapter 33 After two hours of straining my eyes to see the road through a dirty, smeared windscreen, it was taking a while for my night vision to kick in. A bird screeched in the distance, but there were no other sounds apart from my own breathing and the crunch of my boots on the ice. I found I had to step quite gingerly, so much for warming up. By the time I'd reached the target, the rods in my eyes had realised there was no ambient light and they had to get to work. Not that I could miss the first building, just off the road to my right. The gap of five metres or so between them was knee-deep with snow, covering the fallen brickwork that had spilled out across the verge. It was, or had been, quite a substantial building, though most of the masonry had collapsed, exposing what I supposed was the steel frame. I could see right through it to the field beyond. It was one story, lower than the concrete wall further along, but very wide and with a low-angled pitch roof covered with a thick layer of snow. A very tall chimney stack, resembling a ship's funnel, soared out of the roof on the right-hand side and disappeared into the darkness. Continuing towards the concrete wall, I crossed the ten metres or so between the hangar and the target compound. As I approached, I began to make out the dark shape of a normal-sized door set in the concrete wall. I'd have loved to have gone and tried it, but I couldn't risk leaving tracks in the deep snow. As I walked on towards the gates, the front wall towered above me. There was no light pushing skywards from the compound and no noise. I tried looking for CCTV cameras or intruder devices, but it was too dark and the wall was too high and far away. If they were any, I'd soon find out. A depressing thought hit me. I hoped they hadn't changed location already. I moved the forty metres or so it took to reach the point where the compound driveway joined the road. Turning right, I started to walk to the gates. It was pointless skulking about, I just had to get on with it. The depression didn't lift when I failed to see light spilling out from under the gates as I got closer. As I slowly closed in on them, keeping within the right-hand tyre rut, I began to see that the wall was constructed of enormous concrete blocks, maybe twenty-five metres long and at least three to five metres high. There must have been a fair thickness for them to rest on top of each other like that. They looked as if they should be laid flat, end to end, to construct a runway. I still couldn't see anything that even resembled CCTV or alarms. The two large gates were as high as the wall itself. I was right up against them now and still couldn't hear anything on the other side. The gates were made of steel plate with a thick coating of dark antioxide paint which was smooth to the touch, without a trace of blistering or flaking. I could also see white chalk markings, the sort scored on to guide the welder. I gently pushed against them both, but they didn't move, and there were no locks or chains I could see holding them in position. They were newly made but judging by the exposed reinforcement rods jutting out of the crumbling concrete, the wall wasn't. Set into the right gate was a smaller pedestrian door. It had two locks, one a third of the way up from the bottom, and another a third of the way down from the top. I gently pulled the door handle, which, of course, was also locked. The gap between gate and ground was four to six inches. Lying down slowly on my side and using the length of the tyre rut to avoid making prints in the snow either side of me, I pressed my eye against the gap. I could feel the frozen ground under my body as it made contact, but that no longer mattered. There was light on the other side. I became aware, too, of the gentle hum of machinery. I couldn't be sure, but it was probably a generator. I made out the shapes of two buildings about sixty metres away. The smaller one on the left had two lights shining from the ground floor windows. Their pattern curtains were drawn, but light still spilled onto the snow in front of the building. The noise must be a jenny. There wasn't enough wattage in this country to penetrate curtains. The building was too far away for me to notice anything else about it. It was just a dark shape on a dark background. 
I studied the larger building to the right. There was a dark area in the middle front of the building, its rectangular shape with a semicircular top suggesting a large access. Maybe this was where they kept their vehicles. But where were the satellite dishes? Were they around the back? Or was I doing a recce on the local beetroot boiling factory? And where would they have banged up Tom? What now? I had the same problem as at Microsoft HQ. Too much virgin snow and not enough time. It would have been great to have been able to do a full 360 of this place, but tough, I couldn't. I even wondered about trying to climb up the outside of the hangar funnel to get a better look around, but even if there was a climbing rail attached to it, I was likely to leave sign on the roof or on the rungs, and anyway, what would I see at that distance? I lay there and reminded myself that when you are short of the two most important commodities, time and knowledge, sometimes the only answer on target is P for plenty of explosives. I stayed where I was, visualising how to defeat the wall and get in on target, going through a mental checklist of the kit I'd be needing. Some of the stuff would have to come from eight, because it would be impossible for me to access it on my own in the time available. If eight couldn't get it, plan B would have to be to tie a suicide bandana round my head and bang on the gates, making really rude threats. I might as well. Anything else but P for plenty of explosives would be futile, given the timescale. The rest of the kit I would get myself to make sure it was exactly right. I hated depending on other people, but when in Chad... The cold was getting to me and I was starting to freeze. I had seen all I was going to see tonight. Being careful not to disturb the snow on either side of the tie ruts, I got up checking with my hands that I hadn't dropped anything. It was just habit, but a good one. Then I slowly checked the snow on either side of the rut as I moved back to the road, getting ready to play repairman. If any sign did need covering up, I would have to collect snow from the area around the car and carry it over. Detail counts. There would be no point in picking up snow from near the repair and just creating more sign. I had warmed up quite a bit by the time I got back to the larder. Unfortunately, the first thing I had to do after lifting the bonnet was take off my jacket and ram it down onto the starter motor. I didn't want Tom's new friends to hear me when I battered it with a hammer. Ripping the newspaper from behind the windscreen wipers, I got into the driving seat quicker than last time, now knowing how to play the door lock. The engine fired third time. Keeping the revs low, I drove away, not going past the target this time, but taking a few lefts instead to try and box round and get back on the main drag to Narva. I got lost a couple of times, but eventually found it and rejoined the death race. Chapter 34 I parked up once more in the border crossing car park. It was 9.24, according to Lion King. There was no way I was going to drive straight to Eight's place. I wanted to check out the area first, just in case Carpenter had returned. If so, I would have to spend the night hanging around, waiting for him to leave again. I locked up the car and headed back to the bar, hands in pockets, head down. Approaching from the direction of the burned-out shed, I could see the BM hadn't returned, and only two of the other vehicles were still there, both now covered in thick ice. It was one of the Cherokee Jeeps that was missing. What did that mean? Fuck it. I had no time to mess about. When would be the right time to enter the house? I'd just take my chances and go for it. All I wanted was to get the kit together and make some money as soon as possible. I pressed the intercom button and waited, but got no answer. I pressed it again. A crackling male voice answered, not the same one as before, but just as rough. I knew the routine now, and even a little Russian. Volsim! Volsim! The static stopped, but I knew to wait, even moving out of the way after a minute or two for the main door to open. Soon, bolts were being pulled on the inside. The door swung open, and there stood Eight, still in his red sweatshirt. As he unlocked the grill, he peered anxiously out into the car park. My wheels? 
I walked in and waited as he locked up behind, still frantically scanning the car park. The car's fine. Is the guy with the BMW coming back? He shrugged his shoulders as I started to climb the stairs behind him. You'll need a pen and paper, Vorsim. But what about my wheels? End of side nineteen. Side twenty. I still hadn't answered when we entered the third floor room. With no natural light, the TV room was much darker, but it still smelled the same, heavy with cigarette smoke. No one was here. Nothing had changed apart from the fact that next to the plastic-coated playing cards on the table, there was now a lamp dimly glinting on the Johnny Walker bottle, which was three quarters empty. Three ashtrays were full and spilling dog ends on the once highly polished table. The TV was still on, throwing bursts of light around the other side of the room. Through a snow lens, I could see Kirk Douglas playing a cowboy with the volume down low. I could just hear the dialogue. Yo, Nick, the table. He pointed at several cheap biros and sheets of lined A4 paper scattered amongst the crap. Some had tally marks on. I sat down and started to write a list, wondering if the marks were card game scores or a record of today's deals. Eight pulled up a chair opposite me. Come on, you play. Where's the car, man? Down the road. He searched my face. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. Just let me finish this. I wanted this kit organized and to get the fuck out of there as quickly as I could. Where is everybody? He moved his arms around like a break dancer on fast forward. Business, you know, my man. Business. I finished writing and pushed the sheet of paper over to him. He looked at it and didn't appear phased. I was expecting lots of sucking through teeth, but the only question I got was, eight kilos." Yeah, eight kilos. They certainly weren't the sort of kilos he normally dealt with. Eight kilos of what, Nikolai? His shoulders went up and his face went down. It was obvious he didn't understand anything I'd written apart from eight kilograms. He learned to speak English from the TV. But he couldn't read it. Maybe he should have spent more time watching Sesame Street and a bit less watching NYPD Blue. Shall I just say what I need and you write it down? I didn't want to embarrass him, and besides, anything to speed this up. He smiled. Now there was a way out. Telling me would be cool. Yeah. Halfway through dictating the list, I had to explain what a detonator was. A few minutes later, when he'd stopped holding the pen in his fist like a child and his tongue was back in his mouth, he looked very pleased with himself. Okay, cool. He jumped out of his seat, studying his handiwork and feeling very important. Wait here, Nikolai, my man. He disappeared through the door near the fireplace. A few seconds later, I heard a much older voice roaring with laughter. I wasn't sure if that was good or bad. I didn't try to see who it was. If it was the older voice who decided whether I could have it, then spying on him while he made that decision wasn't going to change anything, apart from pissing him off and making my life more difficult than it already was. The sound of footsteps echoed from the stairwell, accompanied by volleys of quick, aggressive talking, slowly getting louder as people came up the stairs. I told myself not to worry, even though my heartbeat quickened as I listened for Carpenter. As the voices got louder, I still couldn't work out whether they were pissed off or that was just the way they talked. The door burst open, and I watched as the Goodfellas came in one by one, ready to grip Johnny Walker and use him over someone's head. There was no carpenter. It was the same four card players taking off their leather jackets and hats. The old one, carrier bag in hand, kept on his silver gray fur Cossack style number. I stayed put. My heart beating even quicker with relief as I screwed up the first list and put it in my pocket. They crossed the room towards me without any acknowledgement, except from the fur-hatted older one who shouted and waved the back of his hand at me to get the fuck out of his chair and away from the table. I got up and moved. No skin off my nose. I was there for other things, not to get macho. From the window, I watched the traffic queuing at the checkpoint. 
It looked even more like a movie scene now that floodlights were soaking the area in a brilliant white glow. The same couldn't be said for the lighting this side of the river. All four were now sat at the table, pouring the last of the whiskey and lighting up. There was a lot of talk from them, which drowned out the low-volume gunfight Kirk was winning on the opposite side of the room. The old guy pulled packets of sausage and dark rye bread from the carrier bag and threw them onto the table, while the others tore open the plastic protection around the sliced meat and ripped off lumps of bread. I watched, feeling a bit hungry myself, but I didn't imagine I'd be on the guest list. It became obvious, as heads nodded in my direction, mixed with quick glances, that I was the subject of conversation. One of the boys said something, and they all looked over. There was a little joke said and a few sniggers. Then it all got serious again as they got back to eating. I kept pretending to look out of the window and be unaware of what was going on behind me. A chair scraped on the bare wooden floor and shoes echoed on the boards as one of them came towards me. I turned and smiled at the old guy in his hat, watching as the TV shone on him in the gloom when he passed the screen. He was facing me, but talking back to the others, looking very serious. This wasn't another piss-take. An index finger started pointing at me as he got closer, as if to reinforce whatever he was gobbing off about. I looked down in submission and slightly turned back towards the window. From less than a foot away he began to poke me in the back, shouting very close to my head. I turned and looked at him, confused and frightened, then looked down, just like Tom would have. I smelled garlic and alcohol, and as he continued to rant and poke, flecks of sausage hit my face. His face, creased and leathered and showing a day's stubble, was now no more than a few inches away as the fur from his hat brushed against my forehead. He bellowed at me again. I wasn't going to react by moving or wiping away his shit from my face. It might antagonize him even more. I just stood and let him get on with it, just like I'd done at school when teachers went ballistic. I was never scared. I knew they would finish or get bored with it quickly. So fuck them. Let them get on with their fun so I could bunk school straight afterwards. It was one of the attitudes that had fucked up my life. I moved my left hand to the window and supported myself, as I was getting the forefinger poke now, my body jerking back with each jab. Glancing across, I could see the other three at the table, their cigarettes glowing in the semi-darkness, enjoying the cabaret. The shouting and bad breath continued. Sounding as frightened as I could, I stammered, I am here for eight, uh, v v v vorsim He mocked me, v v v vorsim Turning towards the table, he mimed injecting his arm, laughing along with the other three. He turned back and gave me one last shove against the window. I took it and then steadied myself as he headed back for more garlic sausage. He was obviously talking about me as he pretended to take a line from his index finger to the accompaniment of further laughter. Let them think it. The drama was over. Now, where the fuck was eight? I looked out of the window again, slowly wiping all the shit off my face as the floorboards echoed towards me once more. He was coming back for seconds. He got right up on me again and gave me a push with both hands. He was fucking with me. He was having some fun, maybe taking out some frustration. The others laughed as I rode the pushes and tried to lean against the window frame, still showing no resistance, looking forlornly at the floor to appear even less of a threat. He got more serious with each push, and I began to get pissed off. After one particularly hard one, I stumbled backwards towards the television. He followed me, the pushes now punctuated with the odd slap round the head. I kept my face down, not wanting him to see in my eyes what I was really thinking. He kept repeating the same word over and over. Then he started gesturing, rubbing fingers and pointing at my boots. Did he want my money and Timberlands? Money I could understand, but boots? This was getting out of control. If I was right, he would be getting a lot more than he bargained for if my boots came off. I couldn't let that happen. I held my hands up in submission. Stop! 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 He did, and waited for his cash. I slowly reached into the inside pocket of the jacket and pulled out the insurance policy, still inside its protection. 
He looked at the condom and then at me, his eyes narrowing. Untying the knot at the end, I probed inside with two fingers. He barked a question at me, then, shouting something at the others, grabbed the condom and roughly fished inside. Opening the thin paper and partly tearing it in the process, he turned to the table and waved it at them, as if sharing the joke in a Christmas cracker. Bending down into the light given off by Kirk on his horse, he pushed the note in front of the screen. His laughter subsided as he started to read. Then it stopped completely. Whatever the bit of paper said, it was doing the business. He walked over to the others, looking extremely pissed off as he muttered, Ignati, Ignati. I hadn't a clue what that meant and I didn't really care. They all had a read, and it had the same effect on everyone. They slowly turned their heads and stared at me across the room. I brought my hands together in front of me, not wanting to appear a threat. It was good the policy had worked, but it meant I might have to put up with their loss of face. Some people have the fuck-it factor when this sort of thing happens, and regardless of the possible fallout, they'll still retaliate because their pride has been hurt. I couldn't afford to fuel that by appearing at all cocky. I still wasn't out of the woods. Walking over to the table, my face full of respect, I put out my left hand, making sure that Lion King wasn't exposed. It wouldn't exactly help me maintain my new standing. I nodded at the sheet of paper. Please? He may not have understood the word, but he knew what it meant. He handed it back, hating every second of it, and I folded it carefully and put it in my pocket. Now wasn't the time to start putting it back into the condom. Thank you. I gave a little bow of the head and, with my heart pumping as hard as if it was forcing crude oil through my arteries, I turned my back to them and walked to the TV. Sitting as casually as I could in the chair facing the screen, I watched Kirk still taming the Wild West, leaning forward to hear what was happening out there in the desert. My pulse was louder than the TV. I could tell that once I was out of earshot there was going to be some very loud shouting, but for now there was just low, disgruntled murmuring behind me. Where the fuck was eight? Not wanting to turn or look in any other direction than the screen, I sat like a child who thinks he can't be seen at bedtime if he just concentrates hard and doesn't move. They carried on mumbling as glasses were banged with the neck of the whiskey bottle to drown their anger. My eyes were on the screen, and my ears were on them. Five minutes later, just as Kirk was about to save the girl, Eight came back into the room. I didn't understand what he was saying as he fought with a zip on his leatherette jacket, but by the look of it, we were leaving. Muttering a silent prayer of thanks, I got to my feet and tried not to show my relief. As Eight went to the door and I passed the table, they got a respectful bow from me before I followed him downstairs at the speed of sound. Chapter 35 Eight was a happy teddy the moment he caught sight of his beloved larder in the noisy car park. Where do we go now, Vorsim? A block? He already had the larder's bonnet open. A block? You know, an apartment. I heard two metallic bangs as the starter motor got a reminder as to what it did for a living. The larder eventually fired up as he drove us both out of the car park and turned right towards the roundabout. The comfort bars all had enormous doormen standing under their flashing neon to control the evening's trade. Turning left this time at the roundabout, away from the river, we drove past even more establishments and parked trucks. The bar's light slowly disappeared and the darkness took over again. Now apartment blocks and industrial buildings lined the road, in between pylons and shells of crumbling masonry. Fighting with two trucks that were trying to overtake each other, both throwing up waves of ice and snow, we turned left without indicating, then left again down a narrow street, with apartments to the left and a tall wall to the right. Eight threw the larder into the side of the road and jumped out. Wait here, my man! Skirting the inevitable pylon leg, he headed for the main door of one of the blocks. He stopped and checked the stenciling, gave me the thumbs up, then turned back towards the larder to lock up. 
I got out and waited. The loud, constant noise of machinery came from behind the wall as I entered a very cold, dimly lit hallway, so narrow I could easily have put my arms out and touched both walls. It stank of boiled cabbage. Tiles were missing from the floor and the walls were painted blue, apart from the places where big chunks of plaster had fallen to the ground. Nobody had bothered to sweep them up. The apartment doors, which were one-piece sheet metal with three locks and a spy hole, looked so low that you'd have to stoop when entering. We waited for the lift by rows of wooden letterboxes. Most of the doors had been ripped from their hinges, and the others were just left open. I'd have felt more comfortable walking into a South American jail. The wall by the lift was covered with a mass of hand-painted instructions, all in Russian. It gave me something to look at while we listened to the motor groaning inside the shaft. The machinery stopped with a loud shudder and the doors opened. We entered an aluminium box, its panelling dented everywhere it was possible for boots to have connected. It reeked of urine. Eight hit the button for the fourth floor and we lurched upwards, the lift stopping suddenly every few feet, then starting again, as if it had forgotten where to go. Eventually we reached the fourth floor and the doors opened into semi-darkness. I let him step out ahead of me. Turning left, Eight stumbled, and as I followed I found out why. A young kid was curled up on the floor. As the doors slammed shut again, cutting out even more of the dim light, I bent down to examine his small body, bulked out by two or three badly knitted jumpers. By his head lay two empty crisp packets, and thick, dried snot hung from his nostrils to his mouth. He was breathing, and he wasn't bleeding, but even in the feeble light from the ceiling bulb it was obvious that he was in shit state. Zits covered the area around his mouth, and saliva dribbled from his lips. He was about the same age as Kelly. I suddenly thought of her and felt a surge of emotion. As long as I was around, she would never be exposed to this kind of shit. As long as I was around, I could see the expression on Dr. Hughes's face. Eight looked down at the boy with total disinterest. He kicked the bags, turned away and carried on walking. I dragged the local glue head out of the way of the lift and followed. We turned left along a corridor, Eight singing some Russian rap song and pulling a string of keys from his jacket. Reaching the door right at the end, he messed about trying to work out which key went where until finally it opened, then groping for the light switch. The room we entered definitely wasn't the source of the boiled cabbage stench. I could smell the heavy odour of wooden crates and gun oil. I would have known that smell anywhere. Proust's mate's childhood might have rushed back to him when he caught a whiff of Madeleine cakes. This one took me straight back to the age of sixteen and the very first day I joined the army as a boy soldier in seventy-six. Cakes would have been better. The inevitable single bulb lit up a very small hall, no more than a couple of metres square. There were two doors leading off. Eight went through the one on the left and I followed, closing the front door behind me and throwing all the locks. Only one of the four bulbs worked in the ceiling cluster that any 1960s family would have been proud of. The small room was stacked with wooden crates, waxed cardboard boxes and loose explosive ordnance, all stenciled with Cyrillic script. The whole lot looked very Chad. Chad that was dangerously past its use-by date. Nearest to me was a stack of brown wooden boxes with rope handles. Lifting the lid off the top one, I recognised the dull green bedpan shapes at once. Eight, grinning from ear to ear, made the noise of an explosion, his hands flying everywhere. He seemed to know they were landmines, too. See, my man, I get what you want. Guarantee of satisfaction, yes? I just nodded as I looked around some more. Piles of other kit lay wrapped in brown, military greaseproof paper. Elsewhere, damp cardboard boxes stacked on top of each other had collapsed, spilling their contents onto the floorboards. Lying in a corner were half a dozen electric detonators, aluminium tubes about the size of a quarter smoked cigarette with two 18-inch silver wire leads coming out of one end. The silver leads were loose, not twisted together, which was frightening stuff. 
It meant they were ready to act as antennae for any stray extraneous electricity, a radio wave, say, or energy from a mobile phone to set them off and probably all the rest of the shit in there too. This place was a nightmare. It seemed the Russians hadn't been too fussed about where this kind of stuff ended up in the early 90s. Picking up the detonators one by one, I twisted the leads together to close the circuit, then mooched around the rest of the kit, ripping open cardboard boxes. Eight did the same, either to make me think he knew what he was doing, or just out of curiosity. I gripped his arm and shook my head, not wanting him to play with anything. It would be nice to get out of here with all my bits, and without him losing any more fingers. He looked hurt. So once I'd finished sorting the debts out and had stored them in an empty ammo box, I pulled out the policy to give him something to do. What does this say, Vorsim? I presumed he could read his own language. As he moved under the light, I spotted some dark green debt cord. It wasn't in its handy 200-meter reel as I would have liked. There seemed to be two meters here, another ten meters there— but then I saw a partly used reel with maybe 80 or 90 metres left, which would certainly do the trick. I put the reel of debt cord to one side and went to check the other rooms. That was easy enough, because each was about the size of a broom cupboard. There was a tiny kitchen come bathroom come toilet arrangement, and a bedroom that was even smaller. What I was looking for was plastic explosive, but there wasn't any. The only P.E. around here was in the anti-tank mines, and there were certainly enough of those to give me P for plenty. I returned to the main room and lifted one of them from the open box. These were either TM-40s or 46s, I could never remember which was which. All I knew was that one was made of metal and the other of plastic. These ones were metal, about a foot in diameter, and weighed around 20 pounds, of which over 12 pounds was P.E. They were shaped like old-fashioned brass bed warmers, the sort that hang on stone fireplaces alongside the horse brasses in country pubs. Instead of the long broomstick, these things had a swivelling carry handle, like on the side of a mess tin. It was going to be a pain in the ass to get the P.E. out of these things, but what was I expecting? Placing the mine on the bare floorboards, I tried to unscrew the cap, which was in the centre of the top. Before laying it, all you had to do was replace the cap with a detonation device, normally a fuse and detonator combination, then stand well back and wait for a tank. When it eventually started to move, shifting the years of grime that had formed a seal, I knew at once that it was really old ordnance. The smell of marzipan hit my nostrils. The greenish explosive had become obsolete in recent years. It still worked, it did the job, but the nitroglycerin fucked up not only armour, but also the head and skin of anyone preparing it. You were guaranteed a fearsome headache if you worked with it in a confined space, and extreme pain if you got it on a cut. I was taking enough aspirin already without having to deal with that. Eight sparked up. Hey, Nikolai, this paper is really cool. What does it say? First of all, his name is Ignati. Then it says, you are his man. <laughs> Whatever you need must be yours. He protects you, my man. He looked at me. It gets heavy. It says, if you do not help my friend, I will kill your wife. And then, after you have been crying for two weeks, I will kill your children. Two weeks after that, I will kill you. Hmm, that's heavy shit, my man. Who is Ignati? He gave a shrug. He's your guy, am I right? No, he wasn't. He was Val's. The card players had certainly recognized the name, that was for sure. I took the policy from Eight's hands and put it back in my jacket pocket. Now I knew what Liv meant about Tom receiving the kind of threat that made the Brits look a bit weak by comparison. No wonder he'd kept his mouth shut and just done his time. Between us, we carried several boxes down to the car, passing the kid still lying where I'd left him. On the last trip down, Eight locked up the flat, and we stood by the larder with the hum and groan of the factory in the background. He was going to walk from there, as he wanted to go and see a friend. I said goodbye, feeling more than a bit sorry for him. Like everything else in this place, he too was just fucked over.
Thanks a lot, mate, and I'll bring the car back in about two days. I shook his cold hand and then grabbed the door handle as he walked away. He called after me. Yo, Nikolai, hey. There was suddenly a less confident tone in his voice. Can I, can I come to England with you? I didn't look back, just wanting to get on my way. Why? I can work for you. My English is cool. I could hear him getting closer. Let me go with you, man. Everything will be cool. I want to go to England and then I will go to America. Tell you what, I'll be back soon and we'll talk about it, okay? Ben, like I said, two days. He shook my hand again with all the fingers he had left. Cool. I'll see you soon, Nikolai. It'll be cool. I will sell my car and and get new clothes. He virtually skipped back up the road, waving at me, thinking about his new life as I gave the starter motor a bit of hammer, fired it up and did a three-point turn to back out onto the main, passing eight on the way. I'd only driven a hundred meters when I stopped and put the car in reverse. Fuck it, I couldn't do this. As I drew alongside and wound down the window, he greeted me with a big smile. What's up, my man? I'm sorry, Vorsim. I can't take you. I corrected myself. Will not take you to England. His shoulders and face slumped. Why not, man? Why not? You just said, man. I felt an arsehole. They won't let you in. You're Russian. You need visas and all that stuff. And even if they do, you won't be able to stay with me. I don't have a house, and I haven't got any work I can give you. I'm really sorry, but I can't, and I won't do it. That's it, mate. I'll drop the car off in two days. And that was it. I wound the window up and headed back into the centre of town so I knew where I was and could pick up the main Narva Tallinn drag again. I could have lied to him, but I remembered as a kid all the trips that my parents were going to take me on, all the presents I was going to be given, all the promises of nice holidays, and all the rest of the shit that had never happened. It was just said to keep me quiet. I couldn't have let eight get all sparked up, burning bridges and all for nothing. Liv was right. Sometimes it's better to fuck people off with the truth. I found my bearings in town and headed west. My destination was a hotel room where I could prepare all the shit I had in the boot. I was still feeling quite sorry for Eight, not for dumping him, because I knew it was the right thing to do, but because of what the future held for him. Absolutely jack shit. A filling station appeared, exactly the same as the one in Tallinn, very blue, and as clean, bright, and out of place as an alien spacecraft. I pulled in and filled up. Parking off to one side of the building, I went to pay, just as the two staff had started to think they had their first runner of the night. I was the only customer they had. There was a small section in their shop that actually sold bits and pieces for cars. The rest of the space was given over to beer, chocolate and sausages. I picked up five blue nylon tow ropes, their entire stock and all eight rolls of black insulation tape on display, together with a cheap multi-tool set that would probably break the second time it was used. Finally, I picked up a torch and two sets of batteries, and two of the small rectangular ones with terminals on top. I couldn't think of anything else I needed just now, apart from some chocolate and meat and a couple of cans of fizzy orange. The guy who took my money had more zits on his head than brain cells in it. He was trying to work out the change, even though the register had told him. Eventually, he handed me my carrier bags. I wanted some more and pointed. More? More? It took a few seconds of miming and a couple of small coins, but I came out with half a dozen spares. It was sausage and chocolate time. I sat in the car with the engine running, filling my face as I looked out at the main drag. Beyond it was a massive poster site covering the whole side of a building. Mr. Bean was grinning at me like a Mormon, showing me the wonders of Fuji film as the trucks screamed past. I didn't blame them. I was in a hurry to get out of town, too. Feeling sick after eating everything I'd bought, I rejoined the mayhem on the road. 
My destination was Voka, a coastal town to the north between Narva and Kochayave, where I was going to prepare for the attack tomorrow afternoon. I had chosen Voka for no other reason than I liked the name, and that, since it was on the coast, there was probably a better chance of finding a room. Chapter 36 Voka turned out to be just what I was expecting, a small seaside resort with one main drag. Maybe it had been a bit of a hot spot during the Soviet era, but from what I could see of it in my headlights and the occasional functioning streetlight, it was now very tired and flaky, the Estonian equivalent of those Victorian seaside places in Britain that reached their sell-by date in the 70s when everyone started getting on planes to Benidorm. When the Russians had packed their bags a few years earlier, this place too must have rolled over and died. There was no one about. Everyone was probably at home watching the end of another Kirk Douglas film. I drove slowly along the coast road with the Baltic on my left and the car rocking with the wind off the sea. There weren't many lights on in the apartments to my right, just the glow now and then of a TV. Eventually I found a hoteli with a sea view. At first glance it had looked more like a four-story apartment block, until I saw the small flickering neon sign to the left of its double glass doors. As I locked the larder, waves crashed onto whatever sort of beach was behind me, and the wind buffeted my jacket and hair. The fluorescent lights in the hallway nearly blinded me. It was like walking into a television studio, and almost as hot. A TV blared away somewhere in Russian. I was starting to catch the intonation quite well. The sound came from in front of me. I walked along the corridor until I found its source. At the bottom of a flight of stairs, a sliding window was set chest high into the wall. Behind it sat an old woman, glued to the screen of an old black and white TV. There was plenty of time to study her while trying to attract her attention. She wore thick woolen tights and slippers a chunky black cardigan, a gaudy flowery dress and crocheted woolen hat. While she watched the TV, she spooned lumpy soup out of what looked like a large salad bowl. The TV had a coat hanger for an aerial. That seemed to be the law around here. It reminded me of the times I had to dance around the room with an indoor aerial in my hand so my stepdad could follow the horse racing. No wonder I never got to watch Blue Peter. She finally noticed me, but didn't bother with a greeting or asking what I wanted. Nodding politely and smiling, I pointed at a sheet of paper taped to the window, which I presumed was the tariff. Can I have a room, please? I asked in my favourite Australian accent. I was getting rather fond of my Crocodile Dundee impression. It was wasted on her. There was a clatter of footsteps from the wooden staircase and a couple appeared, both dressed in long overcoats. He was a small, skinny guy in his late forties, slightly balding on top, but with the rest of his hair greased back in the style that Eastern Europeans, for some reason, think looks marvellous, and a big, droopy moustache. They walked past without giving me or the old woman a second glance. The woman, I noticed, was at least twenty years younger than Baldy, and considerably less smelly. He had a body odour that no deodorant could tame. The old woman handed me a towel the size of a tea cloth and a set of what had once been white sheets. Muttering something, she held one finger in the air, then two. I guess she meant number of nights. I showed her one. She nodded, writing down some numbers which I took to be the price. Eek, one fifty for the night. About ten dollars. A bargain. I couldn't wait to see the room. I gave her the money, and she put the key, attached to a six-inch length of four-by-two, on top of the sheets and got back to her soup and TV. I didn't get to learn the Estonian for have a nice day. I walked up the stairs and found room four. It was bigger than I'd expected, but every bit as drab. There was a dark veneered chipboard wardrobe, three brown furry nylon blankets on the stained multicolored mattress, and a pair of old saliva-stained pillows. I was surprised to find a small fridge in the corner. When I checked, I found it wasn't plugged in, but it was still probably worth an extra star from the Estonian tourist board. Next to it, sitting on a brown veneered table, 
was a 70s-style TV, also unplugged. The carpet was made up of two different colours of hard-wearing office-type stuff, in dark brown and what might once have been cream. The wallpaper was bubbling in places, with brown damp stains rounding off the decor. But the pièce de résistance was a cushioned corner unit and coffee table, set off by a large, triangular, thick glass ashtray that any pub would be proud of. The beige nylon seating was heavily soiled, and the coffee table had cigarette burns all around the edge. The room was cold, and it was obviously up to the guests to put the heaters on. To the right of the main door was the bathroom. I'd check that out later. First, I bent over one of the two electric fires. It was a small, square, three-bar thing on the door side of the bed. Plugging it in, I threw the switch and the elements started to heat up, filling the air with the acrid smell of burning dust. The second heater, nearer the window, was a more elaborate, decorative model, with two long bars and, above that, a black plastic log effect with a red background. I hadn't seen one since I was at my auntie's house, aged about seven. I plugged it in, too, and watched as its red bulb lit up beneath the plastic and a disc started to spin above it to provide a flame effect. It was almost better than the TV. I went into the bathroom. Its walls and floor were tiled, mostly brown, but others, blues and reds, had replaced some of the broken ones in the days when broken ones were replaced. The management's policy had evidently changed in recent years. There was another two-bar electric fire on the wall above the bath, as well as an ancient oval-shaped gas geezer with a visible pilot light and a long steel tap which swivelled so you could fill either the bath or the sink. I was expecting the worst, but when I turned the tap on, the pilot light became a raging flame with sound effects to match. I was jealous. I wanted one in my house. The water was instantly hot, which was good news. I'd been needing a lot of that soon. Turning it off, I went back into the bedroom, where the fires were starting to do their stuff. Pulling the netting aside, I had a look out to sea. I couldn't see a thing except snow swirling and the light spilling from the window. I closed the curtains and went down to unload the car, starting with two mines in a box and the bits and pieces from the gas station. The old woman never looked up once as I came and went, either because she knew better than to inquire into Punter's business or because she was genuinely gripped by the dub version of the 60s Batman TV series. Once back in the room, I started running the bath, slowing the flow to a steamy trickle. I used a screwdriver from the multi-tool set to help remove the two mine caps, and could smell the green P.E. the moment the first came off. Holding each mine in turn under the tap until it filled with hot water, I then lowered them into the bath, still letting the water run so that it would eventually cover them. Then I went down to the car and collected another two. They were heavy, and I didn't want the drama of dropping one. It took three trips in all to get everything upstairs. On the final trip, I took another newspaper from the back seat and covered the windscreen. I kept unscrewing mine caps until all six were in the bath in two layers, representing a total of over 70 pounds of P.E., Molten explosive would have been injected into the dull green casings at the factory and left to set to an almost plastic state. I'd have to wait for the hot water to soften it again before I could scrape it out. Back in the bedroom, I turned on the television in time to see Batman and Robin tied together in a giant coffee cup, an animated American voiceover telling me I'd have to wait until next week for the next exciting instalment, followed by the Russian translation which said they really couldn't give a fuck what happened. I got hold of the reel of debt cord, which looked just like a green washing line, except that instead of string inside the plastic covering, there was high explosive. This stuff would have the job of initiating the two charges I was going to construct with the PE once I'd got it out of the mines. I cut off about the first foot of cord with my leather man, it was probable that the explosive core had been affected by the climatic conditions and or age, but if so, the contamination normally wouldn't have penetrated further than six inches. The reel then went the window side of the bed. Only prepared kit would go this side from now on. That way things wouldn't get confusing as I became more tired. Without any announcement, Charlie's Angels suddenly burst onto the screen. 
I hoped it was the series with Cheryl Ladd. Farrah Fawcett never did it for me when I was a kid. As the monotone Russian translation started up, I went back into the bathroom. The water level still had a way to go as the steaming water trickled out of the geyser. Time to check the batteries. They were normal rectangular 9-volt ones with press stud tops for the positive and negative terminals, the sort that are used in portable radios or toys. One of them would be the initiation device, providing the electrical charge that would run along the firing cable, which I still had to obtain. It would then initiate the detonator, which would fire up the debt cord and, in turn, the charges. All this could only happen if the power from the battery was strong enough to overcome the resistance from the firing cable and debt. You attach the firing cable to a torch bulb. If it lights up when you transmit power along the length of the firing cable, you've got enough juice to make the thing go bang. It was getting warm enough to take my jacket off now. I took the insurance policy out of the inside pocket. It was looking a bit the worse for wear so I folded it neatly, fished around for the condom, and stuck it in the small key pocket in the front right-hand side of my jeans. Next, I pulled the plug off the bedside lamp and ripped the other end of the flex out of the lamp base, ending up with about five feet of firing cable. Not enough. I needed to be close to the explosion, but five feet was suicidally close. The fridge flex gave me another five. The bath ought to have been almost full by now. I went and checked just as Charlie's Angels, dressed up as old women, but still looking very glamorous and without a hair out of place, were about to infiltrate an old people's home on some secret mission. All the mines were covered with hot water, so I turned off the tap on the geezer. I couldn't see a toilet brush anywhere, but there was a rubber plunger. Using its handle to prod the PE in one of the mines, I found it was still too hard. Footsteps in the corridor signalled that the hotel had some new guests. There was a female giggle and lusty Russian male talk as they passed. Then I heard the door next to mine bang shut. Stretched out on the bed watching Charlie's Angels free the world of evil, I connected the two lengths of flex and taped them up. Ten feet of firing cable was still not enough. The trouble was, I wouldn't know how much I needed until I was on target and I'd have to err on the side of safety. I wished I had about a hundred metres of the stuff, but where would I find some at this time of night? Tomorrow would be too late. I wouldn't have enough time to fart about looking for a B&Q. I had to make more of my own, so it was bye-bye Cheryl. Due to the positioning of the wall sockets, the power line for the TV was quite long. In total, I ended up with about 18 feet of cable. With the TV now off, I could hear the romance developing next door. There were plenty of oohs and ahs, a bit of giggling, and a few slaps on bare flesh. I didn't need the dubbing. I joined the last section of wire together using the Western Union pigtail method. Chinese labourers used it to repair down telegraph lines in the Wild West. It's basically a reef knot with the tail ends twisted together. It not only guarantees conductivity, but makes it unlikely the connection will get pulled apart. The three lengths were all of different thicknesses and metals, but as long as they conducted electricity, that was all I was worried about. I wrapped the copper wires at one end around the torch bulb and taped it in place. Now all I had to do was complete the circuit with the two steel wires at the other end of the cable on the battery terminals, and bang, perfect, the bulb glowed. I repeated the process with the other battery, and both worked, for now. If they both failed on target and I didn't get detonation, I'd have to switch to Plan B and put on the bandana. End of Side 20 Side 21 Untaping the wire from the bulb, I twisted the two copper wires together, then the two steel wires at the other end, and earthed it against the back of the fridge. That would take away any electricity still in the cable. The last thing I wanted was to connect the wires to a detonator and have the thing explode immediately. That wouldn't be a good day out. The coil of firing cable joined the debt cord on the window side of the bed, and I placed the two batteries on top of the TV. 
You never keep the initiation device with the detonators or the rest of the equipment. The fuck-up factor is never far away, and I wasn't taking any chances. The only time all the equipment should come together is when you're going to detonate the charges. A lesson one or two PIRA boys learned the hard way back in the 80s. The foreplay was over next door and they were getting down to the heavy stuff. Either she was really enjoying it or she was going for an Oscar as the bed tried to bang itself through the wall and into my bathroom. When I checked the mines, the water in the bath was rippling with the vibrations coming through the wall. There was still a while to go before I could start digging out the PE. To use the time productively, I took a sheet of toilet paper with me, put my jacket back on and walked out into the corridor. The shagfest reached a rousing crescendo as I placed the small strip of the toilet paper by the bottom hinge and closed the door on it, checking there was just enough paper to be seen. Silence fell next door as I left my neighbours to their cigarettes and Charlie's Angels and headed for the stairs. The old woman was still glued to her TV. Frozen air clawed at my lungs as I peeled the newspaper off the larder's windscreen. The engine turned over sluggishly after I'd zapped the starter motor, but eventually it sparked up. I knew how it felt. Chapter 37 I cruised slowly around town looking for the materials I needed to construct the explosive charges, attacking another four aspirin to sort out the headache that I'd developed after playing with the mines. Spotting a row of skips behind a small parade of shops, I pulled in and sifted through the old bits of cardboard packaging, tins and rags. There was nothing that would do for me, apart from a partly broken wooden pallet resting against the wall. Three sections, each about a metre long, were soon in the back of the car, while a dog, cooped up in one of the shops, barked its head off in frustration at not being able to get at me. One section was going to help me get over the wall, the other two were going to prop the charges in place on target. Lights were off and curtains were drawn as I left the area in search of more stuff, driving through the heavy mist that rolled in from the sea. After ten minutes of patrolling the ghost town, I saw a building that was worth a closer look. Rubbish was piled up outside it, but it was the structure itself that made me curious. It turned out to be an air raid shelter, built in the days when they were expecting Uncle Sam's hairy-ass B-52 bombers to come and dump on them big time. There was a concrete stairwell down to below ground level and a thick metal door which was padlocked. The stairwell was full of wind-blown litter and heavier stuff that had been fly-tipped, and it was in amongst all this that I found some expanded polystyrene packaging. I selected two pieces, each just under a metre square. The corners were higher than the middle, which was contoured to fit the shape of whatever it had been made to protect. Here and there, holes had been punched to save material and give the structure a bit more strength. I now had the frames for the charges. It reminded me of having to make Claymore anti-personnel mines out of ice cream cartons before going into Iraq during the Gulf War. The last item I needed was a brick, and in a place like this, I didn't have to look far for one. Back at the hotel, the old woman had deserted her post and the TV was running what looked like a Russian talk show, with the host and his guests talking at each other very glumly. It looked as though they were trying to decide which one of them should commit suicide first. I walked up the stairs with my finds in my arms, feeling pleased that I had everything I needed for the attack and could now sit tight. The old woman had just come out of the door next to mine and was heading along the corridor away from me with rumpled sheets in her arms. The room was probably rented by the hour and she was mucking out after the latest event. With the faint sound of the talk show in the distance, I checked the telltale. It hadn't moved. I opened the door and waited for the heat to hit me. As I took the first step inside, I knew straight away that something wasn't right. The plastic log-effect fire wasn't dancing round the walls, but it had been when I left. I dropped the stuff I was carrying. The brick hit the carpet as I started to step back into the corridor, and that was the last thing I did for a while, apart from trying to get off the bedroom floor, only to get a blow to the kidneys that put me back down. 
It was grit the teeth and curl up time. There was no time to draw breath. I was roughly turned over and a weapon muzzle was pushed hard into my face. I felt my jacket being pulled up as a hand frisked me. Once I had curled up again and played nearly dead, I risked opening my eyes. The oldest of the good fellas towered above me, wearing his silver fur hat and black leather coat. I could also see another pair of legs belonging to someone else, also in black. The two men stood on either side of me now, whispering aggressively to each other with lots of arm movement and pointing at the dickhead on the floor. I made the most of this time while they waffled, trying to take long, deep breaths, but finding I couldn't. It was too painful. I had to get by with short, sharp gasps, trying to minimize the pain in my stomach. Then I looked up and saw Carpenter. Our eyes locked and he spat at me. I wasn't scared. I was just depressed that this should be happening to me. So much so that I couldn't even be bothered to wipe the mucus from my face. I just lay there, not really caring. How had Carpenter even known I was here? Fuck it. Who cared? I'd been dropped by two very pissed-off people, and I didn't know if I was ever going to leave the room alive. They pulled me up by my armpits, one man on each side, and propped me up on the end of the bed. Pushing my hands into my armpits, I tried to bend forwards and get my head down onto my thighs to protect myself, to be the damaged grey man that was no threat to anybody. It wasn't going to happen. I took a blow on the right side of my face, which took me straight down onto the bed. I didn't need to pretend. It had done me some damage. Expecting more, I curled up on my side. Starbursts did their best to black me out as pain scorched through my body. I could feel myself starting to lose it, and I really couldn't let that happen. I worked hard to keep my eyes open. I was a bag of shit, but I knew that I had to pull myself together, or I'd be dead. The two of them were still talking, arguing, I couldn't tell which, in the background somewhere. I just lay there, taking short, sharp breaths, keeping my eyes open and coughing blood onto the furry blanket. My jaw joint was grinding on itself. I probed with my tongue and discovered one of my side teeth moving as a numb, swollen feeling developed on the right side of my face. I felt as if I'd just had a session with a psychopathic dentist. With my head on the bed, I was level and in a direct line with the coffee table. My fuzzy vision locked onto the large glass ashtray. I switched my attention to Carpenter and the old guy. They didn't even stop their waffle as a couple of people passed our door, heading towards the end of the corridor. The older guy had a pistol in his hand. Carpenter had his weapon in a shoulder holster, which I could see as he put his hands on his hips and pulled back on his unzipped jacket. They were both pointing at me. Carpenter seemed to be explaining who I was, or at least what I had done. I could also see now what the older guy had hit me with. His hands could have done the job just as well, judging by the size of them, but he'd opted for a leather strop that looked like a big dildo and which was probably filled with bull bearings. The two of them were a couple of metres to one side of me, and the ashtray was one metre to the other. Both men were still more interested in their argument than in me, but would no doubt come to a decision very soon as to how to kill me, probably slowly if Carpenter had anything to do with it. I had to act but I also knew that first I had to take a few seconds to sort myself out. I was still phased. I'd have to break my actions down into stages in my head, or I was going to fuck up and get killed. I squinted at the heavy lump of glass on the table that might save my life, and, taking a deep breath, I sprang off the bed. Keeping my head down, I charged at the two black shapes in front of me. All I needed was to get them off balance, to give me just a few seconds. Holding out my arms, I bulldozed into the two lots of black leather, and, not waiting to see what happened to them, I swung my head round and looked for the ashtray. A wheezy gasp came from behind me as they made contact with the wall. Eyes still fixed on the glass shape on the table, my body pivoted as my legs started to move towards it. Muffled shouts came from behind. That didn't matter. The ashtray did. If they were fast enough to recover, or I was too slow to react, I would never know about it. Slapping down my palm as if swatting a fly, I gripped the ashtray. My body was still facing the table with the two guys behind me. Swinging my head round, I focused on the old guy's now hatless head. 
My body turned as I took the three paces towards him, brandishing the fistful of glass in the air like a knife. I closed in, ignoring Carpenter as he came towards me from the right. The one I wanted was the old guy, the one with the pistol in his hand. His face didn't register surprise or fear, just anger, as he pushed himself off the wall and raised his weapon. My eyes were fixed on his face as I swung the ashtray downwards, making contact above his cheekbone. His skin folded over just below his eye, then split open. He fell with a scream, his body banging against my legs on the way down. Stage three was complete. I heard rather than saw the black shape from the right almost on top of me. I didn't have a stage four. It was open house now. Not even bothering to turn and look at Carpenter, I just lashed out wildly. The thick glass hammered against his skull twice on his way down, both times with such force that my arm jarred to a halt as I made contact. I jumped onto his chest and continued to rain blows onto the top of his head. Somewhere in the back of my mind I knew I'd lost it, but I didn't care. I was just remembering the way this fucker had kept firing rounds into the woman in the lift, and the bastards who'd ruined Kelly's life by hosing down her family in Washington. Three times there was a crunching, cracking sound as his skull gave way. I raised my hand, ready to hit again, but stopped myself. I'd done enough. Thick, almost brown blood oozed from his head wounds. He had lost function in his eyes and had a vacant stare, wide open and dull, pupils fully dilated. The blood spread onto the carpet, which soaked it up like blotting paper. Still sitting astride him, I rested both hands on his chest, not enjoying the fact that I'd lost control. To survive, you sometimes have to get really revved up, but losing it completely, I didn't like that. I turned to check the old guy. The strop and the handgun were on the floor, and so was he, curled up holding his hat against his face like a dressing and moaning to himself, his legs flailed weakly on the carpet. Slowly hauling myself to my feet, I kicked away both weapons. The gun looked like a .38 special revolver, the short-barreled sort used by 1930s American gangsters. Pulling his jacket off his shoulders and midway down his arms, I dragged him over the top of Carpenter and into the bathroom leaving his blood-stained fur hat behind. It was obvious now why he always wore it. Only a few wisps of hair covered his head. He was still moaning and probably feeling quite sorry for himself. But he was alive, and that meant he was a threat. My jaw was aching as I jolted up and down with the effort of dragging him, but at least my heart rate was starting to calm. There was no other option. He had to die. I wasn't happy about it, but I couldn't leave him here alive when I set off for the Meliskia compound tomorrow. He could compromise everything I was here for. I let go of him and he slumped onto the tiled bathroom floor. I turned on the hot water and the geezer surged into action. The extent of the injury to his face was now clear to me. A two-centimetre furrow was gouged in his cheek, wide enough to put a couple of fingers in. Beneath the mess of torn flesh gleamed an area of exposed white cheekbone. A check of his wallet as he lay and groaned to himself revealed all the normal stuff. Only the money was of interest, both Russian and Estonian. Once that was tucked into my jeans, I went back into the bedroom. Stepping back over Carpenter, I picked up the .38 special from the floor and one of the furry blankets. I pulled back the hammer so the weapon was cocked. When I came to squeeze the trigger, I didn't want the hammer moving all the way back before coming forward to fire the round. It might get caught in the blanket. I walked back into the bathroom, and not even looking at his face in case his eyes were on me, I unceremoniously jammed the muzzle into the blanket and onto his head, quickly wrapped the furry nylon around the weapon, and fired. There was a dull thud, and then a crack as the round exited his head and shattered the tile beneath it. I let the blanket fall and cover his face, and listened. There was no apparent reaction to the round from outside the room. This was the sort of place where you didn't ask too many questions, even if there was a gang fuck going on next door. The only things my senses picked up were the noise of the geezer and the smell of burned nylon. I turned the water off and the geezer died as I moved into the bedroom. I dug out Carpenter's wallet and tucked his money into my jeans too. 
His weapon was still in its shoulder holster, but only just. I realized how lucky I had been. Another fraction of a second, and it could have been a totally different story. The pistol was a Makarov, a Russian copy of James Bond's Walter PPK, and only good as a close-up personal protection weapon, perfect for when someone got the hump with you in a comfort bar. At longer range, it would be more lethal to throw the thing at them. No wonder its nickname in certain quarters was the Disco Gun. I decided to keep this one. The pistol grip on these Russian versions was bulky, making it awkward to get a firm hold first time when drawing down with small hands like mine, but it was more use than the point thirty-eight Special. Carpenter's blood was thickening on the carpet, which couldn't absorb the amount leaking out of him. Pulling another blanket off the bed, I trod it down around his head to try and stop it seeping through the floorboards. I ended up grabbing his head and wrapping it in the blanket. I opened the main door into the corridor, checked left and right, then had a look at the intact telltale. Why had it failed me? Why was it still in place? I could see the answer at once. It was stuck to the door frame. The sponge strip draft excluder must have been put there soon after the stuff was invented. It was now brown and gooey with age. Lesson learned: don't mix telltales with old draft excluders. Switching the fire back on, I rolled up my sleeves and got to work. Chapter thirty-eight. I used the toilet plunger handle again to prevent burning my hands. Wedging it into a mine cap and fishing it out, then turning it upside down to drain. I carried it like that into the bedroom, treading on the old man's hat on the way. The blood hadn't soaked in as much as it had into the carpet or blanket, which probably meant the fur was real and was resisting penetration. Laying the mine on the coffee table, I crossed the room to open the window, letting in the cold sea air big time. Waves were breaking on the other side of the road. The explosive, which had been more or less rigid plastic, was now soft enough to extract and manipulate. I began to scoop, having first put a carrier bag over each hand to prevent the nitro from entering my bloodstream via cuts on my hands or straightforward absorption. It wouldn't kill. Hospitals use nitroglycerin on heart attack victims, but it would give me a massive fuck-off headache. By the time I'd finished, the room stank of marzipan, and in front of me on the table was ten pounds of what looked like green, lumpy plasticine. It had hardened a little as it cooled, but I knew that once I played with it in my hands a bit, it would become quite pliable again. The remaining two pounds or so of PE were stubbornly sticking to the sides of the mine and were too difficult to get out, so I just left it. With the bags rustling on my hands, I worked away at it as if kneading dough, trying to keep my head turned so the fumes didn't get to me so quickly. Even so, it made me feel dizzy and nauseous, though that might also have something to do with the way Carpenter and the old guy had greeted me at the door. Once I'd got it all nice and malleable in three equal-sized balls, I pulled off the rubber part of the plunger and used the handle as a rolling pin to flatten them out. The smell of marzipan reminded me of being a kid at Christmas, binning the icing sugar and going straight for the yellow stuff underneath. As I played mum, the room adjacent to my bedroom was about to become a love nest. There was the rattle of a key. The door opened and closed, and then I heard voices. But this wasn't fun sex talk. This was heavy, serious stuff. I kept rolling as the hooker ran through her repertoire of moans and sighs, though not giggly ones like before. This sounded more like grand opera. The sounds of male grunting and rhythmic humping started almost straight away. Poor girl, she probably hadn't even had time to put down her bag of chips. When the dough was about a quarter of an inch thick and the diameter of a medium takeaway pizza, I used the ice scraper to cut strips about two inches wide. Getting six per base. That done, I stepped over the head in the blood-soaked blanket, went into the bathroom, and pulled the plug to refill the bath with more hot water. The old man's eyes were fixed open in an astonished stare. 
I ignored him as I turned on the tap and tested the water, as if for a baby's bath. Wishing I could stay in here because the geezer noise drowned out the duet next door, but there were five more mines to be dealt with. Leaving the bar still running, I went back to the bedroom with another piece of dripping Soviet war machinery hanging off the plunger. It was now so cold in the room that my nose was beginning to drip. Wiping it carefully on my jacket sleeve to make sure I got none of the marzipan on my exposed skin, I sat back down with more PE in a can. And set about digging out the contents. Plastic explosive is nothing more than a substance which, when detonated, undergoes almost instantaneous decomposition. Until that moment, most forms of the compound are harmless and waterproof. You can even burn some types of PE, and it won't explode. It'll just help you make a brew very quickly. When detonated, however, it delivers a shattering blow known as brisance. And that is why it can be used to cut through materials as strong as steel. I still had another four mines to empty and was gagging for that brew, but I didn't think they did room service here. Not the kind I wanted anyway. I just got on with it, gouging out the PE, rolling and cutting two-inch-wide strips, serenaded by the bear next door, who sounded as though he was heading for his final grunt. I hoped he might follow it with a spell of hibernation. An hour or so later. With all of the PE now in strips, I opened the knife blade of the leather man and rested it over the hot bar of the fire. I then laid the first piece of foam on the bed, face down. Carpenter was pissing me off as I had to keep stepping over him, so I pulled at his feet, his head making a dull thud as it hit the thin carpet as it moved out of the blanket, and dragged him closer to the door. Once there, I rearranged the sodden blanket once more around his head and wiped my hands on his black crew neck. Using the towel as an oven glove, I lifted the hot leather man from the fire and quickly sliced off all the little lumps, bumps, and molded corners from the upper side of the foam. What I was left with was a meter square, one side naturally flat, the other cut more or less level. Next, I used the hot blade to mark out a two-inch-wide channel all the way around, following the line of the square and about three inches in from the edge. The smell of burning polystyrene was even more overpowering than the marzipan. Holding the blade at an angle, I started cutting an inverted V in the channel, ending up with what looked like a trench all around the foam square, with four very long bars of Toblerone lying in the bottom of it, peaks upwards. The strips of explosive would be laid along the sides of the Toblerone, and when the frame charge was complete, it would be the flat side that would ultimately be placed against the target. You can't drop a bridge by just dangling big sticks of dynamite against it. To cut through whatever you're trying to destroy—concrete, brick, or steel—with the least amount of PE and the maximum effect, you have to channel the brisance by using the Munro effect. Because of the 30-degree angle made by the peak of the Toblerone facing the target, the majority of the detonation force would surge towards the imaginary chocolate bar's base and beyond. Had the Toblerone been made of copper, the brisance would be able to penetrate many inches of steel, because the detonation would melt the copper and take most of the molten flow forward with it, cutting through the target. I didn't have any copper, just styrofoam. But there was enough force in the PE alone to do the job required of it. My nitro headache was really pounding now. I downed another four aspirin. Only four more left. As I went back to my cutting, the sound of an argument between two men filtered through from the corridor. They were soon joined by a woman who seemed to be charming them down. The door opposite mine opened and closed, and there was silence. I waited for the customary sound effects to start in the room opposite, but all I got was more argument. The woman now chipping in her two eeks worth. When I'd finished cutting the Toblerone shape all the way round the polystyrene, the base of the triangle was just over an inch and a half from the base of the foam. This was the standoff, which would give the Munro effect space to gather enough force to cut through the target's brickwork. Now all I had to do was lay the explosive along each side of the Toblerone and over its peak, making sure the strips were molded together seamlessly to make one big charge. 
Protecting my hands with the plastic bags once more, I started placing, pressing, and pinching, as if shaping and joining pastry. The three-way argument was still going on opposite. I didn't mind. It was nice to have neighbours who were talking instead of grunting and throwing the bed around. Once the Toblerone was covered by two layers of PE, I got some debt cord and cut off two lengths, one about three feet long, the other about five. Putting two knots into one end of each length, I pressed these into the PE that lay over the Toblerone, on two opposite sides of the square. To keep the knots in place, two offcuts of PE were pressed down on top so the knots were well and truly moulded into the charge. The reason for having two sites for the debt cord was that I needed the detonation to come from two directions simultaneously so the charge was more efficient. To make sure that happened, I tightly taped together, over a distance of about six inches, the two different lengths of debt cord so that, from the binding to the charge, they were both of equal length. Trailing from the side of the binding was the two-foot surplus from the longer piece. That bit was called the debt tail. As the shockwave travelled along the debt tail and reached the binding, it would also detonate the second, shorter length of debt cord. The two shock waves would then travel down towards the charge at the same speed and distance, therefore reaching the Toblerones on two opposing sides simultaneously. The Munro effect would direct the force of the detonation towards the base of the Toblerone, gathering energy as it travelled the inch and a bit through the foam before impacting the target. All being well, I should be left with a gaping hole about a metre square in the wall of the target house. I was still in the process of taping over the Toblerone to keep it in the foam when two male voices, drunk and laughing, came up the stairs and past my door, going into the room on the other side of the bathroom. I still had another charge to make, so I put the knife back on the fire as my two new neighbours laughed, joked and turned the TV on loudly. At least it drowned out the three still entertaining themselves opposite. It took me thirty minutes to complete the second charge, done to the accompaniment of an American comedy, dubbed, of course. I preferred the jokes in Russian. To make them easier to carry, I sandwiched both sets of charges together so the Toblerone peaks were facing each other, storing the attached debt cord in between. I wrapped one of the tow ropes around to keep it all together, then slid two of the pallet sections, taken from behind the shops, under the rope. I'd also secured the reel of unused debt cord to the pack by running the rope through its centre while wrapping it round. Everything I'd be needing on target was now together, and the whole thing looked like a badly packed Boy Scouts rucksack. There were one or two other little jobs to do before I could get out of here. Gathering together the remaining blue nylon tow ropes, I tied them together until there was one rope about 30 metres long adding extra knots so that there was one every metre. One end was then tied onto the rope, which had been wrapped around the charges. Next I picked up the third length of pallet wood. It was MI9 time again, as I cut a groove all around one end, about three inches in from the top, around which I secured the free end of the rope attached to the charges. Holding the brick against the unroped end of the wood, so that its longest edge was parallel to the planks, I wrapped the towel around both and secured it with yards of insulating tape. All the equipment was now prepared. The Lion King told me it was 3.28, in theory too early to leave, but I didn't know who else knew that Carpenter and the old man had come to visit. The threesome started arguing yet again, this time probably about payment, as I took the charges draped in a blanket down to the car. Chapter 39 Saturday, the 18th of December, 1999 In the pitch dark of the afternoon, I drove west towards Tallinn on the main drag, turned left to Pussy, and headed once again over the railway track and towards the target, passing the sad shacks where people were holed up for the winter. In the twelve hours since leaving the hotel, I'd been cruising around, stopping only a couple of times to fill up with petrol, 
anything to keep the heater going. On my way out, I'd paid the old woman for another two nights, so with any luck, there should be no need for her to come and check the room. Tented stalls were dotted along the roads like miniature service stations. The steam that poured from their vents, making them look like refugee camp field kitchens. When I stopped to buy coffee and pastries, it actually helped to have a swollen mouth with visible bruising, because I could get away with just mumbling and pointing. The problem came when I tried to eat and drink. My tooth was killing me, and these places didn't sell Nurofen. My last four aspirins had gone hours ago. I'd kept Carpenter's weapon on me. And the point thirty eight special was in the glove compartment. Neither of them had spare rounds. Now sliding slowly along the single track road, my headlights picked up the concrete wall of the target on my left. Nothing appeared to have changed. There were still no lights or movement, and the gates were still closed. Parking in the same driveway as before, I turned off the engine and sat for a while in the rapidly cooling car. Running through the plan one last time, it didn't take long, because there wasn't really much of a plan. Forcing myself out into the cold, now wearing the old guy's gloves and blood-stained fur hat, I covered the driver's side of the windscreen with newspaper before taking the charges out of the boot. The tow rope wrapped around them made a handy shoulder strap. Finally, I hid the key under the rear right wheel. If I got caught by the militia, then at least they wouldn't have my keys if I managed to escape. What was more, I could tell Tom if I linked up with him, and he would also have a means of escape if I didn't make it to the car. I wasn't going to kill him. I owed him that much after what he'd done by the fence at the Finns' house. What was more, I didn't want his death on my conscience as well as Kelly's illness. At first, I'd put my change of heart down to the fact that I wasn't thinking of saving Tom's skin as much as my own. He would be the only one who could back up my story to Lynn if this whole thing went completely to ratchet. And why shouldn't it? Everything else had so far. But then, much as I hated the idea, I had to admit to myself that I'd come to like the chubby cheek fucker. He might not be the sort of bloke I was used to associating with. And we certainly wouldn't be seeing each other for coffee mornings, but he was all right, and he needed a break as much as I did. I'd been toying with the idea since I lay in my cheap hotel room in Helsinki. That was why I'd brought his passport with me, just in case I decided. It was as cold as ever, but as I walked along the road, I tied up my new fur hat ear flap so I could listen, drawing level with the hangar and its funnel. I still couldn't hear any noise from inside the compound. I reached the driveway leading to the large steel plate gates, turned and took a few paces towards them. Then I stopped and listened. Now that I knew it was there, I could just make out the generator churning away in the distance. Apart from that, I could hear nothing. I tested the gates, but they weren't open. I tried the small door set into the larger right-hand one, but again they were still locked. I wasn't expecting it to be that easy, but I'd have felt a real dickhead if I'd gone to all the trouble of climbing over the wall when all I had to do was stroll in through the front gate. Lying down in the right-hand tire rut with the charges behind me, I pressed my eye to the gap beneath. Nothing that side of the gate had changed. There were still two lights on the ground floor, and the larger building to the right was just as dark. I wasn't sure if what I was looking at was good or bad. Not that it mattered that much. I was still going to get amongst it and destroy the place, and hopefully find Tom. Once on my feet again, with the Boy Scout rucksack re-shouldered, I started back in the direction of the car. But about seventy or eighty meters past the hangar, I stepped left off the road and into the high snow. My aim was to walk out into the fields, turn left, and approach the hangar from the rear. I couldn't prevent leaving a trail in the snow, but at least I could try to keep most of it out of sight of the road. The snow had a thin layer of ice on top and varied in depth from calf to thigh height. As I pressed my foot down on the not so deep stuff, there was initial resistance. Then my weight pushed through it. In the deeper drifts, I felt like an icebreaker in the Baltic. 
I laboured on, my jeans soaking and my legs starting to freeze. At least there wasn't much cloud and my night vision was adjusting to the starlight. The rear of the hangar loomed in front of me and I climbed inside. The floor was concrete and the steel structure supported what looked like corrugated asbestos. Moving slowly and carefully towards the wall of the compound, after about twenty paces, I began to make out the dark shape of the doorway. When I reached the edge of the hangar, I stood still and listened. Not a sound, just the gentle moan of the wind. Wading across the five or six metres of snow between the two buildings, I realised as soon as I reached the door that I was going to be disappointed. The metal was a lot older than the front gates and was flaking with rust. The door itself was solid, with no hinges or locks this side of it. I pushed, but there wasn't a hint of movement. Turning right, I followed the wall and waded fifteen metres further away from the road. Hopefully, I was now facing the gable end of the larger building on the other side of the concrete. Placing the charges on the snow, I unravelled the rope attached to the plank with the brick at the end. With just two or three feet of slack, I started swinging it around me like a hammer thrower, finally letting go with upwards momentum to make the plank clear the wall. I'd never make the Highland Games. The whole lot fell back down in front of me. I was just sorting out the rope for another try when vehicle lights raked the wall of the compound. I dropped to my knees, ready to bury myself in the snow. Then I realised that on my knees I was buried in it. The lights got stronger, disappearing for half a second as the vehicle dipped in the road, only to light up the sky before settling down again. As it got closer, the inside of the hangar was lit up and moving shadows were cast by the steel supports. The ponderous chug of a big diesel told me that a tractor was heading in my direction. I felt good about that. If the Meliskia were coming for me, I doubted they'd be riding a Massey Ferguson. The noise got louder and the light even stronger until the tractor burst into view in the gap between the compound wall and the hangar. It looked like some old relic from a Soviet collective, with far more silhouettes in the cab than the thing was designed for. Maybe the local pub quiz team was heading down to the Hammer and Sickle for a few pints of vodka. The lights and noise gradually faded and I got on with my task. It took me two more tries, but I eventually got the plank to sail over the wall, the charge end firmly anchored in my hands. The rope jerked as the plank finished its flight, probably ending up dangling about three or four feet over the target side. Gently I started pulling it back, waiting for the bit of resistance that would tell me that the point where the rope was wrapped around the plank had connected with the far top edge of the wall. The way this thing worked was that the counterweight of the brick made the top of the plank anchor itself against an angled wall. It's one of the reasons why prisons have a large oval shape made of smooth metal on top of their walls, so that contraptions like this don't have anything to bite into. MI9 had done it again. Maintaining the tension in the rope and half expecting the plank to come plummeting back down onto my head at any second, I slowly let it take my whole body weight. The cheap nylon rope stretched and protested but held secure. With my feet against the wall and using the pitted sections as toe-holds and knots I'd placed along the rope, I started to climb. It didn't take long to reach the top, and I scrambled up and rested along its three-foot width. The large building blocked most of my view of the target beyond. All I could see was the light from the windows where it hit the snow. The generator now provided a constant rumble in the foreground. Snow and ice cascaded from the wall as I swiveled round on my stomach, turning to face the way I'd come. With my legs now dangling down the target side, I began to pull the charges carefully up the wall. It wasn't the noise I was worried about. I didn't want to damage them. When I'd finally got the charges up on top with me, I swiveled round again and lowered them gently down the target side. It was now simply a question of moving the plank to the other edge in order to reverse the climbing process. Keeping the tension in the rope, I slowly lowered myself over, twisting my right foot round the rope as my hips got to the edge of the wall. Then I let the rope take my weight and climbed down as quickly as I could. 
I piled snow on top of the charges so the weight of the plank didn't pull it down the other side, taking everything with it. It was important to keep the rope in place while I went off and did a quick recce. For now, it was my only escape route. The hum of the generator was louder at ground level, more than enough to drown the crunch of my feet on virgin snow and ice as I moved towards the rusty side door. I took the torch from my pocket and switched it on. Just a tiny pinprick of light emerged. I taped over most of the reflector, leaving just a small hole. There was work to be done on the door. It's all well and good getting onto a target, but it's just as important getting away. If I didn't have a better escape route organised than just climbing up a rope, I'd be in deep shit if I was compromised. Working with the torch in my mouth, I could see that the door was secured by a large bolt, maybe two feet long, set in the middle, covered in rust and looking as if it hadn't been open for years. I began to work on the lever with both hands, gently lifting it up and down as I pulled it back and forth, making a little progress with each movement until the thing finally gave. Pulling the door towards me about three or four inches to confirm that it would open, I then pushed it back into position. Job done. I stopped and listened. No noise but the generator. There was no point in risking the rope being spotted now that I had an alternative escape route, so I untied it and let it go. Shouldering the charges, I crunched along the front of the larger building, trying to keep as close to it as possible to minimise sign. Now I could see that it was built of chalk-coloured bricks that were way past their prime. If the target house was built of the same stuff, it wasn't going to be difficult to make entry. The generator noise increased as I reached the large opening. A mass of tyre tracks led in the same direction. Going inside, I moved off to the right so I wasn't silhouetted in the entrance, and stood still in the darkness, listening to the jenny noise to my far left. It felt warmer in here, but I knew it wasn't really, it was just more sheltered. Taking the torch out of my pocket, I pulled off the tape, but kept two fingers over the lens to control its brightness. A quick shine around the cavernous interior revealed three vehicles, a Mercedes box van with its nose pointing out, and two saloons haphazardly parked at different angles pointing in. The floor was concrete, covered in several years' supply of frozen mud, lumps of wood, and old crates. The torchlight was too weak to reach the generator itself, but thirty paces took me right up to it. The machinery was standing on a new section of concrete floor, about two feet above ground level, to keep it well out of the shit. Beyond it was the fuel tank, a large, heavy plastic cylinder supported on breeze blocks. Seeing it gave me an idea for later on. Jutting from the front of the generator was a power cable a good three inches thick. It ran through the gable wall, where three or four bricks had been knocked out to accommodate it, and towards the target house. I dumped my kit at the back of the generator, turned off the torch, and went back to the large opening and out into the compound. End of Side 21《Side 22 》Following the many footprints that had been made between this building and the target about 15 metres away, I made my way towards the main door. Directly ahead I saw the triangle of darkness that stretched from directly below the ground floor window sill to about a metre out into the snow, where the light hit the ground. I checked my weapon was properly placed in my jacket pocket so that, if needed, I could bite off my glove and draw down with ease. Checking before passing the two-metre gap between the two buildings to my right, I could see where the generator cable came out of the barn wall and went into the targets. I also saw plenty of footprints from the track I was on, branching off between the two buildings and towards the rear of the target. People must be in and out of here all the time. Bending down, I edged my way under the first window as close as possible to the wall. The glass above me was protected by steel bars. The television was on. The voices were English, and it didn't take me long to work out the channel was MTV. This got weirder by the minute. With my back to the wall, I looked and listened. The light above me was shining through yellow floral curtains, 
though the material was too thick to see through. I couldn't hear any talking, just Ricky Martin singing. Putting my ear to the wall, I listened again. I didn't have to try hard. Bursting in with the chorus was a heavy Eastern European accent, trying to give Ricky a hand. Chapter 40 The target building seemed to consist of a concrete frame infilled with red clay brickwork with air holes and serrated sides. Whoever had put it together had never heard of a plumb line, and too many bad winters had taken their toll on the bricks. They looked as crumbly as the one I'd tied to the plank. With Ricky Martin reaching the end of his song, I moved up the two concrete steps to the main door. It was the same arrangement as the bar in Narva, except the other way around, with a steel grill on the outside and the wooden door set back about six inches further into the frame. I needed to find out if it was locked. It wasn't my chosen point of entry, but if the charges didn't work and the door happened to be open, at least I'd have options. More to the point, if I fucked up inside, I had an extra escape route. The grill wasn't locked. I moved it gently backwards an inch and it made no noise, so I pulled it towards me a couple of inches, returned it an inch and pulled another two, controlling the quiet squeaks as it gradually opened. Eventually the grill was open enough to squeeze my arm past and try the door. There were no sounds apart from MTV and the generator as I pushed the door handle down gently and gave a small push. It was locked. I stood and listened hoping to hear Tom's voice. Something was being fried and the smell was wafting under the door. From upstairs came a shout, muffled by the sound of the TV, but it wasn't Tom's voice. Then I realised the shouting wasn't shouting. It was meant to be singing. My friend, the Ricky Martin impressionist, was on his way back downstairs. Moving out of the doorway, I pulled my glove off with my teeth and gripped my weapon. If he came out, I'd be stepping over his dead body and going straight in with so much speed, aggression and surprise that I'd scare even myself. His voice got louder as he reached the ground floor. A chorus of other voices bellowed from the rear of the building, maybe in Russian, but definitely telling him to shut the fuck up. He had reached the hallway and was only feet from the door, shouting back along with at least two other voices from the TV room. It was banter, nothing more. The singer went back into the room and the MTV show died down to a slightly quieter level as the door was closed. I moved back to the front door and listened. Nothing now but the sound of more music being played. Replacing my weapon, I slowly closed the grill the same way as I'd opened it. Moving back down the steps, I followed the tracks towards the far end of the target, ducking under the left-hand window and into its dark triangle. Even with my ear to the wet, cold wall, I could hear no sound from inside. The windows were steamed up behind the steel bars. Maybe this was the kitchen. I reached the corner of the building and cleared it. There were no windows this side, but plenty of footprints in the snow leading to the rear. What could easily be seen, however, even in this light, was a large satellite dish, slightly jutting out to the left of the building and pointing upwards at about 45 degrees. I felt as if I was having a Microsoft HQ flashback and hoped the NSA didn't arrive to complete the story. At the same time, I was pleased I'd seen it. The dish was my only confirmation that this really was the target. I counted the paces as I moved towards it in preparation for laying the charges. Seventeen one-yard steps took me to the rear of the building. I cleared the corner and the generator gained a decibel or two. Light was shining through curtains from both of the upstairs windows, just enough to cast a dim glow over the satellite dish's two mates. All three were about the same size as those at Microsoft HQ, but made of solid plastic, not mesh. They pointed skywards in different directions. They weren't static, dug-in dishes, but on stands, with ice-covered sandbags over the legs to keep them in position. Like the Finnish ones, they too were clear of snow and ice, and the whole area around them was trampled down. Beyond them, maybe forty metres away, 
was the dark shape of the rear compound wall. I turned the corner and realized that hidden in the shadow of the top window's dark triangles were two more windows on the ground floor without light. All four mirrored the ones on the front of the target. To get under the first window took five paces, making it twenty-two in total so far. I crouched by three thick snow-covered satellite feeds which came out of the snow and disappeared into a hole in the brickwork directly beneath the first ground floor window. The gap around the cabling was roughly refilled with concrete. The downstairs windows on this side were also barred. I could now see chinks of light around the edges of the frame I was crouching beneath. Lifting my eyes to the sill for a closer look, I saw that the glass was boarded over from the inside. I heard a humming noise coming from the other side of the boards, high-pitched and electrical, unlike the throbbing diesel further along in the other building. No human voices, but I knew they were there somewhere. I never thought I'd find myself longing to hear Tom asking for a cup of herbal tea. My body's a temple, know what I mean, Nick? But it didn't happen. Stepping over the cables, it took me another nine slow and careful paces to the next window to add to the twenty-two. I'd soon know how much debt cord I'd need to take off the reel. This window was also boarded up, but there was a little more light spilling out. Two sheets of quarter-inch ply, which should have been flush against the glass, were not, leaving a half-inch gap on the right-hand side. Doing a Houdini, I adjusted my head to try and get a good viewing angle, pressing it right up against the iron bars, the hat working as a perfect insulator for my head. I got a glimpse of very bright lighting, under which I could see a bank of about five or six grey plastic PC monitors facing away from me their rear vents black with burned dust. Judging from what I could see, this rear half of the building was one big room. As I adjusted my head in another attempt to see more, everything inside went dark. A body blocked my view. I watched as he leaned forward on his arms, his head moving from side to side as he studied the different screens in front of him, no more than two feet away from me. He must have been about mid-thirties, with short, dark blonde hair on top of a very square head, and he was wearing a patterned crew-neck jumper that any train spotter's mother would have been proud of. He started to smile, then nodded to himself as he turned towards the gap. He was no more than a foot away now as he answered a quick, aggressive Russian voice behind him. He looked down at something, and whatever it was, he was happy about it. Maybe Tom had come up with the goods for them, and they had echelon. If so, it wouldn't be for long. He picked up a sheet of printed A4 and waved it at whoever was behind him. Then he moved out of my line of vision, back into the room. It was probably the Christmas lunch menu from the Space and Naval Warfare Systems Command in San Diego. They seemed to know everything else that was happening there. At least I knew where the kit that had to be destroyed was. All I needed to find now was Tom. I waited for further movement for another fifteen minutes with my eye to the gap, but nothing happened. I was getting very cold and my toes were numb. Lion King told me it was only 5.49. It was going to get a whole lot colder yet. I moved to the next corner of the target towards the generator. It was another five paces, which made thirty-six in total. I was happy. There was more than enough debt cord. I turned right and walked down the small gap between the two buildings, stepping over the generator cable lying in the snow, just as with the satellite cables, a hole had been punched through the target's brickwork and the gap refilled with handfuls of concrete. I made my way back to the generator building and started to prepare the kit. The first thing I checked was that I still had the batteries in my inside pocket. In Dems, it's the ultimate sin to lose control of the initiation device on a par with leaving your weapon more than an arm's length away from you. I'd been keeping them close to my body to stop them getting sluggish in the cold. They needed to work first time. I didn't need light for unrolling the deck cord because I knew what I was doing, but the generator noise would drown out any human movement coming into the building, so I had to keep my eyes on the entrance while I was working. Placing the reel between my feet, 
I held the loose end in my right hand and stretched out my arm, pushing the debt cord into my armpit with my left. I did that thirty-six times, plus an extra five to cover what I needed to do on the wall this side of the target. I added two more for luck, cutting it with my blackened leather man. I then laid it on the floor next to the charges. This was now called the main line and would be used to send a shock wave to all the charges at once via their debt tails. The next thing I had to sort out was the little brainwave I'd had for the fuel tank. What I had in mind was the most spectacular explosion this side of Hollywood. When the fuel tank blew, it wouldn't be the most productive bang in the world, but the effect would be phenomenal. I climbed the ladder of the tank with the debt cord in my hand, slowly unfeeding it from the reel. When I lifted the flap on the tank, the torch beam hit on the surface of shiny liquid that filled about three quarters of the cylinder. After tying a double knot on the end of the cord, I pulled the petrol station carrier bag from my jacket. In it was the spare four-pound ball of P.E. that any Dems man worth his salt always carries to plug up any holes or damage to a charge. The smell wasn't too bad out in the open as I ripped off about half and played with it to warm it up. Once it was pliable enough, I squashed it around the double knot, ensuring it had worked its way into the gaps of the ties, and finally I taped the whole thing up to keep the P.E. in place. I lowered the ball of P.E. into the tank by its string of debt cord, stopping when it was dangling about two or three inches from the surface of the fuel. It only takes a split second for fuel to vaporise after an explosion, but when that detonates, the effect is Vesuvian. If I fucked up this job, it would certainly give the appearance that I'd given it my best shot. How could Val doubt my word when the fireball would probably be big enough for him to see it in Moscow? I taped the debt cord onto the side of the fuel tank, then climbed back down the ladder, carefully unreeling the rest of the cord as I moved towards the hole in the wall. I wanted to cut a long enough length so that, once laid out, it would reach the target house. Nine extra arm's lengths seemed to put me on the safe side. I made the cut and started to push the end of the debt cord through the hole in the wall. Just then, torchlight came bouncing down the gap from the front of the buildings. I couldn't hear anything above the generator. I quickly pulled the debt cord back in and froze. The only things moving were my eyes. They flicked from the hole to the entrance, waiting for any movement from either direction. A shiny wet pair of wellies and a pair of normal outdoor boots were illuminated by the beam of light as it searched for the generator cable. What worried me was the AK welly man had hanging down by his side, its large foresight at the end of the barrel level with his knees. Once over it, they carried on towards the rear and moved out of sight. There wasn't any talking, or if there was, I couldn't hear it above the generator. I didn't even hear their feet in the snow. They must have been doing something with the dishes. I waited. There was nothing else I could do. No way was I going out there again until I knew they were safely tucked up back in the house. I lay on the frozen mud and waited for their return, my eyes still moving between the gaps in the brickwork. The cold soon penetrated my clothing, numbing my skin. The six or seven minutes it took before I saw the torchlight flickering about on the snow again didn't pass quickly enough. Craning my neck to get a better view, I watched their silhouettes fade as they reached the corner of the building. I waited a few more frozen minutes in case they'd forgotten something or realised they'd fucked up and had to come back to redo it. While I waited, I had another brainwave. When I eventually got to my feet, I went across to the vehicles and let down their tyres. The fireball ought to sort out the vehicles and guarantee they couldn't be used in a follow-up, but it didn't hurt to play safe. I grinned stupidly to myself as the air hissed out and the tire rims settled on the frozen mud. Watching the hole in the wall for torchlight, I was eight years old again, crouching by my stepfather's car. Moving back to the kit, I pushed the deck cord through the hole in the wall once more, then cut several eight-inch strips of gaffer tape from the roll and stuck them around both forearms. Finally, I shouldered the pack of charges, gripped the coiled-up main line in my left hand, and moved back out into the cold. Chapter 41 I headed for the gap between the two buildings. 
Ahead of me, the dim light from the house still spilt onto the snow. I cleared the gap and moved towards the rear. Stepping over the jenny cable, I checked the deck cord was still in the hole, ready for when I came back for it later, then continued down to the corner. The elevations of the dishes had changed dramatically. I wanted to make one last check for Tom through the gap in the boards. Maybe I'd be in luck. There's a first time for everything. Angling my head, I peered through, but couldn't see any movement. Stepping over the satellite dish cables, I made my way to the far corner, then turned and counted three paces towards the front of the target. I crouched down at that point and placed the charges and reel of deck cord onto the snow. The computer room was on the other side of this wall. It was going to be gloves on, gloves off the next twenty minutes as I positioned the charges. Undoing the tow rope that kept the charges together, I placed one of the foam squares against the bricks, the base of the Toblerones facing the target, so the debt tail dangled in front of me. Then, ramming the end of one of the wooden pallet slats into the snow at an angle, I used it to keep the polystyrene square in position against the wall. When I checked the charge with the aid of the torch, I discovered a tiny break where a PE joint had come apart. This didn't mean to say the PE wouldn't initiate, since the gap was less than a sixteenth of an inch, but why take that chance? Manipulating a small lump of PE between my gloved hands until it was pliable, I broke off a piece and plugged the space. After a final check, I killed the torch and moved over to the nearest dish. I lifted one of its ice-hard sandbags and placed it halfway along the wall, using it to weigh down the free end of the main line. I then began the process of laying out its forty-three arms' lengths back towards the charge. The weight of the sandbag enabled me to pull the cord gently to ensure there weren't any kinks or twists, so the shock wave had a free run to the deck tails. Once I reached the propped-up charge, it was gloves off time again. Peeling one of the strips of tape from my forearm, I began to bind the deck tail to the main line, taping the two sections together as tightly as possible. I did it strictly by the book, binding the main line one foot down the deck tail in case some of the explosive had fallen from the exposed end. The binding was four inches to guarantee enough contact between the two for the shock wave to transfer across from the main line to the deck tail. Then, of course, it would journey on down to the charge. There was a sudden burst of loud music from an upstairs window around the back. Stopping as abruptly as it had started, I instinctively ducked, and through the rear windows I could hear various voices shouting. At least another three different voices could be heard shouting back and laughing. It brought me back to real life. The act of tactically placing charges always seems to detach you from reality. Maybe it's because there's so much concentration involved, because there are no second chances. That's why you normally make sure that whoever is doing the technical stuff can just get on with it and concentrate. It wasn't a luxury I had tonight. I nicked another sandbag from the base of the dish and placed it on top of the main line on the dish side of the deck tail. I didn't want to pull on it and disrupt the charge I'd already set up as I picked up the second charge. I began to unreel the main line over the satellite cable towards the gap between the two buildings. Someone was fucking with the volume as Aerosmith's theme song Armageddon got louder and then suddenly died above me, prompting more shouts from the computer room. Just as I reached the next corner, the heavy Eastern European voices above bellowed out yet again, and the music blared out at full volume. I knelt between the two buildings and rigged up the second charge on the other side of the target house so that it was exactly facing the first. Once it was propped and checked, I began taping its deck tail to the main line. The music hit full blast again for two seconds, then subsided. There were more shouts from downstairs. The boys in the computer room were getting ever so slightly pissed off. I reckon there was a minimum of five people in the building. I gave the charge a final check. It was looking good. Demolitions can appear to be a dark art. But actually, all you need to understand is how explosives work, and then learn the hundreds of rules for using them. I'd broken many of them today, but what the hell? I hadn't had a lot of choice.
I went over to the generator cable hole and gently pulled out the debt cord that ran into the fuel tank, taping it to the main line in the same way as I'd done with the other two. Aerosmith were still doing their best to annoy the computer room. It was a good game, and I hoped it would keep the boys occupied for a moment or two longer. I thought about Tom and hoped he wasn't standing too close to either of the walls. Gloves back on, I pulled the main line for the last few arms' lengths towards the front of the building. Now I just had to attach the electronic detonator, which was already fixed to the firing cable, then unreel the cable round the corner and get down below the MTV window before the shit and everything else in the building hit the fan. I was a bit worried about the amount of extraneous electricity flying about and its possible effect on the firing cable. Once I'd untwisted the two leads that were to go onto the battery, they'd be potential antennae, just like the debts in the Narva flat. The manuals would say I was either supposed to be one kilometre away when the shit went up, or very well protected. I didn't think hiding round the corner with a few clay bricks as cover was quite what they had in mind. The main line stopped about six or seven paces short of the corner of the target. Great. At least the firing cable would be long enough for me to be well under the window. As I gently pulled at the press studs holding the zip flap of my jacket to extract the firing cable, the volume of the music changed again. It was escaping outside. Then I heard the noise of the grill swinging open and the front door slamming shut. There was no time to think, just do. Biting off my gloves, I jammed my hand into my jacket pocket for the Makarov, right thumb taking off the safety as I moved towards the corner, taking deep breaths. I couldn't hear him, them, yet, but whichever it was, I had to take the fight to them. Three more paces until the corner. There was torchlight ahead. I stopped, pushing my thumb down on the safety catch to ensure it was off. One more second and a body appeared, heading towards me. He was looking down at where his torch beam hit the snow. It glinted off his weapon barrel. I couldn't give him time to think. I jumped onto him, wrapping my left arm around his neck and pushing the Makar off into his stomach, digging it into him hard. My legs wrapped around his waist, and as we fell together I pulled the trigger, hoping that our two bodies sandwiching the weapon would suppress its report. No chance. The job had just gone noisy. Jumping to my feet, I sprinted round to the front of the house, focusing solely on the next corner, heading for the other end of the main line, leaving a screaming Russian writhing in the snow. I racked back the weapon's top slide to eject whatever was in there and feed in another round, just in case we'd been so close that it had been prevented from sliding back correctly when I'd fired and hadn't reloaded. I had the same feeling in my stomach as I used to have as a kid, running scared, as I neared the main entrance, I scrambled frantically with my left hand for the firing cable and debt in my inside pocket. The door opened, MTV still blasting, and a body too small to be Tom emerged. The grill was already open. Gory? Gory? I raised my weapon and fired on the move. I couldn't miss. There was a scream and one round hit the grill with a high-pitched metallic ricochet. I carried straight on past. Turned the corner and made a headlong dive towards the sandbag, dropping my weapon and desperately fishing for the main line coming from under the sandbag. I didn't look up to see if anyone was coming for me. I didn't have time. The wounded man's screams echoed around the compound. I tried to calm myself and slow my frenzied movements. I held the debt onto the main line and wrapped a strip of tape around both. Not as tightly as I would have liked, but fuck it. I pulled out the battery and yanked the twisted end leads of the firing cable apart with my teeth. Then, falling to the floor, I squeezed my legs together, opened my jaw and buried my head in the snow as I pushed the two leads onto the terminals. Less than a single heartbeat later, the detonator exploded and initiated the main line. The shock wave of the explosion travelled along it, met the first debt tail and then the one leading to the fuel tank. Then the second debt tail got the good news. The two wall charges exploded virtually simultaneously, and the resultant shock waves met in the middle of the room at a combined speed of 52,000 feet per second. Chapter 42 My whole world shuddered, trembled, quaked. It was like being inside a massive bell that had just been given an almighty bang. The air was sucked from my lungs as hot air blasted over me. 
Around the compound, snow and ice shot upwards a foot or so from the ground. My ears rang. Brick dust, snow and shattered glass cascaded around me. Then the shock wave rebounded off the thick concrete perimeter walls and came back for more. Crawling forward to the corner of the target, I watched mesmerized as an enormous fireball whooshed from the entrance of the generator building and leapt high into the sky. Thick black smoke mixed with bright orange flames that burned like an oil rig flare. The entire area was bathed in light and I could feel the heat scorching my face. Chunks of brick, glass and all kinds of other stuff that had been blown sky high started clattering around me. Scrambling to my knees, I threw my arms over my head to protect myself. You're supposed to look up to prepare for the stuff coming towards you, but fuck that. I just kept close to the wall and took my chances. I wouldn't be able to see it anyway. The sandstorm of red brick dust had arrived, blanketing the compound. It was just a matter of hanging in there and waiting for the last of the fallout to rain down. I began coughing like a lifelong smoker. I cleared each nostril in turn, then tried to equalize the pressure in my ears. A sharp, stinging pain seared across my buttocks. My ass must have taken some of the shock wave as it passed over me. At least it wasn't my face or bollocks. I checked for blood, but my fingers came back just wet with water from the snow-soaked jeans. It was time to get to my feet and start moving back for my weapon, which was still in the snow somewhere. I felt around on my hands and knees, my ass in agony, as if I'd just been caned. I found the car off by the sandbag, and checking chamber with my finger to the heavy rumbling sound of burning fuel, I stumbled towards the main door. There was a secondary explosion in the generator building, probably a vehicle tank in the path of the firestorm. For the next few moments, the flames burned higher and more intensely. The guy in the gap wasn't screaming anymore, but he was still alive, coiled up and holding his stomach. I went over to where he lay trembling in the snow. I picked up his AK and threw it towards the main gate out of his reach. I certainly wouldn't be needing it myself inside the house. When the two shock waves from the opposing explosions had met, they would have wiped out everything in the computer room. The force would then have taken the line of least resistance to escape the confines of the building, the windows and doors. Surging along the hallways, it would have destroyed everything in its path. The MTV man wasn't looking good. Some bits of him were draped on the grill like strips of meat hanging in a smokehouse. The rest would have been scattered out in the snow. When humans burn, they smell like scorched pork. But when they're blown apart like this, it's as if you've walked into a butcher's shop a week after a power cut. The torchlight wasn't much good in the hallway. It just reflected off the wall of dust like a car's headlights in dense fog. I blundered around, stumbling over bricks and other debris, trying to find a gap to the right that would lead to the MTV room. I found the door, or rather the place where it had been. As I moved through, my feet collided with sticks of furniture, then what was left of the television set and a whole lot more bricks. I was still coughing shit out of my lungs, and was the only one doing so. I could hear no other movement, no sounds of distress. Tripping over a large bundle on the floor, I switched on my torch and knelt down to check it. The body was on its side and smouldering, facing away from me. Rolling him towards me, I shone the light into his dust-covered face. It wasn't Tom. Whoever this man in his early twenties had been, he wasn't any more. The skin was pulled back from his head like a partly peeled orange, and the blood he'd lost was mixing with the dust to look like wet. Red cement. I continued across the room, kicking out and feeling like a blind man as I searched for more bodies. There were two, but neither of them was Tom. I wasn't going to call out in case someone decided to reply with something other than a voice. I tried to get into the room opposite, the kitchen, but the door was jammed. Leaving it to go upstairs, I decided to check the easy places first. I didn't bother with the computer room. Even if there were any bodies there, they wouldn't be recognisable. 
In other circumstances, I might have taken a moment or two to be quietly proud. I was shit at most things, but in A-level demolitions, I'd got a distinction. I headed up the stairs, my left hand on the wall having to feel for every step as I made my way to the top. I cleared my nostrils again, gobbing the dust out of my throat as I equalized my nose again to clear the ringing in my ears. As I reached the top landing, I heard a short, faint cry. I couldn't tell where it came from. I went left first, since it was nearer. Feeling my way to the door, I pushed, but it wouldn't budge more than four or five inches. Pushing even harder, I managed to get my foot round and made contact with the body on the other side that was stopping it going further. I squeezed through and checked. It was just another poor fucker in his twenties who wanted his mother. I stumbled into a chair, moved round it and heard someone else moaning at my feet. Kneeling down, I got in there with the torch and turned the body over. It was Tom. Red brick dust over his face and head, red snot running from his nose, but alive. I thought this would be a cause to celebrate. But now I wasn't too sure. He didn't look good. He was whimpering away in a world of his own, reminding me of the glue-sniffing kid in Narva. I checked him over to make sure he had all his limbs. You're okay, mate, I said. You're all right. Come on. He wouldn't have a clue what I was saying or who was saying it, but it made me feel better. I brushed the crap from his face so at least he could open his eyes at some stage. Then I reached under his armpits and dragged him out onto the landing, stopping twice to snort muck from my nose. Still gripping him, I went down the stairs backwards. His feet bounced from step to step. He was out of it, still bound up in his own little world of pain and confusion, aware that he was being moved, but not really conscious enough to help. We got clear of the brick dust and into the fresh air. Dumping him on the ground, I cleared my nose again and gasped clean air into my lungs. Tom! Wake up, mate! Tom! Tom! I grabbed a handful of snow and rubbed it over his face. Beginning to recover, he coughed and spluttered, but still couldn't speak. The flames coming from the generator building were licking hungrily at the barn door and dancing on the snow, illuminating us quite clearly. Tom was wearing the same sweatshirt as when I last saw him, but he had no shoes or coat. Wait here, mate. Don't move, all right? As if. I headed back into the dust-filled MTV room. The cries upstairs were getting louder. I wanted to get away from here before they sorted themselves out and the police or DTTS arrived. I found the first body again, still smouldering. He hadn't been wearing a coat, but it was his footwear I was after. They weren't exactly walking boots, more like basketball trainers, but they do. Kicking and fumbling around, I also came across an AK and a coat amongst the shredded furniture. Tom was lying spread-eagled on his back, exactly as I'd left him. I shook the dust out of what turned out to be a parka and put it around him. The white trainers were about two sizes too big, but what the fuck, he only had to make it as far as the car. As I began to pull him onto his feet, he finally made a noise. He lifted a hand to wipe the shit from his face and saw me. Tom, it's Nick. I shook his head. He would have been deafened by the explosion, and I couldn't tell whether his hearing had come back yet. It's me, Nick. Get up, Tom. We have to get going. Nick! Shit! What the fuck are you doing here? What, what the fuck happened? I finished tying his laces and slapped his feet. Get up now. Come on. What? What? I helped him up and into the parker. It was like dressing an exhausted child. Tom! He still couldn't hear. Tom! Tom! Huh? He was trying to get an arm into a sleeve. I'll be back in a minute, okay? I didn't wait for a nod. Leaving him to it, I went back to retrieve my gloves. I found them just a few feet away from the first man I'd shot, who was now clearly dead. Tom had sat down again in the snow. I got him upright, zipped up his parka, then helped him move slowly to the small gate leading to the derelict hangar. We've got to get a move on, Tom. Come on, let's go. There's a car just round the corner. Turning left onto the road, I checked for vehicle lights. I lengthened my stride, keeping a tight grip on Tom, holding him as if we were a couple out for the night, arm in arm. Trying to keep upright on the ice as I urged him on, I looked behind me. 
The glow from the generator building was still visible, but the sky was no longer filled with flames. In the small amount of ambient light, I could see Tom's face. He was in a bad way. His hair was sticking up all over the place, still covered in dust and blood, and he looked like the victim of a cartoon explosion. Tom! I looked into his eyes for signs of acknowledgement, but got none. We're going to the car. It's not far. Try to keep up with me, okay? I wasn't too sure what his answer was. Something between maybe and what? His hearing had recovered a bit by the time we got to where I'd parked the car, but he still didn't know what day it was. I collapsed on my hands and knees, gulping in cold air. Fuck the teeth. My ass hurt even more now. But what hurt most of all was realizing that the car had gone. My head spun. Maybe I had the wrong place. No, there were the tire marks. There, too, were some other tire marks. And besides my footprints, there was a mass of others. The new tire marks were very wide and deep, probably from a tractor. The fuckers. The pub quiz team must have had the car away, along with my two spare weapons. Shit! The car's been nicked! I wasn't too sure if I was informing Tom or trying to get my own head around it. Tom was confused. You said? I know what I said, but the car's gone. I paused. Don't worry. It's not a drama. It was. Chances were they hadn't even had to break into it, just hitch it up and slide the locked wheels across the ice. Mr. and Mrs. Fuck Up had been well and truly at home from the moment I first stepped into the Intercontinental Hotel. For a second, I wished I hadn't let the tyres down on all three vehicles in the Jenny building. Then I remembered that by now they'd all be toast. The best thing I could hope for in this neck of the woods was another tractor. But if I lifted one, I'd be making people aware that we were on the ground. In any case, we didn't have the time to search. There was only one option right now, and that was to walk it. I got up off the ground. Tom, change of plan. Well, there would be once I'd worked one out. But first we had to get further away from the area, and quickly. At least the stars were now fully out and it was easier to see, and be seen. Slowly coming to his senses, he stood there, arms crossed and hands tucked under his armpits, coughing up brick dust and waiting for my decision. Follow me. I started to move down the road, putting distance between us and the target. Tom trailed slowly behind. We'd gone about 400 metres as I sorted out a plan, then stopped and checked for Polaris, the North Star. Tom was starting to spark up a bit more now that he was generating some warmth. He closed up to me as I gazed skyward. It was a fucking nightmare in there, he muttered. But I knew Liv would get you to come. I cut in, hoping to shut him up. That's right, Tom. Liv's your fairy godmother. I didn't tell him what she had planned for midnight. His hood was down and I could see steam coming off his thick red-bricked hair now that he had worked up a sweat. I pulled his hood up over his head to retain some of the body heat and check the North Star again. Nick, what happened to, you know, fucking nightmare or what? What? I had a load of questions for him as well, but now wasn't the time or place. You know, the fence, the house, what was all that about? It just wasn't important right now. Tom, I kept looking skyward, even though I'd finished up here. What? I gave him the thousand-yard stare. Shut the fuck up. Oh. I'd got the reply I wanted. I confirmed the plan in my head for the last time before I actioned it. We'd head north and cross-country until we hit the railway line. If we turned left along it, we'd be facing west towards Tallinn. Then we would follow the tracks to a station and catch a train, maybe the first one out of Narva. I wasn't sure, but I thought it left there at about eight-ish in the morning, so we'd need to be at a station about an hour after that. Only once we'd reached Tallinn would I start to worry about how to get us both out of the country. According to the Lion King, we had the best part of fourteen hours in which to cover what I guessed would be about twenty k's. Not a problem. 
so long as we got a move on. Tom was still facing me, trying to work out why I was gazing at the heavens. I got in there before he had a chance to ask. We'll have to get back to Tallinn by train now. Where's that then, mate? Aren't we going to Helsinki? I looked down, but I couldn't see his face. He had moved the wire sewn into the rim of his hood, so the fur closed off his face, making him look like Liam Gallagher after a big night out. We are, I said, but we've got to go to Tallinn first. From behind the fur came a muffled, Why's that? It's the easiest way. We've got to move up to the railway track, get a train to Tallinn, then catch a ferry to Helsinki. I didn't even know if he was aware what country he was in. I got right up close so he could see me smiling, trying to make it sound not too much of a big deal. His mind was obviously on other things as his voice came out of the darkness. Are they all dead? You know, that lot back there. I think so. Most of them, anyway. Shit, you killed them? Won't we get in trouble? You know, the law? I couldn't be asked to explain, so I just shrugged. It was the only way I could get you out of the shit. His shoulders began to heave and I suddenly realised he was laughing. How did you know when to set the bomb off? I mean, I could have been killed if I hadn't been upstairs. It was nervous laughter. I looked up searching for the North Star again so he couldn't see my face. You've no idea the trouble I went to, mate. Anyway, we'll talk about that later. We have to get a move on now. How far do you reckon? His Parker hood was looking skyward too, but he didn't have a clue what he was looking for. He started to shiver. Not far, Tom. Just a couple of hours. If we play our cards right, we'll be in a nice warm train carriage soon. Why tell him the truth now? I hadn't bothered to so far. You ready, then? He was coughing up the last of the brick dust like a TB patient. Yeah, I suppose so. I started down the road and he followed on behind. After just a couple of hundred metres, we hit a tree line, about 15 metres off the road on our left. I headed for it, leaving ridiculous amounts of tracks in the snow, which was up to my knees and sometimes waist high. It didn't bother me. Why worry about things you can't change? End of Side 22 Side 23 I waited for Tom to catch up. The pace wasn't going to be anything to write home about. You have to move at the speed of the slowest. That's just how it is if you want to keep together. I wondered about improvising snowshoes by tying tree branches to our feet, but quickly decided against. These things look good on paper, but in the dark it's just a pain in the ass to prepare and wastes time. I looked up. Wispy clouds were starting to appear and scud across the stars. Tom caught up and I allowed him a minute's rest before we moved on. I wanted to get out into the open fields before starting cross-country, following Polaris. That way we'd give the compound a wide berth as we had to head north back towards it. At the end of the tree line, visibility was about 50 to 60 metres in the starlight. The landscape was white, fading to black. In the middle distance to my half-left I could see the dim glow of the target area. I felt the cold bite into my face as I looked up at the sky once more. Tom shuffled up next to me knees buried in snow, standing so close that his breath merged with mine, losing itself in the wind. His hood was off again as he tried to cool down. I put it back up and slapped him on the head. Don't do that. You'll lose all the heat you've just generated. He pulled the fur around his face once more. I tried to find a reference point on the ground north of us, but it was too dark. The next best thing was to pick a star on the horizon below Polaris and go for that. It was easier than constantly checking skywards. I got one. Not as bright as some, but good enough. Ready? The hood moved and the material rustled as a head nodded about in there somewhere. We headed north. The only positive thing I could think of was that the pain in my ass had now disappeared. Either that, or it was even colder than I'd realised. Chapter 43
The ground beneath the snow was ploughed, so both of us kept slipping and falling on the angled frozen furrows. The best way forward seemed to be to keep my feet low and push through the snow. I became the icebreaker, and Tom followed in my wake, anything to speed him up. Clouds drifted across the sky more frequently now, intermittently blotting out my guide on the horizon. Polaris, too, was in and out of cloud cover. Tom lagged about ten metres behind, hands in pockets, head down. There was nothing to do but keep pushing north as the clouds moved faster and gained in mass. After about an hour, the wind began to pick up, attacking my face and tugging at my coat. It was time to put down the furry ear flaps. Each time we lost direction, all I could do was keep heading in what I thought was a straight line, only to find that we were way off course when the cloud cleared. I felt like a pilot flying without instruments. Our trail through the snow must have been one long zigzag. My major concern was that the wind and cloud would bring snow. If that happened, we'd lose our means of navigation, and without protection, catching the train would be the least of my worries. With a bad feeling that we were going to be in even deeper shit very soon, I stopped when I found a natural dip and used my back to push a groove in the snow to get us out of the wind. I scraped a channel in the lip to act as my north marker before Polaris disappeared again. Tom reached me as I dug myself in with my gloved hands. I expected him to follow my example, but when I turned, he was having a piss the steam and liquid disappearing almost immediately in the wind. He should have been retaining his warm body fluids at all costs, but I was too late. I went back to preparing our makeshift shelter. Stress hormones are released in cold weather, filling out the bladder more quickly. That's why we always seem to urinate more when it's cold. The problem is that you lose body heat and a serious thirst develops. Unless hot fluids are taken on board, it's a vicious circle from there on in, with dehydration helping to bring down the body's core temperature. If your core temperature falls below 28.8 degrees C, you will die. Tom was done, and putting his hands back in his pockets, he turned and collapsed, arse first into the dip. The wind hit the lip, sounding like one of the gods blowing across the neck of a bottle, and blasting the snow onto our backs and shoulders. Tom's fur rim turned to me as I slid into the dip beside him. I knew what he was going to ask. Not long now, mate, I preempted. It's a bit further than I thought, but we'll have a rest here. When you start to get cold, tell me and we'll get moving again, OK? The hood moved, which I took to be a nod. He brought his knees up to his chest and lowered his head to meet them. I bit off my gloves and held them between my teeth while I fumbled to tie the ear flaps under my chin. Then I unzipped his parka a bit so he could ventilate, yet still retain his body heat. Finally, standing up into the wind, I undid my trousers and tucked everything back in and pushed the bottoms of my heavy, wet jeans into my boots. It was a cold and uncomfortable process in wet, clingy clothes, but it was worth it. I would have lost heat doing it, but sorting my shit out always made me feel better. As I was about to lie down again in the dip, I saw Tom tucking his hand into his sleeve and lifting some snow to his mouth. I put out a hand. That's off the menu, mate. I wasn't going to waste energy explaining why. Not only does it use up crucial body heat through melting it in your mouth, it also cools the body from the inside, chilling the vital organs. Nevertheless, water was going to be a problem. I put my gloves back on and scooped up a handful of snow, but only passed it over when I'd worked it into a compressed ball. Suck on that. Don't eat it, OK? I looked at the sky. The cloud cover was now more or less total. Tom soon lost interest in the ice ball, hunching once more into a fetal position, knees up by his chest, hands deep in his pockets and head down. His body was starting to shake, and I had to agree with him. I'd had better days out. Now that we'd cleared the danger area and were resting for a while, it seemed the right time to ask him a few questions. I hoped it would help take his mind off the ship we were in. I also needed some answers. 
Why didn't you tell me you knew Valentin? I know you were trying to access Echelon at Menwith Hill for him. I couldn't see his reaction, but there was movement in the hood. I'm sorry, mate, he mumbled. She's got me by the bollocks. I'm sorry, I really wanted to, it's just that, you know. His hood dropped down as if his neck muscles had lost control. You mean threats? Some kind of threat to you or your family? His shoulders jerked up and down as he fought to contain the sobs. Mum, Dad, and I've got a sister with kids, know what I mean? I wanted to tell you, Nick, honest I did, but, well, you know. Listen, it ain't Valentin doing this shit, mate, it's her. She's freelancing. He don't know a thing about it. She's just using his name, letting you think you're working for him. He didn't need to say any more. Things were suddenly making more sense to me than they had in a long time. That was why she'd been able to say yes straight away to the three million. That was why she'd insisted there was to be no contact with anyone apart from her. It even explained why she didn't want me to have a weapon. She probably thought that if I found out what was happening, I'd use it against her. How did you get sucked back into all this? I waited for him to try to compose himself. Liv? Well, not her to begin with, but this bloke, Ignati. He came and saw me in London the, the day before you did. Where had I heard that name before? Then I realised. He was the underwriter. It had been his name on the piece of paper in Narva. So maybe Liv wasn't the only one of Val's people to be going freelance. Now Tom had started babbling, it was important not to ask the sort of questions that might suddenly make him realise he was saying too much. I just said gently, What happened then, mate? He said Liv had a job for me and that I'd be going to Finland. That someone would come and persuade me and all that stuff. I shat myself when I found out it was Echelon again, but I had no choice, mate. My sister and what have you. Nick, you've got to help me. Please, she'll kill everyone if I don't sort this shit out. Please help me. Please. He wept into his hood. Tom. He didn't register. Maybe his sobs were too loud for him to hear me. Tom. She wanted you dead. She will think you're dead if I tell her. His hood came up. You were going to kill me? Oh, fuck, Nick. Don't. Please don't. I'm not going to kill you. He wasn't listening. I'm so sorry, Nick. She made me ask those questions, you know, in a train station. She wanted to know if you were going to stitch her up or what. I had to do it. She knows everybody's addresses and everything. The bloke showed me pictures of my sister's kids. Honest, Nick, I wanted to tell you what was happening, but... His hood dropped back down as a new spasm took hold of him. I felt like a priest in a confession box. Tom, listen. Really, I'm not going to kill you. It was me who got you out of there, remember? There was a small nod from within the hood. I'll make sure that you and your family are looked after, Tom. But we have to get back to the UK first. You'll have to talk with some people and tell them exactly what's been happening. At Menwith and here, okay? I sensed an opportunity for everything to work out, whichever way this went. I wasn't exactly sure how, but there had to be a way that Tom could get a new life and I could get my money. And if the money didn't materialise, at least I could still work for the firm. I could come up with enough bullshit to make it sound as if I'd known all along what was happening, but couldn't tell anyone because of the security risk of someone printing off the information I'd told them in Russia. Liv need never know that Tom was alive, and I could still pick up my money and then go to Lynn. I knew it was flimsy as plans go, but it was a start, assuming she didn't stitch me up. What was more important was getting out of Estonia. After that, I'd sit down with Tom, get the full story, and sort my shit out. Why didn't she just tell me that it was you coming with me, rather than getting me to try and talk you into it? You're already coming, right? His babbling before hadn't exactly explained it clearly. Fuck knows. You'll have to ask her. 
That's why I sat myself when I saw you. I thought your lot had heard about it. She's weird, mate. Did she talk as if it was all coming from Valentin? Of course. Well, it ain't. She's talking about herself. It's all her own plans, mate. I'm telling you. If Valentin knew, he'd cut her in half. Know what I mean? Well, not quite in half. But I bet he'd have her watching a few squirming eels before he'd finished with her. For all that, there was a part of me that admired what she was doing. Maybe the man from St. Petersburg was her feed in Val's setup, leaking her information to set this whole thing up. What was in it for her? What was her goal in all this? Maybe Tom was right. It was everything that she had talked about. Question after question leapt into my head, but the snowflakes hitting my face made me remember that there were more pressing matters to attend to. We had no shelter, no heat. And now no navigation. The cold was getting to me as the sweat on my back began to cool rapidly. Now that we had been stationary for a while, Tom shivered badly where he sat, curled up on the snow beside me. Both of us had inherited a layer of snow. We had to move, but in which direction? The marker would only be good for a hundred meters or so. After that, and without Polaris. We'd get disoriented and spend the rest of the night walking round in circles. I looked at Tom and felt him shivering in almost uncontrollable bursts. His brain was probably telling him that he must start moving, but his body was begging him to stay where he was and rest. I lifted the cuff of various layers of clothing and had a quick look at the Lion King. Just under twelve hours to go until we should RV with the train. Even if I knew which direction to take, trying to cover that distance in these conditions without navigation aids would be madness. Visibility had worsened; it was down to about five meters. In any other circumstances, we should have been digging in for the night and riding out the storm, but we didn't have the luxury of time. Quite apart from making it to a train, I didn't know what sort of follow-up the Meliskia would go for, and I didn't want to find out. Trying to think of a positive, I finally dredged one up. At least the snow would cover our trail. Tom mumbled under his hood, "I'm really cold, Nick. We'll get going in a minute, mate." I was still racking my brain for some sort of navigation aid. It had been years since I'd had to use or even remember any survival skills. Scrolling through the pages of crap in my head, I tried hard to call up what I'd learned all those years ago. I'd never been one for all that hundred and one uses for a shoelace stuff. I just got on with it and only did the snow hole and snared rabbit routine when I had to. I put my arms around him. He wasn't too sure what was going on, and I felt his body stiffen. It's a snow thing, I said. We've got to keep warm. He leaned in towards me, shivering, good style. Nick, I'm really, really sorry, mate. If I told you the truth, we wouldn't be in this shit. Know what I mean? I nodded, feeling slightly uncomfortable. It wasn't all his fault. I'd have tried to drag his granny over that fence if it would have given me half a chance of pocketing 1.7 million. I'll tell you the best thing I found to get over all this cold stuff. I said, trying to sound as relaxed about it as possible. From under the hood came a muffled, "What's that then? Dream, mate." Just think to yourself that this will all be over soon. This time tomorrow, you're going to be in a hot bath with a huge mug of coffee and a fat, sticky bun. This time tomorrow, you'll be laughing about all this shit. He kicked his heels into the snow. That's if these poxy trainers stay on. Don't moan, I said. They're better than those fucking stupid daps of yours. He started to laugh, but it turned into a cough. I looked up and saw nothing but blankets of white tumbling down at us out of the blackness. If I'd had access to a genie at that moment, the one thing I'd have wished for was a compass. Jesus, a compass! A compass can be made from any ferrous metal. It should have been so simple, but it seemed to take me forever to work it out. Tom had a faceful of the stuff in the rim of his parka hood. Could I use it? And if so, then what? 
It was like trying to remember the ingredients of a particularly complicated cake I'd been shown how to bake twenty years ago. I tried hard to visualize the process, closing my eyes and thinking back to all those times when I'd got so bored making shelters, traps and snares with bits of string and picture wire. Tom had other ideas. Let's go, Nick. I'm cold. Come on, you said. He was clinging to me like a baby monkey on its mother's back. It was good. I needed him to warm me just as much as he needed me for reassurance. In a minute, mate. In a minute. Something had to be in the memory bank somewhere. We never forget anything. It can all be brought back to the surface if you press the right button. It happened. The trigger was remembering being given a silk escape map in the gulf with a needle pinned in it. Tom, are you still wearing those silk thermals? He shook his head. My heart sank. Nah, just the top. I wish I did have the bottoms. I'm freezing. Can we go now? You said to tell you, Nick, and I'm telling you. Hang on a minute, mate. I've just had a great idea. I unwrapped my arm from him. As I moved, I was forcibly reminded of the awful discomfort of my wet clothing. My jeans clung to my legs and my T-shirt was cold and clammy. I removed my glove, holding it in my mouth while I pulled out the leather man. Opening the pliers, I put the glove back on before the skin of my hand was exposed for too long. Look at me for a sec, would you, mate? The Parker hood came up and the snow that had collected on it fell onto his shoulders. Feeling around the frozen ring of fur with my gloved hand, I located the wire, then trapped it in the jaws of the pliers and squeezed until I felt it give. Teasing apart the material at the site of the cut, I exposed the metal, gripped one end of the cut with the pliers and pulled, grasping the exposed wire in my hand. I made another cut and put the two-inch strip inside my glove for safekeeping. I thought Tom might have been interested, but he was concentrating 100% on feeling cold and miserable. Bending down some more, I peered into the darkness behind his hood. I need some of that silk, Tom, he shrugged. I don't have to take it off, do I? Just unzip your coat a bit more so I can get a hand in. I'll be as quick as I can. His hands slowly came out of his pockets and fumbled for the zip. In the end, I shoved both of my gloves between my teeth so I could help him. Then, having battled with numb fingers to open the blade of the leather man, I felt under his shirt. He sat there like a tailor's dummy as I pulled at his clothing. I didn't have enough feeling in my hands to be gentle about it, and he flinched as my freezing fingers gripped the silk and came into contact with his skin. My nose was streaming as I grabbed a handful of the vest and started cutting, pulling so hard that I nearly lifted Tom off the ground. I wanted to make sure the material ripped so there were loose threads dangling. The knife jerked as it made its final cut. Tom yelped as the tip of the blade flicked into his chest. He sat there with an exposed finger over his little cut, the snow settling on his hand. I said, For fuck's sake, Tom, keep the heat in. He pulled his clothing together shoving his hands back in his pockets and dropping his head. Sorry. I tell you what, I zipped him up once more. I'm going to be a couple of minutes doing this. Why don't you do some exercises to get some heat going? I'm all right. How much longer do you reckon to the train, Nick? I dodged the question. Come on, move about. It'll warm you up. He started to move as if he was snuggling under a duvet, but the only thing covering him was snow. No, Tom. You've got to get up and get your body moving. Come on, we haven't got that far to go, but we won't make it if you start seizing up. I shook him. Tom, get up! He hauled himself to his feet reluctantly as I brushed the snow from his shoulders. His fur rim was now a white ring of snow framing his face. Come on, with me! Hands in pockets, we started to play aerobics with his back to the wind, squatting down and standing up again. Elbows out, flapping like demented chickens. I kept my head down, protecting it from the wind as I got him to keep in time with me. Good stuff, Tom. Now keep going. I won't be long. I got back on my knees and into cover. It was gloves off time again as I lay them in the snow. I crouched over to protect myself from the snowstorm. My hands were so numb that I had to pull threads from the silk with my teeth. Once I'd teased out a decent bit, about five inches long, 
I put it between my lips and fished out the needle-sized length of wire from my glove. Tying the loose end of the silk shakily around the middle of the metal, I finally managed a knot on the fourth attempt. Mr. Motivator next to me grunted and groaned, but was sounding a bit happier. It's working, Dick. I'm getting warmer, mate. He beamed, blowing out the snot from his nose. I muttered encouragement through gritted teeth as I held the thread and wire, shaking the snow off my gloves and quickly putting them back on. My hands were now so wet they stuck to the inners. After trying to get some blood circulating by clapping them together for a while, it was gloves off time yet again. As I bit on the free end of silk thread with my teeth, it seemed to take forever to grasp the dangling wire in one hand and the square of silk in the other. At last I began stroking the wire along the silk, repeating the motion over and over, always in the same direction. After about twenty strokes I stopped, making sure there were no kinks in the thread that would affect the balance of the metal once I let go. I fished in my pocket for the torch, switched it on and put it in my mouth. Still crouching over it to make sure the wind wouldn't affect the thread and needle, I let go and watched it spin. The short length of wire eventually steadied, just moving slightly from side to side. I knew the direction of the North Star from my snow marker, which was now quickly disappearing in the storm, so all I had to do was identify which end of the wire, magnetized by the silk, was pointing north. I could tell the difference between the ends from the way the leather man had cut them. The huffing and puffing went on behind me as I shivered and worked out what I was going to do next. Getting through this weather tonight was going to be a nightmare, but we absolutely had to be at that rail track by morning. In theory, moving cross-country in these conditions was a huge no-no, but fuck the rules, it was too cold for them now. I didn't care about leaving sign. I needed roads to make distance, and besides, if Tom, or I for that matter, started going down with hypothermia, we were more likely to find some form of shelter near a road. My new thought was to go west until we hit one, then hang a right and head north for the rail track. One of the few things I knew about this country was that its main highway, and the one and only rail track, ran east to west between Tallinn and St. Petersburg. The roads on either side were bound to make their way to it eventually, like streams towards a river. Nobody was going to see the torchlight in this weather, so I turned it on again and looked down as I let the metal drop, and had another check to make sure it still worked. As the compass needle oriented itself, I realized that the wind was doing its best to help. It seemed to be prevailing from the west, so as long as I kept it in my face, I would be heading the way I wanted. I was ready to go. Gloves back on, the silk in my pocket, the compass thread and needle wrapped round my finger. I turned to Tom, who was squatting up and down with a vengeance, his arms swinging wildly. OK, mate, we're off. Not long now, Nick, eh? No, not long. A couple of hours, tops. Chapter 44 The gale had become a blizzard bringing close to white-out conditions. I was having to stop every ten or so paces, rubbing the needle again with the silk to reactivate the magnetic effect before getting another navigation fix. In this visibility, there was no way I could keep us moving in a straight line. We were vaguely zigzagging west, still hoping to hit a road. We'd been going for about forty minutes. The wind was still head-on, and its stinging cold made my eyes stream with tears. I had nothing to protect my face with. All I could do was bury my head into my coat for a few minutes' respite. Freezing flakes blasted their way into every gap in my clothes. I still led the way, breaking the trail, then stopping, though no longer turning, to allow Tom to catch up. When I heard him move up behind me, I'd go on a few more steps. This time I did stop, turning my back to the wind, and I could just make him out coming towards me in the storm. I'd been so concerned about navigating that I hadn't noticed how much he was slowing down. I crouched over on my knees to protect the silk and magnetize the wire while I waited. He finally got level with me as I was trying to stop the wind affecting the compass, which was dangling from my mouth. 
His hands were buried into his pockets and his head was down. I grabbed hold of his parker and pulled him down next to me, positioning him so he could give the compass some shelter too. I wrapped up the compass, but this time didn't get to my feet. Instead, I just stayed where I was and shivered with Tom, both of us bent over in the snow. The snow that had built up on the outside of his hood had frozen, and my hat probably looked the same, matching the front of our coats. You okay, mate? It was a bone question, but I couldn't think of anything else to say. He coughed and shivered. Yeah, but my legs are really cold, Nick. I can't feel my feet. We're going to be okay, aren't we? I mean, you know all about this outdoor stuff, don't you? I nodded. It's a fucker, Tom. But just dig deep, mate. It's not going to kill us. I was lying. Remember what I said. Dream. That's all you have to do. Dream. And this time tomorrow, you know the rest, don't you? His ice up fur moved in what I took to be agreement, as I added. We'll be on the road soon, and the going will be much easier. Will we get a car when we get to the road? I didn't answer. A nice warm vehicle would be heaven, but who would be mad enough to be out here on a night like this? I struck out into the snow, and he reluctantly followed. We had a result about twenty minutes later. I couldn't see any tarmac, but I could make out the shape of tire ruts under the newly fallen snow, and the fact that the snow suddenly wasn't as deep as it had been everywhere else. It was only a single track road, but that didn't matter. It could be enough to save our lives. I started to jump up and down on the spot to make sure I was right. Tom took a long time to catch up, and when he arrived, I could see his condition had worsened. Time to sort yourself out, Tom. New phase. Just jump up and down and get the body going. I tried to turn it into a bit of a game, and he half-heartedly joined in. It wasn't that long ago that he'd been crying. Now it was sarcasm. Not long to go now, I suppose. No, not long at all. We started to make distance, huddling together at junctions to protect the compass. Whether a road ran northeast, northwest, or even due west, we took it. Anything to get us in the general direction of Tallinn and the rail track. After about three hours, Tom had slowed down dramatically. I was having to stop more and more and wait for him to close up on me. The fight through the snow and the extreme cold had definitely got to him, and he couldn't stop shivering. He pleaded with me, "I've had it, Nick. Everything's spinning around me, mate. Please, we have to stop." The wind whipped the snow against our faces. Tom, we must keep going. You understand that, don't you? We're fucked if we don't. The only reaction from him was a moan. I pulled his hood apart so he could see me. Tom. Look at me! I pulled his chin up. We must go on. You must help me by keeping going, okay? I moved his chin again, trying to get eye to eye, but it was too dark. And every time the wind got into my eyes, they started to water. It was pointless trying to get any sense out of him. We were wasting time and losing what little heat we had by just standing still. There was nothing I could do to help him here and now. Our best bet was to get to the railway track and make the final push to a station. I wasn't too sure how many k's we still had to cover, but the most important thing was to get there. I'd know when he'd finally had enough, and that would be the time to stop and take some action. I grasped his arm and pulled him along. You've got to dig deep, Tom. We moved on, me with my head down and Tom past caring. It wasn't a good sign. When the body starts to go into hypothermia, the central thermostat responds by ordering heat to be drawn from the extremities into the core. This is when your hands and feet start to stiffen. As the core temperature drops, the body also draws heat from the head. Circulation slows down, and you don't get the oxygen or sugar your brain needs. The real danger comes from the fact that you don't realize it's happening. One of the first things hypothermia does is take away your will to help yourself. You stop shivering and you stop worrying. In fact, you are dying, and you couldn't care less. Your pulse will get irregular. Drowsiness will give way to semi-consciousness, which will eventually become unconsciousness. 
Your only hope is to add heat from an external source, a fire, a hot drink, or another body. Another hour passed. Soon I had to push Tom from behind. He took a few steps forward, stopped, and complained bitterly. I grabbed his arm and dragged him. At least the extra effort warmed me up a bit. The cold was taking its toll on me, too. We moved on, painfully slowly. When I stopped to check direction, Tom couldn't help me any more. He just stood on the spot, swaying, as I turned my back to the wind, trying to create shelter for the compass. You okay, mate? I shouted behind me. Not far now. There was no reply, and when I'd finished and turned for him, he collapsed in the snow. I got him to his feet and dragged him on. He had almost no strength left now, but we had to crack on. Surely they couldn't be that far to go. He mumbled to himself as I pulled him along. Suddenly, he stopped resisting and ran forward with a burst of manic energy. Tom, slow down! He did, but only to stagger a few meters off to the side of the road and lie down. I couldn't run to him. My legs couldn't carry me that fast anymore. When I got to him, I saw that the trainer on his right foot was missing. His feet were so numb that he hadn't noticed. Shit! It had been there minutes ago. As I dragged him along and protected my face from the wind, his trainers had been the only things I'd seen. I turned back down the road and retraced his quickly disappearing sign. I found the shoe and trudged back to him, but getting it back onto his foot was not far short of impossible. My numb fingers trying to tie the laces which were frozen with ice. I touched my little finger to my thumb to make the old Indian sign that means I'm all right. If you can't do that, you're in trouble. You've got to get up, Tom. Come on, it's not that far. He didn't have a clue what I was saying. I helped him to his feet and dragged him on. Now and again he would shout out and summon up another burst of energy. Fuck knows from where. It didn't last for long before he slowed down or fell back into the snow with exhaustion and despair. His voice had become a whine as he begged to be left where he was, pleading with me to let him sleep. He was in the latter stages of hypothermia, and I should be doing something about it. But what? And where? I pushed him on. Tom, remember, mate, dream! I doubted he understood a word I was saying. I felt sorry for him, but we couldn't rest now. If we stopped for even a few minutes, we might not restart. It was about fifteen minutes later that we stumbled onto the railway line, and only by chance did I notice it. We'd reached a level crossing, and I had tripped over one of the tracks. Tom wasn't the only one losing his core heat and spiralling down through the spectrum of hypothermia. I tried to summon some enthusiasm to celebrate, but I couldn't manage any. Instead, I shook him. We're here, Tom. We're here. No reaction whatsoever. It was obvious that what I said would make little difference to him now anyway. Even if he showed any awareness, what was there to get excited about? We were still in the shit. Wet, freezing cold, with no shelter and I didn't know how or where we were going to get on the train, even if it turned up. He collapsed on the crossing next to me. I bent down and got my hands under his armpits, heaving him up again and nearly collapsing myself in the process. He couldn't control his mouth or teeth and began to make strange snorting noises. We have to keep going just a bit further, I shouted into his ear. We have to find a station! I didn't know any more whether it was him or myself I was talking to. I turned him left, towards Tallinn. We staggered west, over the snow-covered hardcore at the side of the track. At least the trees on either side gave us some protection from the howling wind. It was thirty minutes, an hour, since we got on the track. I didn't know. I'd given up clock-watching long ago. Tom started to go crazy, screaming at the trees, crying, apologizing to them, 
only to fall down again and try to cuddle up in the snow. Each time, I had to pick him up and push on, and each time, it got a little bit harder. We came across a row of small sheds, visible only because of the flatness of the snow on top of their angled roofs. We still couldn't see further than about five meters, and I didn't notice them until we were right on top of them. I fumbled excitedly for the torch, leaving Tom on his knees, shouting at the trees that were coming to get him. It seemed to take forever to press the switch. Soon my fingers wouldn't be able to perform even a simple task like that. I shone the light around and saw that the sheds were made of wood and built in the form of a terrace, the door of each facing onto the track. Most were clamped shut with old rusty padlocks, but one was unlocked. After kicking the snow away, I pulled it open and turned round for Tom. He was curled up in the snow on the track and pleading to be allowed to sleep. If he did, there would be no waking up. As I gathered him in my arms, he lashed out with his final reserves of strength. He was having a fit. It was pointless struggling with him. I simply didn't have the energy. I let him drop to the ground and, gripping his hood with both hands, pulled him along like a sledge, stumbling backwards and falling over with the effort. I didn't talk to him any more. I didn't have the strength. The door was so low that I had to bend down to get in, and the roof wasn't much higher, but the instant I was out of the wind I began to feel warmer. The shed was about eight feet square, and the floor was cluttered with bits of wood and brick, old tools and a rusted shovel with a half-broken shaft, crap from over the years lying on a frozen mud floor. Tom just lay where I dropped him. As I put the torch down to give me some light, I could see him curled up in a ball, his hands exposed, wrists bent as if he had suddenly developed severe arthritis. His short, sharp breaths mixed with mine and looked like steam in the torchlight. Not long now and he would be history, unless I got a grip on myself and sorted him out. End of Side 23 Side 24 If only this was a hunter's cabin, not a rail worker's shed. It's the custom in extremely cold climates to leave kindling in huts so that someone in trouble can rewarm themselves quickly. It's also the custom to leave a box of matches with the ends sticking out so that frozen, numb fingers can grasp them. I got my gloves off and started to fantasize about warm train carriages and hot mugs of coffee. I dragged over a lump of wood that looked as if it used to be part of the panelling. I then played about with my leather man with shaking hands trying to pull out the blade. Once my soaking gloves were back on, I started to scrape at the edge of the wood. I wanted to get to the dry stuff underneath. Tom filled the room with his screams and cries. It was as if he was speaking in tongues. I yelled just as loudly, SHUT THE FUCK UP! But wherever he was, it was a place where he couldn't hear me. Once I'd cut away the damp stuff and exposed the dry wood, I started to scrape thin shavings onto the shovel face. This was the tinder. My hands hurt as I tried to keep a firm grip. Tom's body had started jerking around in the corner of the hut. We both needed to get this fire burning soon, but I couldn't rush what I was doing or I'd fuck up completely. Next task was to cut kindling, a stage up from tinder, so that larger bits of wood could then be placed in the fire and stand a chance of catching. I picked up any sticks of wood I could find, and also pulled off some of the roof lining and tore it into strips. It would burn well because it was partly coated with tar. Then, with the rest of the small bits of wood, I started to make fire sticks, cutting very thinly into the side of the wood and pushing out the shavings until each piece looked as if it had grown feathers. Tom was no longer thrashing around on the floor. Mumbling incoherently to himself, he was kicking out, as if fending off an imaginary attacker. It was pointless talking to him. I needed to concentrate on building the fire. Survival training might not be my strong suit, but I knew about fire.
It had been my job to make up the one in the front room every morning before my stepdad got out of bed. Otherwise, it was slapping time. Usually, it was slapping time anyway. Once I'd prepared about five fire sticks, I stacked them around the tinder like teepee poles. Then I got out my pistol, taking off the magazine and pulling the top slide to eject the round in the chamber. Using the pliers of the leather man, I eventually pulled the heads off the three rounds and poured the dark grain propellant onto the tinder. My hands were shaking as I poured, trying my best to get it over the wood and not the mud. I left the third round half full of propellant. Tom's frenzied movements had dislodged his hood. Placing the round carefully on the ground so I wouldn't lose its contents, I got up and crawled over to him, my muscles protesting now that they'd had a rest. My cold, wet clothes clung miserably to me as I moved. I got hold of his hood and tried to pull it back on. He lashed out with his arms, shrieking stuff I couldn't understand, his hands flailing around and knocking my hat off. I collapsed on top of him, trying to control him as I got his hood back up and my iced hat back on. It's all right, mate, I soothed. Not long now. Remember to dream. Just dream. But I was wasting time here. It was heat he needed, not bullshit. Crawling back to the shovel, I dug inside my glove for the compass silk, held it in my teeth and cut some off with my leatherman scissors. Then, using the screwdriver, I rammed the cut silk into the half-empty case as wadding on top of the propellant. I loaded the round into the weapon, pointed it at the ground, and fired. The signature was a dull oomph. There was no reaction from Tom as I knelt on the ground to pick up a glowing, smouldering bit of silk. Once it was in my fingers, I waved it about gently to fan the glow, then put it into the tinder. The propellant flared, lighting up the whole hut. I must have looked like a witch making spells. Once the tinder had caught, I started inserting more little bits through the fire sticks into the flame. It wasn't yet giving out much heat. That wouldn't happen until the tinder was hot enough to ignite the fire sticks. I got in close and blew gently. The fire sticks started to crackle and hiss as they released their moisture and smoke. I could smell burning wood. I fussed around the flames on my hands and knees, carefully placing wood for the best effect as the hut filled with smoke and my eyes started to water. The flames were now higher and threw dancing shadows on the walls of the hut. I could feel the heat on my face. I had to get more wood before all my good work was undone. I looked around and gathered up as much as possible from what was to hand. Once I'd established the fire, I'd be able to venture outside into the howling wind for more. I kicked the door open slightly to get rid of the smoke. It let some of the wind and snow whistle in, but it had to be done. I'd block up most of the gap as soon as I could. Tom was much quieter. I crawled over to him, coughing smoke from my lungs. I wanted to see if there was any wood under him or in the corner. There was. Only a few bits and pieces, but it all helped. I couldn't make a big fire as the hut was too small, and besides, we wouldn't need it. The walls were so close that the heat would bounce straight back on us anyway. I checked the flames and started to feed on some more wood. Not long now, mate. We'll be getting our kit off in a minute because we're so hot. My next priority would be a hot drink, to get some heat directly to Tom's core. Placing the rest of the wood near the fire to dry it out, I turned and looked at his face. Tom, I'm just going to see if I can find something to heat snow in for a... He was lying too still. There was something very odd about the way his legs had now curled up to his chest. Tom? I crawled back to him, pulling him over and getting the hood off his face. Illuminated by the flames, it told me all I needed to know. Tilting his head towards the fire, I pulled open his eyelids. There was no reaction to the light. Both pupils stayed as fully dilated as a dead fish's. It wouldn't be long now before they clouded up.
I could hear the fire sticks now collapsing on each other, with glowing embers as well as flame. It was a wonderful sight, but it was too fucking late. I tried his carotid pulse. Nothing. But that could be just my numb fingers. I listened for breathing and even tried his heart. Nothing. His mouth was still open from when he had taken, or fought for, his last breath. I gently closed his jaw. It was time to think about me. Pulling off my wet clothes, I wrung them out one by one before putting them back on. I sat and fed the flames some more, knowing there were still things that I should do to him. I should try to resuscitate and reheat him until I was so exhausted I couldn't carry on, in the million to one chance he could be revived. But for what? I knew he was dead. Maybe if we dug in for the night once the weather had closed in, he would still be alive. We would have been in a desperate state in the morning, but maybe he would have survived. Maybe if I hadn't pushed him so hard to get here, or had realised what condition he was in and had stopped earlier. All these questions, and the only thing I was certain of, was that I had killed him. I had fucked up. I looked at his limp body, its mouth reopened, his long wet hair against his cheeks, the ice crystals on his bum fluff now melting down his face. I try and remember a gobby but happy Tom, but I knew this image was the one that would stay with me. It was going straight to the top of the list of my sweaty, guilty, wake-up-in-the-early-hours nightmares. When I was put into the counselling programme the firm sets up for operators now and again, I told the shrinks I didn't have them. I was talking bollocks, of course. Maybe it was a good thing I was going to be part of Kelly's treatment now, I started to realise I might need it just as much as her. Dragging him to the doorway, I sat him up against the gap, leaving a space of a foot or so above him for the smoke to escape. I covered his face with his parka. Feeling was already starting to come back to my extremities, and I knew I was going to be okay. All I had to do was find a station. I turned back to the flames and watched the steam rise from my drying clothes. There would be no sleep for me tonight. I had to keep the fire going. Chapter 45 London, England Wednesday the 5th of January, 2000 I was nursing a hot, frothy Starbucks in the church doorway opposite the Langham Hilton the only place I could keep a trigger on the hotel and also keep out of the drizzle. It was breakfast time, and the pavements were packed with overcoated wage slaves throwing Danish pastries and coffee down their necks, and shoppers out early for the sales. Judging by the frenzy, it was clear the Y2K bug hadn't brought the world to its knees after all. It had been the last thing on my mind, as I'd seen in the new century, aboard an Estonian fishing boat along with twenty-six cold and seasick illegals from Somalia. Slipping away from a seaside village under cover of darkness, we'd battled across the Baltic in huge seas, heading for a peninsula east of Helsinki. Lion King told me it was midnight as we approached the Finnish coastline, where we were suddenly treated to one of the finest fireworks displays I'd ever seen. The whole place seemed to light up as towns all along the shore celebrated the new millennium. I wondered if it held in store any new beginnings for me. Christ, I hope so. It was eighteen days since I had left the hut and set off again into the blizzard. Tom had stayed behind. Parker draped over his face, his body sterile of any item that could ID him. They probably wouldn't find him before the spring. I only hoped they'd give him a decent burial. If things worked out well here in London, maybe I'd go back and see to it all myself. Man down and all that. At first light, and without Tom, I was able to make distance at my own pace, even in the driving snow, and it was only a couple of hours before I hit a station about six or seven k's away. 
A train arrived heading west towards Tallinn, but I let it go without me. The one after that was heading east, towards Russia, and I climbed aboard. Without a passport, it could take weeks to get out of Estonia on my own, but with eight helping me, maybe it would be a different story. That was why I jumped off at Narva, and that was how I'd ended up on the fishing boat with my new Somalian friends. It had cost me all the dollars in my boot, and had meant spending several uncomfortable days and nights hiding in the apartment with the landmines while eight got things arranged, but it had been worth it. Eight wasn't too happy about his car becoming history, but he still seemed thrilled to help me, even though he must have been aware of what had happened to Carpenter and the old guy in Volker, and put two and two together. I wondered if he gave a shit. Eight didn't ask me again about helping him to escape to England, but as I stood on the jetty waiting to board the fishing boat, I turned to him and handed over Tom's passport. From the expression on his face and the tears in his eyes, you'd have thought I'd given him the three million. I knew I was taking a big risk, but I felt I owed him that much. I just hoped he did a good job of doctoring Tom's picture, or that the day he tried to use it, immigration weren't checking their computer screens too closely. Otherwise, poor Eight would find himself being lifted by a team of heavies and whisked off to a three-by-nine sooner than he could say, Crazy boy! I'd told myself then that the passport was part of what I owed him for his help, along with a new car. But now, standing in London with a hot coffee in my hands and time to think, I knew it was more to do with trying to get over my guilt about Tom. I had pushed him beyond his limits in outrageous conditions, and I'd killed him. Giving eight the possibility of a new life was an attempt to square my conscience and make things right. The job was done. Now cut away. At first I thought it had worked and that things were all right, but I knew they weren't, not with Tom, not with Kelly. She was much the same. The new year had passed her by too. I'd phoned the clinic twice in the two days since I'd got back. I'd lied both times, telling them I was overseas but would be back soon. I was desperate to see her, but I just couldn't face it yet. I knew I wasn't going to be able to look her in the eye. Hughes picked up the phone the second time and told me that her plans for Kelly's therapy sessions, which included me, would have to stay on hold until I got back. I still felt confused about it. I knew it had to be done, and I wanted to do it, but... To add to the confusion, I'd also had a call from Lynn. He wanted to see me this afternoon. There seemed to have been a change of heart since our last meeting. He said he had a month's work for me. I'd been tempted to tell him where he could shove his £290 a day, because if all went well with Liv this morning, I'd never have to depend on the firm again. But there was no guarantee that she was going to appear, and though a month's pay wasn't much, at least I would be working instead of thinking. The exchange was going to be simple. I'd opened a bank account in Luxembourg by telephone as soon as I returned to the UK. The message I'd left live in the Helsinki DLB was that she'd be required to move the money electronically using a Fed wire reference, which would guarantee the transfer within hours. When we met in the hotel in a few minutes' time, she would call her bank with the transfer instructions I would give her, and then we'd both just sit and wait until it happened. I would call Luxembourg each hour, giving my password, and would be told when the money had been deposited. In my own mind, I'd set a cut-off time of 4 p.m. If she hadn't turned up by then, I had to assume she never would. Then it would be decision time about her, and how to go about contacting Val to explain what Mr. and Mrs. Liv's little girl had been getting up to. As my parting shot, when I was sure the money had gone through, I'd toyed with the idea of revealing that I'd saved Tom's life, and that he'd told me the whole story, just for the satisfaction of letting her know she hadn't outsmarted me. After all, I intended having nothing further to do with ROC. All I wanted was the money, 
and then they could carry on blowing up buildings and ripping people's guts out for all I cared. Deep down, however, I knew that telling her would achieve nothing except to put me in the shit. She hadn't got as far as she had without damaging a few bodies, and I didn't want to be the next one on the list. Twenty minutes before the RV time, a taxi pulled up at the hotel's main entrance. As I watched, Gunga Din stepped forward and opened the cab door, and I saw the back of Liv's head as she got out and went inside. We had the taxi between us, but I could see that she had decided on the jeans today, together with her long leather coat, collar up against the cold. I let her go in and watched for any surveillance or another vehicle pulling up shortly afterwards. Neither happened. I waited, elated. She was here. She wouldn't have come all the way to London just to announce that she was stitching me up. The three million was now so close I could almost smell it. I had earned this money. No, after a lifetime of shoveling shit for peanuts, I deserved it. I'd been working hard to control my excitement as I stood in the doorway, but now I reckoned it wouldn't hurt to let myself enjoy the moment. I ran through my game plan one more time. As soon as the transfer was confirmed and Liv and I had said our goodbyes, I'd call the clinic and tell them that Kelly's new treatment could start straight away. It still worried me a bit, but I'd just have to get on with it. Who knows? I might even sort myself out. Hughes had said there was no telling how long the therapy would go on for, so I'd been thinking it might be a good investment to buy a little flat nearby and sell it afterwards. I could also start throwing a few builders at my house in Norfolk and get it sorted for when Kelly was ready to come home. Less than ten minutes to go now. She still had to unload the DLB under the telephone, which held the key card for the suite I'd booked. I'd also left instructions to place the Do Not Disturb sign on the door handle once she entered. I waited and watched. There was nothing to see, apart from a woman getting splashed by a passing bus. I could almost feel the three million between my fingers as I counted it in my mind. For about a millisecond, I thought about giving Tom's share to some kind of charity. For a millisecond. Because then I saw Kelly again sitting like a frozen statue in the clinic and staring into space. Fuck it. She needed all the charity she could get. With just two minutes to go, I dodged the traffic and approached the hotel. Gunga Din wasn't there to help me as I pushed past the revolving doors and into the warmth of the foyer. The marble reception area was teeming with businessmen and tourists. I walked around them, past the chucker bar and the reception desk, then took the stairs. I climbed to the third floor, opening my leather jacket and checking the position of the USP, tucked centre front of my jeans. I'd gone back to Norfolk last night specifically to pick up a weapon, and had found myself mopping up the worst of the flooding that had come through the hole in the roof. Still, it wouldn't be long now before that useless tarpaulin was replaced by solid Welsh slate. Outside the door of room 316, I stopped and listened. Nothing. I pushed my own key card into the lock and opened the door. She was at the far end of the living room, her back to me, looking out of the windows that overlooked the main entrance. The door closed behind me with a gentle click. Hello, Liv. It's really good to... I went to open my coat to draw down, but knew it was useless. The overcoated body that had moved out from behind the cabinet housing the TV and minibar already had his pistol on me. The other body that sprang from the toilet to my left was no more than four feet away, his weapon at my head. I released my grip on the leather and let my arms drop to my sides instead of raising them. There could still be a chance to draw. Liv turned towards me, only it wasn't her. She spoke in a soft accent which I couldn't identify. Step forward and keep your hands high in the air, please. I did as I was told. The toilet man moved behind me and started to run his hands over my back and legs. It was pointless trying to bullshit them. As he removed my USP, 
I couldn't exactly claim I was just delivering room service. She said nothing as I was pushed from behind towards the settee. Cabinet man stayed where he was, to my right. The other one was somewhere behind me. The woman pushed past and headed for the door to the corridor. Her blonde hair was dyed. I could see her brown eyebrows. As she opened it, I could see another overcoated man outside. She left, and he came in. He'd been there to block the exit if anything went wrong during the lift. It wouldn't have been hard for him to stop me. He more or less matched the dimensions of the door. Nothing was said as I sat and waited. But for what? I remembered Sergei's face in the 4x4 as he told me about the Vikings' revenge. My heart was starting to pound big time. Where the fuck was Liv? Had she been lifted too? Were these guys the Meliskia? The three squareheads didn't speak or move. A feeling of dread came over me. Were they NSA? Was I really in big boy shit? The pulses in my neck kicked up a gear, and not for the first time on this job, I could feel them pumping against my collar. The human door, who was still standing by the real one, must have seen it and recognized the feeling, because he gave me a knowing smile. I did my best to return it. Fuck em. I wasn't going to let them see how much I was flapping inside. Long minutes that felt like eternity passed. Then there was a knock. The human door looked through the peephole, immediately reached for the handle, then stepped reverentially aside. Hello, Nick, Val said as he entered. With him was Liv's train station contact. They both wore dark grey suits. May I introduce Ignati? Ignati smiled and bowed his head slightly towards me. Hello, Nick. I never managed to meet you personally at the station, but knowing so much about you, I feel as if we are old friends. I nodded back, not wanting to say a word yet, as my mind was too busy working out what the fuck was going on. I was scared, confused, and beginning to realize that I was in serious trouble. My best bet was to shut up and play stupid. That wouldn't be hard. Val sat on the settee opposite, while Ignati stayed on his feet and fell in behind. The Chechen looked into my eyes for just a bit too long for my liking, and then he placed a large white envelope on the coffee table that lay between us. That, he pointed, is for you. I reached for it, more confused than ever, and pulled open the flap. He settled himself into the settee and adjusted his suit trousers before crossing his legs. Inside was a sheaf of documents in Cyrillic. I stared at them for a long time, not knowing what the fuck they were. They are deeds for two apartment blocks in St. Petersburg, he said. Their combined worth exceeds three million sterling. I thought... You'd prefer an appreciating asset to cash. My mental calculator was working overtime. I was a few weeks in credit with the clinic, but the bills would soon be racking up again. The three weeks that I'd been away would already have cost me £12,000, and I'd soon be running on empty. One month with the firm at £290 a day would earn me precisely 8700 I might as well chance my luck. I'd rather have the cash. Uh, that was the arrangement. He shook his head slowly, as if he was about to tell a child the trip to Disneyland was cancelled. But, Nick, there was no arrangement. Liv has been deceiving us both in pursuit of her own greed. His eyes suddenly went twenty degrees colder, demonstrating with a single glance why he was the top man to be afraid of in his line of work. Thankfully, some are not as disloyal. He waved his hand behind him. Ignati looked smug. I stared at them, as if I didn't have a clue what he meant. It is quite complicated, Nick, and you really don't need to know the details. Suffice to say, not only did she betray the trust that I had placed in here, 
She has now made it virtually impossible for me to access the Echelon dictionaries for a very long time. The only reason you are still alive is that you thought you were acting on my instructions. The smile returned. Come, work for me in Russia, and you can then take advantage of your new property portfolio. The rents are extremely high in that part of the city. This is a fantastic opportunity for you, Nick. There might even be time for us to get together so that I can explain this whole sorry affair. I shook my head. I have things that keep me here. I hesitated. I really could do with the money instead. He pointed to the envelope still in my hand as if I hadn't even spoken. In there are details of a contact here in the United Kingdom. When do you wish to come to Russia? He stood up, and everyone moved with him. I had to ask, How did you know I was here? Val stopped, just as the human door was about to open the real one. Liv told me, of course. She told me everything. He paused. Before Ignati, he shrugged. His smile hadn't disappeared. He waited to see my reaction. I bluffed it and looked even more confused, but in my mind's eye I saw her belly slit open and the eels writhing all around her. It shocks you? I shook my head. I didn't think so. You see... I cannot be seen to exhibit such a lack of judgment about the people close to me. I must show strength. You could help me do that when you come to Russia, Nick. Think about it, won't you? I nodded, just wanting him to leave. She did mention your apology for the deaths of my nephews. I nodded. Yes, I'm sorry. Don't be. I never really cared for my sister's family. I hope to see you in St. Petersburg soon, Nick. As he turned to leave, I said, Can I ask one more thing? He stopped. There's a body. My friend. It's still in Estonia, and... Of course. Of course. We are not barbarians. Val waved a hand at the envelope. The contact. Give him the details. I lay on the settee for the next fifteen minutes, trying hard not to think about how long it must have taken Liv to die. It certainly took the edge off my enthusiasm for the St. Petersburg property market. I needed the money, but I wasn't too sure about anything now, apart from the fact that the meeting with Lynn wouldn't be the best moment to fuck the firm off. I gave Val and his boys another five before walking downstairs and out of the hotel. Then I went into one of the phone boxes under the scaffolding and fed in a fistful of coins as I picked up the receiver. Hello, East Anglian Properties. How may I help you? James Main. Speaking. Nick Stone here. A slight change of plan, James. I want you to sell the house as soon as you can for anything you can get. But all the offers so far have been well below your purchase price. You'd do much better if you could get the roof finished and the interior work done, then put it on the market in the spring. It would be up straight away, James. But I was driving past the place only a couple of days ago, and there is still a tarpaulin over the roof. Really? Nobody's going to offer anything like James. Yes? Which bit of straight away don't you understand, for fuck's sake? I only had to put a twenty pence piece in for the second call. It was to a London number. Still abroad, I'm afraid, I said when I was finally put through to Hughes. Looks like I'm going to have to stay here for another month. What effect would that have on Kelly? Well, she won't get any worse, let's put it that way. She'll stay more or less exactly as she is until you can start the sessions with her. Exactly as she is. I closed my eyes and tried so hard to see her looking at me and smiling, but the only image that came to me was of her on that chair, her head strangely tilted, 
and sitting so still it was as if she'd stopped breathing or had been frozen to death in an invisible blizzard. I had hours to kill before seeing Lynn, so I ended up walking all the way to Vauxhall Cross. As I walked, I thought about the two other phone calls I might have to make very soon. One was to her grandparents, to break the news that they might have to sell their house as well, though there was more chance of being struck by lightning. They nodded and agreed so far that Chelsea was the best place for Kelly, but I bet they'd suddenly discover how wonderful the NHS was when I told them they'd have to start shouldering some of the cost. The other would be to the friend who'd put me on to the freelance job against Val. I'd ask him if he had any more work going, and this time somewhere warm, like the Bahamas. The same Asian guy ushered me into Lynn's office. Nothing had changed apart from the fact that Lynn had a different shirt on, and wasn't writing this time. I stood in front of his desk. Once again, there was no coffee on offer, so I knew I was in for another short meeting. It's my last few weeks in post, and quite frankly, the last person I wanted to see was you. He sat and stared at me with an expression that said I was 100% responsible for his early retirement. I felt sorry for the mushrooms. I knew to just keep my mouth shut and listen. Moonlight Maze, he said. Do you know anything about it? No. I felt the sharp pain in my chest once again. He knew what I had been doing. He knew and was letting me drop myself in the shit. I had to play along. Well, not really. Only what I read in the papers a couple of weeks ago. That's about to change. Your job is to assist an NSA officer and his team while in the UK. They will be here for about a month trying to stop this damned ROC infiltration into Menwith. I nodded, as if I assumed it would be a boring BG-come-escort-come-tour-guide job, which these things normally are. But I still had the feeling he was playing games with me. Why me, Mr. Lynn, you said before Christmas that... It has been deemed that the cost of your training and retainer is not being effectively utilised. Now get out. I didn't know how he did it, but the door behind me was opened by the Asian guy right on cue. Please, sir, follow me. I did, and we went up two flights in the lift to the briefing area and into a sparsely furnished, unoccupied office. There were no windows and all I could hear was the noise of the forced air ducts. If you wait here, sir, the officer will be with you shortly. The door was closed behind me. I sat against the desk and flapped. I was being set up. As it opened again, I stood up and turned to face the person walking in. My chest pain returned with a vengeance. I had fucked up big time. Next stone, right? The Democrat was smiling at me as he held out his hand. His face looked like I'd gone at him with a pastry cutter. The bright red, scabby scars around his face were held together with black sutures, along with patches of his scalp where his hair had been shaved before the wounds were treated. His hands were in shit state too, but they were all healing nicely. There isn't much time, Nick. Me and the team are going to need a lot of help here. He saw me looking at his scars and dropped the smile. Hey, I know. Not good. If I ever find the son of a bitch that did this, I'm going to be pulling the ring back on one big can of kick-ass. 